Now I'm pleased to introduce Professor Daryl Lim. He's a professor of uh, law and director of the Center for Intellectual Property, Information and Privacy Law here at University of Illinois Chicago School of Law. And Matthias Richley. Matthias is deputy director of the PCT Legal Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lim and Mr. Richley. Thanks, Adam, and good morning to all of you. I'm speaking from Chicago, and today is a special day in Chicago. 150 years ago today, one in three Chicagoans were suddenly made homeless because of the Great Chicago Fire. The story of the blaze and Chicago's triumphant rebuilding, however, is a story of hope. And as we see the end of COVID, with travel restrictions easing and vaccine travel corridors being built up, we hope to see you all in person at some point soon. The three points I want to touch on today are relevance, resonance, and relationships. First, relevance. We work very hard every day to remain like a coffee shop. What do I mean? People come to coffee shops to have candid conversations about real world issues that matter to them. And as an academic institution, we want to avoid falling into the trap of offering increasing answers of increasing relevance with increasing precision. Instead, we hope to ask increasing questions of increasing significance with increasing empirical rigor. To do this, we need real world data. That means real people, real issues, real solutions. Also, we need to have a global mindset because whether you're talking about patents or trademarks or designs, portfolios are global, supply chains are global and pandemic that the pandemic we live in paints vividly the reality of how interconnected we are. We also need a roadmap for a post-pandemic world, and I hope today we will start to find new ways we can work together across industries, countries, whether we are talking about trademarks and designs, patents and trade secrets, PCT strategies, or the intersections between the different bodies of IP. As well as our keynote session with Lisa Jorgensen, by both Deputy Director General for Patents and Tech. She'll be talking to us about patents and technology, perspective, truth, and change. And I will come back to moderate that session. Second, resonance. And this is why we have a discussion-based format rather than a series of timed speeches, as is typical in other conferences. Our experience, particularly with online events, has been that shorter individual remarks present a sharper tool to invite panel reactions and audience participations, with refining and with what resonates with the panel and the audience. Third and finally, relationships. We are very pleased and proud of our relationships with both WIPO and Kuna and Waka, both stretch back more than 20 years. We have had events at the school and now we do it online. And the benefit is so many more people can come and speak, so many more people can participate. And this relationship reflects the breadth and depth of our IP program's international roots. Our relationships also go to our faculty, and I can assure you that today we've marshaled the best minds that we can for the issues at hand, so that we are at the forefront of our effort to move the needle. We've got faculty from across the nation and around the world, including the EU, China, and Singapore. And so we have definitely found the best people for the panels you'll see today. Finally, I want to thank our annual sponsors, our institutional partners, Adam and the uh, student ambassadors for helping make this event possible. So welcome all of you, wherever you might be. I look forward to personally learning a lot about developments in the world of intellectual, international intellectual property practice. Thank you. And now, now I'll hand the time over to uh, Matthias. Matthias is from WIPO. As Adam uh, introduced, Matthias, would you like to say a few words to our audience? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Daryl. And dear participants, it's a great pleasure for me and my other colleagues from the World Intellectual Property Organization to be here with you today and to be discussing various aspects of international IP. Um, it's been a long, long tradition, uh, WIPO working together with, I guess, what used to be the Tron Marshall Law School and now the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, it's 
going back many, many years. Uh, in the past, it was mostly a focus on a, on a PCD course. But more recently, we also teamed up with the uh, law firm of uh, Kunen Wacker as a co-organizer. Uh, and we have now expanded the scope of this event to cover a lot of different aspects of IP. Uh, all, of course, almost as interesting as the PCT. But uh, definitely, there's something really in it uh, for for all of you. So we're very excited about this. Kuhn and Walker is a is a German law firm that's really focused on bringing training and and further education uh, to interested circles. So it's great to be teamed up with them. And of course, as always, it's great to be uh, back here, at least virtually, in Chicago, and to be doing this event. Uh, with Daryl and uh, his team. There are lots of interesting uh, panels. My supervisor, Lisa Jorgensen, will uh, provide you with a keynote. So that should hopefully also be very interesting. Uh, I'm, of course, a little bit biased as to uh, session three, because that's about the PCT when uh, you will uh, see me back. Uh, but I can assure you that all the other panels are equally interested. So. Hopefully, uh, there's something really interesting for all of you. And really make use of your right to actively participate. There's a chat function. There are possibilities around tables to get into uh, discussions with other participants, with some of the speakers. Really make use of that wonderful uh, opportunity. Yes, it's a virtual world, but we're trying to, to make the very, very best of it. And, and to reach out to as many of you as possible. So do try to uh, be as interactive as you can be. And so with these words, I would like to hand the virtual microphone back uh, to Daryl or to whatever is next. So I wish us all an excellent day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. So it would be whatever is next. I'm afraid I won't be on it for several more hours. So stay tuned and watch this space. and. Be happy to hand the time back to you, Adam, to transition us to our first panel of the day. Thank you all. Um, I'm very honored to be a moderator today at this event. And um, we at Kuhn and Wacker, we really appreciate the cooperation with WIPO and John Marshall Law School for many, many years. And um, in the first 90 minutes, we will have quite many interesting topics and we are going um, to rush through the field of international design law, of international trademark law, with a focus on um, Chinese perspectives, US perspectives and European Union law perspectives. We will have topics like the latest changes in Chinese trademark law and the comparison changes to the Trademark Modernization Act in the USA. We will discuss functionality issues with trademarks and designs, especially from a European perspective. Um, we will also talk about the flexibility of the one size fits all requirements of the Hague system. And we will also talk about the latest developments of the legal practice in, uh, of design law in China. As Adam announced already, I will be your host for the next 90 minutes, the moderator um, of this panel. And um, hopefully I can also add some interesting information from a, a practitioner's point of view. Um, I personally work with Kuhn and Wacker for more than 15 years now. I'm a partner with the firm. The firm is based in Freising and we have an office in Munich, Munich so it's totally in Germany. And we have a staff of approximately 100 um, persons. Like I said, I'm, I'm partner, head of the trademark design and litigation department, but let's not talk about me. It's much more interesting who is with me on the panel. I'm very happy to welcome five very experienced colleagues of mine and um, would like to start with Peter um, to just briefly inform the audience a little bit about yourself and your firm. Yes, uh, good morning, Christian, or good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Peter Spies. I'm with uh, DTL Limited, I'm with the firm for about 20 years, and my focus there is trademarks and uh, copyrights. Perfect. Next one, Guan Yang, please. Uh, hi, hello everyone. Uh, I am Guan Yang Yao, and I'm from Illusion Associates. Uh, so the Illusion Associates is a firm with history of 28 years, 
And I have been practicing patent law in China for over 16 years. And my major is in the uh, patent and also the trade, trade secret. Uh, so uh, uh, I have been the uh, leading attorney for uh, quite a couple of uh, high profile litigation cases. And some of my cases has been selected as the uh, Supreme Court typical case. So I'm very uh, happy to be here to share some of my experiences in China, in IP field with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Guan Yang. Jess, I'm very happy that you turned up. I was a little bit nervous. Yeah. <laughs> we can't hear you. You have to unmute your microphone, please. It's a, it was a case of a meeting, a meeting spilling over. I'm very happy to join everyone here. I represent the international governmental organization sector, specifically the World Intellectual Property Organization. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all, uh, sharing with you some insights about um, uh, the Hague system for the international registration of industrial designs. I'm very happy to indicate as well that um, just very recently I moved out of Hague and I am now in WIPO's Department of Trademarks, Geographical Indications, as well as Industrial Designs. Uh, very welcome, Jess. And thank you. jumping from one office to the other one, Gordon. Yes, hello everybody, and uh, I'm also very happy to be here. Um, as you said, yes, I'm in a, 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 an organization as well, uh, the uh, European Union Intellectual Property Organization, um, and I chair uh, two boards of appeal in our boards of appeal uh, dealing with um, trademarks and designs, and I've been at the EU IPO, which is based in Alicante, Spain, uh, for 24 years now, so quite a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Great having you on the panel as well. And last but not least, Nancy. Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. I'm Nancy from Linda Liu and Partners. I have worked in our firm for six years as a trademark attorney, and now I'm managing our two branch offices in Shanghai and Suzhou. There are more than 300 staffs in our Beijing head office and uh, nearly 40 staffs in Shanghai, Suzhou, and Dalian branch offices. Uh, during the pandemic, the online meeting is very convenient, but the com communication face-to-face -face is still very important. So at a suitable time, if you have opportunity to come to China, uh, welcome to our offices. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Well, um, the plan is to start with trademark topics, and um, I'm very sure that most practitioners and most people who dealt with trademarks in the past made the experience that, especially in China, it can sometimes be a little bit um, difficult with um, trademarks that have already been filed, like bad face applications, or that one of your clients wants to file a trademark in, in China and it has already been filed. So I'm very interested in learning a little bit more about the recent uh, changes to the Chinese law system. And so I would like to hand back to Nancy, who will then tell us a little bit about those recent changes. And after that, we will hopefully have a um, discussion about the topics. So Nancy, um, once again, welcome. And um, we are very interested in learning a little bit more about the changes. OK, I would like to introduce the current situation of trademark applications in China firstly. Uh, China's trademark applications have continued to grow since 2000, especially in recent years with a rapid uh, growth rate. Uh, last year, the total number of trademark applications reached 9.3 million and the number of Madrid international applications reached 7,075. Chinese trademark law has undergone four revisions. The most recent revision in 2019 has two important points against the trademark applied or used out of bad faith. The first one is Article 4, and the second one is Article 63. Uh, Article 4 of the trademark in China newly added malicious trademark applications that are not interested for, uh, in intended for use uh, shall be rejected. The related administrative regulations, such as regulations on regulating trademark application acts, also formally came into effect on December the 1st, 2019. According to the news 
published on the Trademark uh, Office website from uh, 2018 to January 2021, over more than 150,000 trademarks applications of malice and uh, hoarding were rejected, particularly the individuals, uh, trading companies or consulting companies who applied for a large number of trademarks in a short time are easily suspected of malicious intents. So, uh, for example, um, for example, one person applied for 168 trademarks containing geographical short names of various provinces in China from August to November in 2020. All of these trademarks were rejected by Article 4. Uh, another example, a company established in Hong Kong applied for a large number of trademarks identical or similar to other well-known trademarks, uh, such as Fendi uh, Penholigans, uh, the very famous brand of perfume, and other 77 trademarks in five months. These trademarks were all rejected by the trademark office. In addition, if some hot words in the news and current affairs have been applied as trademarks, some examiners in trademark office will also refuse them by citing Article 10 of the trademark law on the grounds of unhealthy influences. For example, since uh, 2020, more than 1,000 trademark, uh, more than 1,000 trademarks such as uh, welcome mounting, uh, found mounting. And they are the names of Wuhan hospitals. Uh, these trademarks uh, have been quickly rejected by the trademark office. And uh, this year, uh, Tokyo Olympic uh, Tokyo Olympic athlete's name Chen Hongchan, uh, you know the very young Chinese uh, diver, and uh, Su Bing Tian, the star printer, and his nickname Tian Shen. Tian is Tian is the last character of his first name, and Shen means God in China. Uh, and other more than 100 trademarks applied out of bad faith were also quickly rejected. Nancy, and, uh, just a short question at this point. Sorry for interrupting and jumping in. Um, are these um, trademark applications, have they all been rejected by the office just because the office is of the opinion that they have been filed in bad faith? Or was this on request of third parties? Uh, it's uh, they are all rejected directly by the trademark office. Okay, so but the office will, in most cases, at the beginning, not really know whether it is a bad face filing or not. I think when you, you mentioned a company that filed 186 trademarks, with the first 30 or 40 trademarks, they probably the office didn't know that these are bad face filings. Did they mm -hmm. then afterwards cancel also all the trademarks that had been filed previously? Uh, uh, no, it's it just the applications now uh, were examined. The examiners will will check the um, check the uh, trademarks online, whether it's similar or uh, identical to other famous trademarks, uh, or they will check the uh, check the indi individual the uh, applicant, uh, for example, the individual or uh, trading companies, uh, whether they have any bad faith, uh, which which was ruled in other judgments. Okay, so this is an automatic step for the examiner. When they examine, they will also, at, with every single trademark, from now on, they will look whether there is already a famous trademark in the world that sounds identical. Yes. Okay, very interesting. So, sorry for the interruption. Mm -hmm. Please go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just read a piece of news uh, the day before yesterday. The famous U.S. basketball athletes named such as uh, Dwight Howard and uh, Reddick uh, and, and so on, which were preemptively applied as trademarks by an individual in China, were all rejected by the trademark office, citing Article 4. Uh, you say the Article 4 and the Article 10 work very well against the trademark applications filed out of bad faith. Um, then I will introduce uh, I will introduce the um, the another important revise of Article sixty three, uh, which is against the trademarks used out of bad faith. Uh, Article sixty three increases the intensity of compensation for trademark infringement damages. The trademark law revised 
in 2013 introduced a punitive compensation system. That is to say, if the infringement is malicious and the circumstance is serious, based on the actual loss suffered by the trademark holder, the profit the infringer has earned and the royalty of trademark license, the amount of compensation can be determined within one to three times. If it's difficult to determine, the court shall impose an amount of compensation of no more than 3 million Chinese yuan. In order to increase the protection of trademarks, uh, the trademark law revised in 2019 further increased the, the range of the amount can be determined within one to five times. And if it's difficult to determine, the court shall impose an amount of no more than 5 million Chinese yuan. That is equivalent to about uh, 776,000 US dollars. Uh, at sorry, sorry, and is this uh, the amount you are going to compensate uh, that the infringer has to compensate? Is that going to be paid to the trademark owner or to the state? To the trademark owner. Okay, and does he have to prove that he had a damage? Yes. Okay, Jess, I'm sorry for... No, no, I, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was just wondering whether all the recent changes in the Chinese trademarks law have given rise to an increase in challenges uh, within the national jurisdiction. Has it, um, uh, do you see more um, increased um, legal challenges in the courts now? And has it also impacted on the length of these proceedings? Uh, yes, you, you say um, every year there are a lot of um, trademark applications, but most of the trademarks are not used in China actually. So the uh, government want to um, want to advance this situation, and uh, uh, our chairman Xi Jinping also um, gave, gave us a very good goal. Um, that is, uh, China should be a um, strong IP country, not a big IP country. So uh, the trademark law has been revised. And I be believe the, uh, the, uh, the, the recent revised is in 2019. And uh, as, as I know, the trademark office is prepare, preparing the draft of the next revision. So I think in the future, the situation in China will become better and better. Perhaps, Christian, um, uh, if I may introduce, um, perhaps for some, uh, for everyone to reflect on, the WIPO assemblies have just, uh, today is the last day, and one of the discussions was concerning trademarks. Up to now, trademark applications or trademarks have really been through graphical representation, and the current talk and the current debate is really to broaden the channels by which trademarks could be represented. And the talk is now about audio representation. And that is really interesting how you can have a trademark using audio recordings as a representation of trademarks. I don't know if there has been anything like that in China or any uh, talk like that uh, anywhere else in any jurisdiction. Um, sorry, could, um, may, may I have your question again? I, I didn't clearly understand. Um, uh, I, I believe right now um, most um, the trademarks have been really re represented through graphical representations, right? Uh, and um, there has just been a recent talk about broadening the representations for these trademarks, for example, through audio representations. Uh, I wonder if there is any some sort of discussion in China or any in any other jurisdiction concerning that um, that kind of representation. Hi, hi Nancy. Yes. I think mm -hmm. hi Nancy. I think Jess is talking about whether there will be an audio trademark in China. So as far as I know, it seems audio trademark is not allowed in China. Oh. In China, the uh, color trademark and the sound trademark and uh, uh, and the uh, 
3D trademark can be accepted in uh, by trademark office, uh, but audio trademark is still not mm, not not yet be accepted. But, still seeing but, the future there. Sorry, Gordon. Yeah, I just wanted to say that at, at, uh, in Europe, in the EU, we've had um, multimedia marks since uh, 2017. We had a legal reform in 2017 and our regulation changed. Um, in fact, it changed in 2016, but we started to see the first applications coming in and we have got some registrations on, the, uh, uh, on our register, things like the uh, the call of Tarzan. Um, we've got uh, the Metro Goldwyn Mayor Roar of the Lion. Um, somebody, a drinks company, tried to register the sound of a of a can opening, so a, a fizzy drink can being opened. And there, that just leads me on to say the main problem is you can you can file these trademarks. The problem becomes showing that they're distinctive. And that usually requires some sort of um, secondary meaning or um, acquired distinctiveness, as we call it in, in Europe. Um, but there are a number of them on the, on the register um, and uh, they, they, do, they do well. So we have uh, multimedia sound and motion marks and holograms and uh, a whole range of, and, and we've even left it open if in the future um, smell marks become and tactile marks become um, more reliable in the sense that they can be stored uh, for, for in perpetuity if technology allows that then we've left the door open also for those forms of trademark i think um, i believe it's always very interesting to hear about all these very special type of trademarks that are possible to be filed but maybe for the audience it's quite interesting to know that um, all these special types of marks like sound marks smell marks uh, holographic marks they only represent less than one percent of all trademark filings it's still yeah 98 percent are still just classical word marks and word device marks or logo marks yeah? so there are always a lot of articles a lot of legal talk about these special types of marks but in in practical issues they only take a very very minor part um nancy i'm sorry for interrupting you all the time but it's really a very interesting topic and we already have uh, first questions coming up and uh, this is actually something that i'm also very interested in um what would be your recommendation if one of your clients um actually um what what can he do to success successfully communicate a challenge to an improper unauthorized filing so what would you recommend your client to do in china if they um yeah are, are, Folk, uh, facing such a such a bad face filing over. Uh, firstly, I suggest that our clients uh, filing the trademarks uh, by themselves uh, as uh, as wide as possible. Uh, the second, uh, I suggest that the client uh, uh, watching the trademarks uh, um, which which were filed out of bad faith. And the second, the second one, uh, I suggest our client um, saving and collecting the use evidence um, usually. And uh, when they found the trademarks out of breath, then they can file uh, oppositions and invalidations very quickly. Okay, thank you. Well, Nancy, thank you very much for, for giving us, a, due to a time shortage, a very brief summary about the recent changes, but I think it has been very interesting and I think believe we could talk about this topic for the next hour, but we have so many topics to discuss and um, we have now learned a little bit about um, how the recent changes have developed in the Chinese law, what has happened there. I would now like to hand over to Peter, um, where there have also been changes to the US law, which go a little bit into the same direction. But um, Peter can now tell us a little bit about what has happened in the USA and to the trademark system there. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Christian. And, and, and it, what will happen, it hasn't happened yet. Um, and and to, to what Nancy said, um, I'm very glad to see these changes in China because I've been at the receiving end of, of uh, bad faith filings uh, a while back and uh, we lost all oppositions and we had to go on appeal 
on each case. So it's it's very good to see uh, these changes in the Chinese law. Now for, for my topic today, uh, I thought I'd take a quick look again at the Trademark Modernization Act, which uh, the final rule will issue in November. <clears throat> and the changes uh, will likely go in effect in December. So I thought it was a good time to take a quick look at some of the changes going forward. Now, the uh, over the past years, the United States Patent Office has uh, what they call advanced register protection initiatives. We, we have the post-registration audit. We have the updated specimen guide. We have the U.S. Council rule. And we have uh, the account login. And, and everyone who deals with the USPTO has been dealing with these changes. Now, the final piece uh, for these registration protection initiatives uh, are now coming with the Trademark Modernization Act, the TMA. And I just want to look at some of the proceedings that are introduced or updated uh, going forward. Now, the first one I just want to touch upon briefly is the letter of protest, the TMA codifies letter of protest. Um, under the old proceeding, the letter of protest was uh, a toothless informal mechanism it was not binding on the examiner and anything that a petitioner would submit did not make it on the record. It was just really a hit or miss. I think I may have had success on two in my 20 years of practice. So I'm, I'm very glad to see that the uh, TMA updates this proceeding and under the new rules, uh, it remains an ex parte proceeding. It's incredibly cheap. The official fee is only $50. Once you file it, it requires the examining attorney to consider the evidence. So they can't just not set it aside. They have to engage with the evidence and have to form an opinion. Um, the evidence that is submitted, once accepted, makes it into the record of the application that you oppose. And the letter of protest determinations are final and unreviewable. So those are all very big changes. Um, according to section 2.149, anyone can file a letter of protest. And once it's filed, the, um, as I said, examiner has to engage. Now we have to comply with certain formal requirements, which I will touch upon just a bit. Now the letter of protest can be filed um, within 30 days of the publication, but it's um, it can also be filed before and if it's filed after publication of the mark uh, and the mark cannot be withdrawn from the issuance of registration, the letter of protest will be considered untimely. So it's it's really recommended that you file it as soon as possible um, because it also impacts the burden of proof that you have to uh, get over in, in order to be successful. Now, if the letter of protest is filed before publication, the evidence must be relevant to the identi identified ground for refusal. It's very self-explanatory. If I you know, allege that the mark is confusingly similar to my mark, then I'm, you know, my evidence must support that claim. If the letter of protest is filed on or within 30 days after the date of publication, the burden of proof for me is much higher because my evidence must establish a prima facie case for refusal on the identified grounds. So it's a much higher standard. So it's really advisable for any trademark owner or practitioner to file this letter of protest as soon as possible. Now, with respect to formalities, those are in the handouts, but I just want to touch upon a few here. Um, any submission must be in writing, must be filed through TS, must include the fee, the serial number, and then as well as an itemized evidence index. The index does not identify the protester or its representatives, and it does not contain any legal, man, legal argument. Now, this is really important because the evidence will become part of the application record. So um, the office does not want to have any uh, identified marks on these documents, really just um, straightforward evidence that supports the claim that have been leveled. The, Petitioner can submit 10 items of evidence per alleged ground, but not more than 75 pages total. So, you know, this is all very straightforward. 
Um, once the petitioner complies with all legal and formal requirements, the office um, will accept it, will entertain it, and then make a determination on what was submitted. The office can refuse the submission if it doesn't comply with the formal requirements. Um, if the application record shows that the examining attorney already considered the refusal ground that I would allege in my letter of protest, uh, they don't want to duplicate work. Or if, you know, by provision of law, uh, it, if it's precluded for submission. Um, so it's, it's really, this new proceeding is really, um, I, I find it, it's great. It's, it's, it's incredibly cheap. It's a potentially very effective tool to attack 30 applications, 30 third party applications. And uh, on the flip side, of course, because it's incredibly cheap, this can also be used against any of your clients' trademarks. So it's, you know, it's a double edged sword with everything. Um, but it really provides this not of protest proceeding some teeth. And, you know, you can probably expect people to use it. So is that what you expect, Peters? Um, are you going? Do you expect that the number of petition activities before the USPTO will will raise? Yeah, I mean, uh, the only other option so far is to to file an opposition, you know, send season the assist letters. So, um, you know, you probably should um, review how you monitor your client, the, the marks for your clients. Uh, we have, you know, watch notices in place that you know, provide us with publication notices. Um, with this change now, it makes more sense to see. Uh, to, to change this to, to monitor applications and see what marks are being filed to put this then on your radar uh, so you can main, uh, uh, monitor these marks and see how they progress during examination and if necessary file out of protest. I mean, again, it's very cheap. So, yeah, that's what actually what, what I took from what you just said. And um, for, for me as a practitioner sitting in the European Union and having German or European Union mm -hmm. clients, um, they have always been very reluctant to, to file oppositions in the right. USA because it's uh, much more expensive than it is in, in Germany, right. for example, or in the European Union. And uh, so do you think this will change in future that there will be much more of those petitions and filings also from abroad? Yeah, of course. Very much so. I mean, the next, the next, this one as well as the the new proceedings that are being introduced through the TMA, uh, they, they strike me as European style proceedings uh, since they're ex parte, and it's really there's no interaction be between the trademark owner uh, or be be between the petitioner, excuse me, and the the registrant or trademark owner. It's it's really just petitioner with the USPTO and then USPTO. With the trademark owner, uh, it's 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 going to be very interesting to see how this plays out in practice, and it's also going to be very interesting to see um, how how this will impact how practice at the USPTO and 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 how much people will take care of these proceedings. You know? But it sounds that uh, your personal opinion is that you're looking forward to it. Is it? Oh, yes, very much, very much. I have two two candidates for the the. There's two more proceedings that are being introduced, new expungement and, and, and uh, re-examination. I have two cases that I will try to use these new proceedings once they're in place. So I'm very excited about this. Yeah, it sounds very good. Yeah, so with this, so the, the TMA also introduces two new uh, non-use cancellation tools. Um, these are expected to be implemented in December. They're called ex parte impungement and ex parte re-examination. So an expungement proceeding allows a petitioner to attack a third party registration that have never been used in commerce on some or all of the goods or services for which it's registered. So this is expungement proceeding pretty much targets uh, section 44 and section 66 marks. So that's uh, marks that are based on foreign registrations and Madrid filings. Because with these filings, you don't have to provide evidence of use for registration. You only have to submit uh, a verified statement that you have a bona fide intention to use the mark in commerce. Um, so the evidence of use will only become relevant for these marks once the affidavit of, of use is, is uh, uh, necessary to be filed at the sixth year of registration. So until then, uh, you have very little uh, tools to attack those. I mean, you would have to go file an unused cancellation, just. 
just wondering, Peter, whether a similar move towards um, streamlining procedures in other um, IP rights um, registration is afoot in the USPTO, for example, in industrial designs. Uh, Yes, I mean, as I said, they, they, this is all part of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, um, what's the word I used above the, the, uh, yeah, the registration initiatives. Um, they really try to streamline proceedings, make it more accessible and make it more, I would think, user friendly, trademark owner friendly. Um, you know, and, um, so I, I would, I would think that any of these initiatives will also be considered for other areas of the of the law yes um, now with respect to these proceedings um, the ex parte and the other interesting part of these is for me at least it's also they can be direct initiated um, so how the USPTO will accomplish this I'm not quite sure yet so we have to see um, if, if they're gonna use the the uh, uh, audits that have been issuing against marks to just probe certain marks uh, and, and see if they have been used and if not, or if they get a dissatisfactory response that they will then maybe uh, initiate director and uh, 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 proceedings against these marks, but that's something we need to be, needs to be seen. Um, now, under the proposed new rules, a petitioner in an expungement proceeding can request uh, an ex parte expungement proceeding between the third and 10th year following the registration date now for older marks that already have registered or are past the 10 years, once this act goes into effect, um, the, the TMA states that um, an expansion proceeding for registration that is at least three years old can be, initiate, can be also initiated regardless of the 10 year limit. So any mark um, that's registered on the register and it's been on the register for more than three years, regardless of the 10 year cutoff rule, uh, can be subject to these uh, expansion proceedings. Now, the re-examination uh, proceeding, this is a proceeding that's, that targets uh, Section A, Section 1 applications, those applications based on use or based on intent to use. And um, under the re-examination petitioner may request and the director may institute a re-examination proceeding during the first five years following the date of registration. So it's a little different. Um, the requirements for both is that uh, any person can file this. Again, a very broad uh, uh, person of interest. The director can initiate those, of course. And for the expungement, the petitioner must allege that the relevant trademark has never been used in commerce. And for the re-examination, they have to allege that a mark was not in commerce on a connection with some of the goods or services whenever use was uh, alleged in the registration in the application proceeding so uh, peter sorry for interrupting again what uh, again my my question is a little bit on your personal opinion do you believe that um, many trademarks will now be cancelled from the register in future because of those changes or is this more something that is like a special case that will not happen very often no i i think this will really um greatly impact i mean just from my practice uh every time you find an application you always get a rejection from the uspto uh, oftentimes it's formalities but very often you also receive uh, uh 2ds as likely of confusion refusals and some of these marks are very old some of these marks cover a, a, a very broad uh, description of, of goods or services. Now these proceedings will allow me to attack these marks uh, if they have not been in use with under these uh, prerequisites. And uh, it will allow me either to cancel them or to just limit the scope of the registration. And uh, I really think it's, it's a, again, it's a fairly cheap compared to cancellation or opposition proceedings. It's a fairly cheap procedure. And I think it's also very effective and it, it will be relatively quick. I mean, uh, cancellation opposition proceedings are notoriously long in the United States because of the uh, discovery that we engage in. Um, and, and so uh, I would think that a lot of trademark owners 
um, will take advantage of these new proceedings. What, what means short when you say it's, it's rather short compared to the traditional one? What yeah. are you expecting? Uh, this, I would think that this can be resolved within a year easily. I mean, you you file the, the way it works. You file a petition to the USPTO. Once you complete, once you comply with all the formal requirements, and and um, then the USPTO sends an institution notice to the trademark owner of the mark that you attack, and then the <clears throat> the trademark owner will be given about two months to reply to this initiation uh, a notice. And the petitioner, me, if I file this impunishment proceeding. I'm no longer part of this proceeding. I just submit my best case, submit all the evidence that I have. Uh, once it's with the USPTO, once they decide, yes, um, the petition is, is uh, uh, complied with all the requirements, they're going to review it. If they find it uh, acceptable, they send an in initiation notice to the uh, trademark owner. Uh, he then, the USPTO then issues uh, an office action where they invite the trademark owner to provide evidence of use of their mark. And so the, the response scenarios there are, if there's no response, then the goods and services that I objected or the entire mark will be canceled immediately. Uh, if there's an adequate response, um, you know, the registrant submits sufficient evidence of use, uh, just submits evidence of excusable non-use or um, the leads or amends those goods and services to which I objected, um, then the mark will survive the challenge. If there is an insufficient rebuttal, uh, the USPTO will then again uh, issue an office action, will inform the trademark owner um, that the uh, response was insufficient. For example, if, if I'm the trademark owner, and my mark has been on the register for a while, it's not sufficient to just resubmit evidence or, or specimens that are already part of the record, you know. Um, so I have to really provide additional evidence to what is already on the record. And if I can't um, satisfy the, the necessary standard, um, the issue final office action, and um, I can then either appeal this to the TTAB or, you know, let the mark go. But well, it's... That's that sounds like this is something that we definitely need in the European Union as well, some, some, something similar because our, yeah, Gordon, please. I just wanted to come in. Um, I mean, we don't have the ex parte system of making yeah. these, uh, the, the, these petitions, but we do have a, a fairly quick and swift um, cancellation procedure that's not, not really very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, the, and it can be based on non-use in circumstances very similar to the ones that, that you mentioned, Peter. I mean, of course, you've got to remember that it could be non-partial non-use as well. Right. And there comes the problem that this can be used abusively as well, and it is. Uh, right. Their trademark troll, <clears throat> such as Mr. Gleisner, who I think is known to most people around the world, he's uh, virtually brought, he, he caused a huge workload in the UK uh, IPO, in Singapore, and in the in the EU, by uh, maliciously attacking um, mm -hmm. trademarks that were on the register for non-use, when he knew really that nearly everything was used. But of course, it's very difficult. It suffices that there's one product for which it hasn't been used uh, adequately to justify the the action. And yeah. the, and of course, if you launch simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um these these actions you flood the uh the party the defendant with actions yeah. very and do you think that there's a danger that this could happen in the u.s there's there's clearly a danger of misuse now with respect to the expungement and uh, uh re-examination proceedings you have to also file a verified statement and that verified statement has to include you have to show that you've engaged in a reasonable investigation of that non-use. Okay. Right? So, so that would address the the issue that you just raised, because I, I can't just file this, say, hey, it's not been used, you deal with this now. I really have to, uh, uh, and that's part of the, it has to be a complete submission. And, and part of that uh, requirement is that I have to show that I have uh, researched and investigated that this mark is in fact not in use either not in use at all or partially, uh, not only used partially. 
And if I cannot provide this evidence, then I will, you know, not engage in this proceeding. Um, so that that's that's a safeguard, of course. I mean, just like the letter of protest, since then this this is much cheaper. I mean, the official fee, we still have to pay six hundred dollars official fee per class. So depending on uh, uh, what you want to accomplish, it may still add up to a certain amount of money. But compared to what an, an opposition proceeding or a non-use cancellation proceeding costs in the U.S., uh, it, it, I expect this to to be much more cost efficient and. Um, you know, uh, when there's money to be made, there's always people to abuse the system. And it, it's with these proceedings, uh, you know, you would expect an uptick in, in, in cases and obviously also an uptick. Uh, I can make my competitors' lives very difficult with these new proceedings. And we probably can expect something like this as well. Um, but uh, I think in all this, the, it's a step in the right direction because it really helps trademark owners to um yeah monitor what's on the register and and get rid of deadwood much easier than it is right now and much more well, cost effectively definitely and uh, i'm very interested it will be very interesting to see how this develops right. and uh, how everything is done well peter thank you i think we now had some very interesting insights into the chinese trademark changes that have been conducted the ones that are coming up in the us and uh, we will now cover a topic that is interesting for trademarks and designs. It's uh, the topic of functionality. So I would like to hand over to Gordon. But before you start with your main topic, um, we, maybe you can mute me for a second because I can hear me twice. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question for you, Gordon, which uh, goes back a little bit to uh, to the discussion we had with Nancy and being started by Jess's comment uh, regarding audio trademarks. Um, the audience would like to know how to best search for audio trademarks in the register of the EU IPO. And um, that's something I think is interesting as well. That's a very good question. I mean, we have, of course, a, um, a public search tool called eSearch um, on our website, which would be the starting point. I think you would have to try and identify the verbal description of the sound and then search it in, in that way, uh, assuming you didn't know the name of the, of the applicant or the registrant uh, or, or, or whatever. So um, I would say by, by verbalizing the, the sound element, and such maybe as I the sound of a, of a of a drink can, for example. Yeah, and like I mentioned, there are not so many sound marks. You can actually, um, when searching on the website of the EU IPO, you can actually say, I only want to see sound marks that have been filed between this and this date, for example, and there are not so many. So if you're a little bit interested and you have five minutes time, you can actually go through all the audio trademarks that have actually been filed, accepted and registered. That can be done within of 30 minutes. It's not, there are not so many. This is very true what you say. Yeah. OK, um, well, then I'll, I'll get into um, just talking a discussion about what we call functionality um, in the EU, which by that I mean um, designs and trademarks that have technical features. Um, I mean, the starting point is that, of course, um, when patents that are purely technical are coming to the end of their life, people look around at ways of trying to perpetuate the rights, the exclusive rights that they've got, right? So for example, in a, in a leading case on this in the area of trademarks, and I should say that in the EU system, trademarks can be the shape of a product. So we don't have this distinction that exists in the US of trade dress or whatever. We, we, uh, we have tra trademarks can um, also include the shape of a product. So they can be the three-dimensional shape of a product. And in a case involving the, um, the shape of the three-headed um, Philips uh, electric shaver, um, the, uh, we, we have some, a figure called the uh, Advocate General at the uh, highest court in the EU. And he is sort of, uh, he or she is uh, like um, an amicus curiae to that court and issues um, an opinion, which is like an advice about how he would decide, he or she would decide the the case. 
Uh, it's not binding on the court, but it's always taken very seriously. So in this, uh, it's quite a, about 20 years ago now, this Phillips versus Remington uh, case, which was about registration of a three-headed shaver, the Advocate General pointed out that um, uh, the prohibition on registering uh, the shape of goods um, is where they're necessary to achieve, obtain a, a technical result for, for trademarks, that's the test. So necessary to get a technical result. Whereas for designs, it's um, features that are solely dictated by technical function, right? So um, the difference isn't a capricious one. Um, with, with designs, the, the, the functional feature can be um, not only necessary, but it's uh, essential to, uh, you know, to achieve a particular result. And we'll come back to this, but basically the bottom line is that you've got more possibilities of getting through something, um, a, a, a registration for a design that is rather technical um, than a, a trademark that is rather technical, okay? And Gordon, so, why do you think this is the case? Is this something you're going to explain later on or is it something that you could mention or explain right well, now? Well, I think we can, we can mention it up, up front. I, I mean, the, the basic reason is, is an economic one. I mean, um, as I mentioned, when you have a patent, it, it has um, you know, a limited life. And uh, at the end of that life, uh, you're looking uh, about, or the owner of the patent is looking at ways that he or she might be able to perpetuate income and revenues on that IP right. So the, the thing is, if you get a design, you get um, in the EU uh, a maximum life of 25 years. I mean, that's not nothing, it's quarter of a century, but it pales in comparison with a trademark, which if you pay your renewal fees, can go on forever, potentially. So it's natural that the uh, legislature takes a stricter approach with regard to trademarks, registering the, these um, technical objects as trademarks than it does for uh, for designs. Also remember that you're getting, um, the reason why you don't want a purely technical uh, trademark or design on the register is because it's monopolizing um, a technical solution and therefore um, competitors can't use it. It doesn't fall into the public domain. Um, and as I say, I think the, the main reason is, is just one of the length of time uh, between between trademarks and and designs, the, the the length of the duration of the of the protection. Now, um, sticking with with trademarks, the the main development that came in trademarks came with the with the Lego brick that I think all of us know. Somebody said <laughs> because we've stepped on our children's ones uh, barefooted <laughs> in the past, um, and this. This was actually um, the subject of a, of a patent as well. So the Lego brick had actually been registered as a, as a patent um, some, some years ago. And the Lego company sought to uh, register it, to try and register it as a shape mark. Um, they did it in most major jurisdictions in, in, in the world. I mean, it was in the US, in Canada, um, you know, UK, e EU, uh, probably China, I don't know, but uh, a, a, a lot of different places. And um, in, in just, just about everywhere, apart from um, Lego's home country, Denmark, uh, the, court, uh, the courts of, of everywhere did not accept it as a, as a trademark registration. Um, pivotal to that decision was the fact that they had had patents on on this right and that was a clear indication to the courts that you know this was actually an exclusively technical solution um and the court though the in the eu the, the court said you have to look at what are the essential characteristics of uh, of the shape and do all these characteristics perform 
a technical function? And if the answer to both, uh, to, or to the second question is yes, they do, then it can't be registered. And in this case, it, it, it was a resounding yes, they do. And uh, they said it was the studs uh, that, that interlocked with the, uh, with the Lego bricks that performed uh, a technical function. Um, the question of whether you can have decorative elements to save it, uh, the court said, well, uh, they have to be uh, distinctive or very important um, in the role that they play. Um, and and uh, anyway, there were several other cases. There was one involving uh, the, a knife handle grip and one that I think we'll all know, which is Rubrics Cube, um, where the, uh, where the, the uh, European Court of Justice uh, went even further and said that you can imply this fun functionality, you can infer it from the graphical representation. Um, and they said in the picture of the of the of the rubrics cube that the sort of grids that appear on that on that cube, um, they showed a rotating capacity, even though they were non-visible functional elements. So there it seemed like the court was looking at the way you used this, uh, you would use this shape mark, not just how it would appear on the register. And we got confirmation. Um, last year, in fact, in this very uh, interesting object uh, ca called Gönbuk. Um, I'm probably pronouncing it horribly because it's a Hungarian word um, that, that uh, it's in the materials. It, it looks like a sort of um, metal uh, bull like the, the, the French used to pay, play petanque, only it's deformed at the top. Um, and its idiosyncrasy is that it always comes in position and balances perfectly. Um, and the court said there that when you were um, identifying uh, essential characteristics, you could use information other than the graphic representation. Uh, particularly, you could look at the way that it, it was used. And uh, you could include, um, you know, the, how the relevant public, what the relevant public would identify as, uh, as being essential, right? But then they said, when you come to look at what's an, uh, a technical function, wh whether those essential uh, characteristics perform a technical function, um, you don't look at what the, the public, the, the target public's perception is. Uh, you try and look at objective and uh, reliable information from objective and reliable sources, right? And now this brings me on to the situation in designs where uh, the dialogue, uh, the only thing we had had for years on end was about the, uh, the, 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 the Remington um, shaver, which was just remarks from the Advocate General up until, uh, 20, at the end of 2019, when we had this Dossaram um, decision of the Court of Justice ruling on a welding pin and whether uh, there was uh, basically the test that they came up with was whether there were any aesthetic considerations in, uh, in the design. And uh, they said that you had to, uh, they ruled out the possibility of uh, having a, a, an objective observer test. So you're not looking whether there's some sort of theoretical objective observer that sees aesthetic features in something. Uh, they said that you have to look at um, information and, uh, uh, on, on the use of the design. Um, you have to look at whether there are any alternative designs that perform the same function. And uh, you have to give uh, an uh, objective indication of the uh, reasons why, a partic why particular features were, were chosen. And uh, so anyway, all of this brings me back to the Lego brick, which this time was applied for as a design. And this time, um, earlier this year, got on or remained on the register. It was sought to be invalidated, uh, but it remained on the register as a design as uh, the second highest court in the EU, the general court, uh, said that there, that there were aesthetic features in, that, in those Lego bricks, 
namely the smooth surf surfaces. So all of this shows that if you're looking to get something that, um, on the on the edge of being very rather a technical, the way to do it is probably to file a design rather than a trademark. Well, Gordon, thank you for that. Um, I know that Jess wants to ask a question, but before you, I hand over to you, um, I think it's interesting to know, and that question also came up from the audience. Um, maybe I just read the, the question because this is actually something that I also wanted to ask. It refers to the idea of um, how much is a patent that has been filed also of interest to the question of functionality. And the question that was raised is, if a patent owner attempts to extend their IP protection by filing for a trademark, so I guess a 3D trademark, at the expiration of their patent, do AU authorities consider the IP owner's own statements concerning functionality? You... First thing, the, um... The patent is potentially a kiss of death to a trademark application unless you can um, convince the decision taker that the, the technical functions of the patent are not relevant to the uh, trademark uh, application, right? You might be uh, more uh, fortunate in the, in the field of designs as, uh, for the reasons that mm. I just gave. And there, um, what you may be able to do is if the, um, if the inventor is also the designer, then it's possible that evidence can be given or taken from the, from the designer, in this case, the inventor, as to uh, the aesthetics that were involved in, in, um, in his or her uh, conception of, of the design. However, I should say that this happened in the Dosaram case about this welding pin. And again, uh, you know, when you get uh, inventors or designers uh, before a court, sometimes they can say unexpected things. And uh, the, <laughs> unfortunately, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, designer of the welding pin said that his, his, what was motivating him was to have a pin that was going to be good for every sip for automobiles for a whole range of goods and he basically said that that no aesthetic considerations were were it were present in his mind and that that well killed, killed it so <laughs> you have to be very careful uh, uh with uh, with with getting evidence from from uh from lay people yeah, and what also needs to be noted with patents and designs is, of course, that you, in most cases, you will have a lack of novelty and individual character if you already have filed a patent in the past. So it's much more difficult than to file okay. a trademark after the uh, after the patent lapsed. Is would be easier, and with a with a design, it's not possible. But Jess, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, and uh, you have a question. Not at all, Christian. Uh, I just loved what Gordon said: the kiss of death. Uh, in yeah, referring to the functionality dimension of patents and then saying, on the other hand, the better option would be designs. That means designs is the kiss of life then to that. Um, uh, to but uh, with that in mind, um, uh, one, we I wanted to say uh, to Gordon that um, you may of aesthetics vis-a-vis -vis designs and uh, WIPO is actually promoting the shift from aesthetics when referring to designs to the more neutral world, word ornamental, i.e. ornamental as opposed to being functional. So that when we talk about designs, we don't really, aesthetics is more beauty and beauty could be really relative, whereas ornamental, i.e. not functional, has a more neutral, uh, notion to it. And uh, I take this opportunity to promote that uh, term as much as I can. One other thing I wanted to say is that it's really a great opportunity to be hearing the perspectives of the USPTO, which counts its experience in terms of century, started before the 1800s. And then we have China, which is nearly half a century, and then EUIP baby amongst the group. 
and hearing the different experiences, you know, from the veteran to the teenager China and then to the infant EU IPO is really full of insights, um, uh, I think, for a lot of the audience here. So this is a wonderful panel that I am joining. Thank you. Definitely, but I believe that the EU IPO is also benefiting from a lot of experience from the national offices in the European Union, which are going back to 150, 200 years as well. But uh, you are right, and I'm I'm personally of the opinion that the European Union IPO is doing a fantastic job. They they have always been well much better than the national offices in the way how they present themselves online, how the e-filing is done and I think they, they brought the whole IP sector a lot forward in the European Union. But Jess, since you already had the word, um, I think it's already time to, to switch to your topic. I mean, um, the WIPO is, is always a great help for me when we have to file international designs for our clients and uh, I'm very happy that there is a Hague Agreement which makes it much easier for us instead of looking at all the national legislations and requirements and um, yeah I'm sure you also have something interesting to tell us. Absolutely it is a pleasure to be here and uh, talking of the Hague uh, system we are actually coming up with this motto the Hague system protecting your designs internationally since 1925. Because mind you, 96 years ago, the Hague system was established initially by first uh, the, the European jurisdictions and now it is spread worldwide. And um, there are, let's say, two characteristics that I'd really like the audience to take note of when we talk about the Hague system. One is the word, international and the second is the word procedural. International because it leads you to protecting your designs internationally, i.e. in multiple jurisdictions, just by that one international route. There is no other mechanism that brings you in such an efficient manner to multiple jurisdictions as the Hague system. So in fact, it is unique in that sense. And the other term procedural, because the Hague is a procedural mechanism by itself. It does not afford protection of the designs. Rather, it leads you to these jurisdictions whereby the domestic legal framework, the conditions of um, grant of protection and the rights deriving from this, the, that grant of protection are all governed under the domestic legal framework. So the Hague system is procedural. It leads you to the, it leads you to the multiple jurisdictions. And uh, over that 96 years, nearly a century, there has been, we believe, a very positive impact of the Hague system on a lot of the domestic systems. For instance, um, anyone wanting to join the Hague system has to meet a minimum requirement of the duration of protection. And this is why China, whose um, preparations for accession to the Hague system is very much an advanced stage, recently amended its laws to afford protection of at least 15 years, because that is the minimum under the 1999 Act, 1999 Act of the Hague system. One other um, uh, uh, positive impact also of the Hague system is uh, the deferment of publication of designs. Under the Hague system, there is the maximum deferment of up to 30 months. That's really big, 30, that's really quite long. And it affords the design holders to fine tune their designs, their products uh, before they expose them to the market. And with the mechanism of the deferred publication of designs, they're able to really synchronize their production processes uh, of the product, which constitute the design, the ornamental part of it, deferred publication. One, um, uh, one, one big positive impact really of the Hague system is um, the harmonization. No, let me, let me, retract them. Under the Hague system, this, there is one set of formalities that must be complied with. This really facilitates the application for registration because what the applicants need to think of 
are the Hague system requirements, not the, 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 the various or diverse formalities, formal requirements of the multiple jurisdictions where they might want to seek protection of, the, of their designs, but only that one set of formalities that are established under the Hague system because all contracting parties of the Hague system, when they bound themselves, when they acceded to the Hague agreement, they bound themselves to abide and comply with the formal requirements of the Hague agreement. And this is why it facilitates the, the job of the lawyer representing their clients. And it facilitates also the small designers, the small businessmen who can and by themselves um, uh, 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 seek, seek protection of their designs. Uh, and I'm very happy that um, the Hague system continues. Uh, there is the evolution of the, the requirements. Uh, and Christian had adverted earlier to the characteristic of Hague, the Hague system being a one size fits all. Indeed, it is a one size, one size fits all, but it does afford flexibilities, quite a lot of flexibilities, because under the Hague system, there is the mechanism for any contracting party to find declarations of certain requirements in their domestic law that must be complied with. So, for example, you have a number of recent um, uh, members of the Hague system that subscribe to the unity of design. What they have done is notify that requirement of unity of design to the WIPO so that this is now considered by the applicants. This must be complied with by the applicants. Otherwise, they risk a refusal to be issued by the designated contracting party vis-a-vis -vis their designs. Um, uh, uh, um, one other uh, positive impact, and uh, I think uh, Nancy might be able to say something about this, is um, the influence on the shift away from partial designs uh, or against partial designs, accepting partial designs. Because uh, every member of the Hague system, including China when it joins, which we hope will be soon, accepts the notion of partial designs. Uh, until very recently, I believe um, China was one of the very few jurisdictions that did not accept partial designs. And I think uh, China's um, amendment of its laws is really with what is accepted in the international community. And this alignment is really important for the main beneficiary, i.e. the design creators. The more that we harmonize uh, the substantive requirements, the formality, formalities uh, re, um, concerning designs um, uh, protection, application, and then uh, subsequently registration, the more it will benefit really the IP creators out there. And I must, so, I'm sorry, uh, for, but I must admit, I would have liked to join the talks uh, and discussions between WIPO and the Chinese National Office and uh, to convince them or whether it was, yeah, I don't know, it must have been very interesting to see that and big changes to the Chinese design system, what Guan Yang will be talking about a little bit later as well. My, it would be interesting to know, Nancy and Guan Yang, are you actually looking forward to those changes and to the system and to use the WIPO system? Because for me, it's it's a great tool and I really love it. I mean, from a European perspective, it's quite easy because the requirements we have with WIPO are somehow very similar to the ones we have with the EU IPO. So it's not, not such a big change as, for example, the US is a quite different system and for them it, I think it was a little bit more adaption but for you in China um, are you looking forward to it or is it just um, another IP tool? Uh, yes so uh, thank you Christian uh, so uh, I think China is is embracing Hague system uh, because China is in has made amendment to the uh, patent law and this is the fourth amendment which has been effective in the June the 1st this year. And so for the, this, for, this fourth uh, amendment, uh, partial design has been accepted in the uh, patent system. 
And also the design, the duration of design has been extended from uh, 10 years to 15 years. So all of these uh, are, are the uh, preparation for, uh, from China to be uh, joining the Hague system. So we are making the preparations so yeah, so actually for the uh, partial design, actually uh, many, many clients, my clients and many, many companies uh, are, are raising their uh, questions why China does not accept partial design because if uh, no such partial design, the uh, design protection would not be that strong. And in previous law, the uh, partial des uh, the, uh, design system can only protect the uh, uh, products which can be manufactured separately or individually. So after the partial design is incorporated, uh, and this is very uh, beneficial to the some shoe manufacturers uh, for the uh, GUI graphic user face uh, user interface. So. I believe the whole industry is welcoming the uh, partial design and in the whole in the uh, design system. So, so Jess, one more question to Jess, sorry. Uh, is this, so did you have the feeling it was more China wanting to join the Hague system or was it more WIPO wanting China to join the system or was it like a laugh on both sides? <laughs> I think I would use what uh, Guan Yung's word. I think the embrace was mutual. As much as China wanted to embrace the Hague system, the Hague system really benefited from that embrace because China, after all, is the second largest economy in the world. Once China joins, there is only one among the top 10 major export markets in the world that is not of the Hague system, and that is India. So membership of the top 10 major economies, except one, is a huge benefit for Hague system users. And uh, we are really very happy about this development. I can believe. Nancy, did you also have um, demands from your clients already and asking why are we not part of this or is this? Yes, um, most of our clients welcome Hugo system because uh, uh, firstly the, the the protection term become long and then the partial design especially um, especially the car the car companies and the uh, and the, uh, some um, very uh, very novel normal designs can be uh, although they are partially can be protected is very it's very good for our clients. So, but I think they're a very long way to uh, for China because we we don't uh, we, we have to learn from the U.S., the EU, and the Japan and the Korea uh, how to uh, determine the similarity uh, uh, between the partial and the, the uh, overall uh, design patent. So. Uh, in the future, maybe I I will write emails to Jess to ask some questions about design. Thank you, Jess. Thank you for your interesting uh, intro introduction. Thank you. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. really that's, very interesting. That's true. Yeah. So uh, in China, it's very uh, basic level for partial design actually. So uh, we even although the uh, patent law is effective in June the first. But the uh, examination guideline is still under the uh, amendment. So the the the, the uh, I, uh, China Patent Office is seeking for the public opinions for the amendments on the uh, examination guidelines, and there uh, the uh, that uh, they, the deadline is September twenty the second. So they have collected the uh, public opinions. But for how to how to show such partial design, it's still a mystery. I think so. It has not been decided uh, how to show such partial design. It's uh, generally it it is said that uh, the Chinese practice will be uh, in, in uh, will be consistent with the international habits. But uh, there's no detailed regulation uh, issued. 
uh, maybe the uh, most possible way to show such partial design is the mix of solid lines and also broken lines. Yes, and also maybe another form is that there will be some 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 shades or some covers on the uh, surface. So the uh, final version has not been published. So we can see that it is a very uh, baby face of the partial design in China. So uh, we, I believe that Nancy is, is correct that we have to learn a lot from the uh, international practitioners. Well, Guan Yang, one thing is the way of what you can actually file and how the, uh, the design will be filed. I'm, I'm actually a big fan of designs. The way how they are handled in the European Union is very easy, very quick. They are registered within of a couple of days. Uh, you have a registered right. It's very easy to enforce in Germany uh, or in the European Union. Even with a preliminary injunction, you can go after potential infringers. Um, so it is rather easy to enforce designs and to also get damages. And um, how is it actually, I mean, so we have just spoken a lot about the way how how partial designs can be protected in future, how it is possible with WIPO, but how is about the, um, the litigation part in, in China? Um, yeah, please give us a little bit of an insight how, how damages are calculated. What kind of possibilities do design owners actually have? Yeah, yeah, this is an action, excellent question. So actually, in the, uh, this is a, another development in, uh, in patent law in China. So the uh, damages has been uh, in practice. The, uh, in the uh, re recent cases, the damages has been increased a lot. Uh, in the fourth amendment, uh, amended patent law, the statutory damages has been raised, has been increased from uh, 1 million RMB, which is uh, the uh, previous version. And currently it has been increased to 5 million RMB. So uh, this is the statutory damages. So uh, uh, we also have some other method to calculate damages. So the uh, most popular way is to uh, calculate the damages based on the, uh, uh, the uh, profits or some uh, infringing some, uh, I believe it's the uh, uh, patent uh, patentees economy losses and also the infringer profits. So uh, one trend in the uh, calculation of damages in China is that the uh, calculation method is becoming more and more accurate. Uh, in the past year, maybe before 2016, uh, most cases uh, granted with the statutory damages, uh, the average uh, damage would be uh, around uh, about uh, 100k RMB to uh, 200k RMB, which is rather few. So, but in recent years, so the uh, China is consider uh, is becoming a strong protection for for IP rights. So the uh, the damages calculation has been uh, more and more accurate, uh, and especially the uh, punitive damages has been uh, incorporated in China. But uh, such punitive damage system is for the uh, willful and serious infringement. Uh, so, but so that means that if uh, infringer is proved to be a willful and serious and has the infringement of where has very serious infringement which means that they maybe the infringer has repetitive infringe infringement and uh, also they have very large scope infringement which can also be called as serious infringement in such situation the uh, uh, the punitive damage can be applied which means that damages can be increased between one and five times. Uh, so, and another system to support such uh, damage is that the uh, evidence inference system is incorporated in China, or we can also call that evidence sanction system. Uh, the uh, meaning is that if a plain, because China, in China, there's no discovery procedure. So uh, the uh, plaintiff has, almost all the burden of proof. So uh, since the average inference system is incorporated, 
So if a plaintiff has tried its best to collect preliminary evidence regarding the uh, damages, because uh, including the financial materials, such as sales statistics and annual report, uh, or some profit data, if the uh, plaintiff can collect such evidence or such data from public channels, because uh, these materials are, are also are always are controlled by the defendant. So if the plaintiff can collect such evidence from public channel, the burden of proof for damages is shifted from the uh, plaintiff to the accused infringer. So the court may order the accused infringer to submit such uh, documents, such as financial materials and some sales statistics. So if the accused infringer refuses to do so, the damages can be inferred based on the evidence from the plaintiff. So this uh, mechanism is very favorable for the uh, patentee because if the uh, defendant uh, uh, deny to uh, to uh, to disclose their uh, sales data, so the plaintiff has the weapon uh, to prove some some damage uh, from the public channel. Uh, there's some uh, representative case in, from 2019 to uh, 2021. Uh, so I give one, just one typical case, which is between Siemens and, and another Shenzhen uh, Lumi company. So it is an uh, intelligent electrical switch. Uh, so for this switch, the sales amount was uh, collected from some e-business platform, such as JD or Xiaomi or Tmall. And so the uh, plaintiff, plaintiff, they can only collect such uh, data from such public plat plat uh, platforms. So they submit such data to the uh, IP port. And then uh, these figures with, were uh, multiplied with the prices of the infringing products to, per, uh, to uh, arrive at a figure, which is RMB 42, around 42 million. And the court, and the court also have some review on the advertisement of the defendant official website. And the court think that this data, which was calculated based on the public channels and is consistent with the advertisement of the defendant. Uh, so the court uh, accepts such uh, sales amount. And then the court will also uh, consider that uh, there's a profit rate uh, for such, uh, for such uh, infringing product, which is around 40%. And this 40% is obtained by some annual report in the same of from the other companies in the same uh, same industry so uh, this is another element so the uh, for another the uh, uh, another element is also considered in the calculation of damages which is the contribution rate and so for design patterns generally the contribution rate is subjective is totally uh, based on the course discretion so for this case, the court believes that this uh, this is a switch. This is an intelligent switch, which means that the function of this switch is more important than the design. So the design contribution rate is uh, to the whole uh, profit is at about twenty uh, percent. So the court put all these factors and put all these figures together and multiply all these figures and to arrive at the final damage, which is around RMB 6 million, 6 million yuan. So which is rather higher than the damages uh, for even higher than the statutory, uh, the top of statutory damages. Well, so um... from this case, then we can see that the, the uh, calculation approach is more and more used in the uh, design infringement cases. And Guan Yang, it, it definitely shows that um, it's getting much more serious for the infringers in China. Do you expect that um, the amount of uh, copy cases of copying products will go down because of those changes to the damages and uh, to the increase into damages? Mm, not really. I, I actually <laughs> I do not think so because the uh, copyright cases are in the uh, most amount of all the IP cases. Uh, in, in, in one year, 
in all China in the whole all course of China, there are around twenty over twenty k IP cases, twenty thousand okay. IP cases, and around uh, maybe around fifty percent is about trademark and copyright. So and you another, don't you don't expect yeah. that uh, the producers of fake products will be scared off by those uh, amendments to to um, ha having to pay higher damages when they get caught. Maybe I think maybe uh, because compare with the uh, copyright infringement, the uh, in to how to decide the pat the uh, infringement on design is a little bit difficult than the copyright uh, okay. infringement. Yeah, there are some elements to consider, and all elements rule is applied, so it's a little bit difficult uh, for the uh, design to decide whether the infringement can be constituted. But for the copyright. So they can only see by the uh, language or the words of such copyright, such product. I noticed that so Jess has a question and we only have one minute left. So my uh, please short question, short answer. Thank you. Just very quickly, 6 million renminbi is equivalent to roughly 930,000 US dollars. Uh, that's correct. So it's less than one yeah, one million yeah. US dollars and yeah less than one is almost like one million USD dollars. it's almost one million and I was wondering whether um five times uh, punitive damages compared to the uh, principal damages would be more or less also the same notion of punitive damages that is applied in the US I think for certain but whether it is the same as well in the EU um was what I was uh, wondering about uh, Yeah, so well, for the uh, punitive damages, maybe uh, we do not have much time. So uh, there's no uh, real case that has happened for the punitive damages, actually. Right, I think we're all here. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. And just want to give a shout out to, to um, Daryl and the Center for Intellectual Property Information and Privacy Law. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to this international IP practice. And it's a privilege for me uh, uh, from Singapore uh, to join you uh, tonight, uh, even though it's the morning, good morning. Um, roughly in the same time zone as me is uh, Joe. Uh, Joga is counsel of Ellen and Overy, and she'll have some very unique insights to share in relation to trade secrets protection in China. Um, we're also very pleased to have Roberta, Roberta uh, Romano Gosh, uh, from the EPO. She's the Chief Operating Officer of the European Patent Office. And I'm just so glad that uh, you're here to join us today. And I'm sure we'll have a good discussion uh, on the developments of patent and trademark law and policy. Not trademark, sorry, did I say that? Trade secret law and policy. Sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, um, and then Marcus Timon, very pleased to have him here. He's the founder of, of uh, Grow IP Law Group. Uh, and, and we're looking forward to hearing your insights, and uh, as we are with Michael uh, Saitia as well. I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong. I apologize, Michael. Maybe better. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Uh, and you're, you're a partner in, in um, Kunan and Wacker. Thank you very much for joining us. And I think we, we'll just kick off, shall we? The detailed bio biographies are all in your pack. Um, I think we can just uh, go straight in and ask Roberta to, to talk to us about EPO and pandemics, very topical. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Stan, and, and sure, and with pleasure. And uh, well, good morning, everyone from uh, sunny Munich. It's great to be here today. Yeah, so to understand why associating pandemics with new opportunities, let me start by giving you some of the headlines figures of the EPO. So <clears throat> last year, the office dealt with some 180,000 European applications, which was roughly on a par with 2019. The provisional figures for this year actually indicate that we're about 3% above last year in number of applications. And so, although we were really very cautious in, in the predictions for 2021 and anticipated actually a fall, uh, this has not materialized. Now, it may seem strange to talk of an innovation boom and new opportunities when we're still in, in, in times of pandemics, but that's actually what some people were predicting already. So. 
The Economist, for example, argued in January in a recent article that uh, 2020 would be the decade of innovation. And BBC has written about countries jostling to become innovation superpowers. So what does this tell us? Two key messages the way I see it. First, innovation is central to our efforts to tackle the pandemic. It's given us the vaccines, new medical technologies to treat the diseases, um, software to track the COVID infections. And if we look at the projected in innovation, actually, just look around and the massive investment in sustainable technologies or the industrial ecosystem targeted by the uh, COVID-19 European Recovery Fund. These are the areas where the innovation is expected to happen. So it looks like a really brilliant future. Second, Behind those innovations, behind the advances as a the breakthrough in technology, of course, is a solid intellectual property system. At the EPO, and I'm sure at the USPTO and the partner IP offices as well, the focus is on making sure that the patent system fulfills its fundamental aims and that it's truly capable of having a positive impact on the, for the whole of the society starting with the fact that the patent system must always provide an incentive to innovation. And this is especially true in cases where there are large and risky investments like uh, and long cycles uh, of development, for example, regulatory approvals. So in other words, the IP system must be one that doesn't just um, support the commercialization of technologies, but also generates the kind of economic impact that can help the world get back on its feet. And in fact, we do have evidence that this is the case. Um, one of our recent study we carried out together with the European Union um, Intellectual Property Office, the UIPO, we found that IP intensive industries generate 45% of the GDP and actually account for roughly 40% of our employment. So as we know from previous experience and, and from last financial crisis, it's, it's really IP intensive industries that prove more resilience when we face economic shocks. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really, um, this, what, what I can say is now if we look into um, this boom of innovation during the pandemics and, and how did we as organization respond? I would say we can really sum this up with, with two words, which is the, the digital transformation. Um, so digital transformation actually was already embedded in our strategic plan and uh, that we launched back in 2019. Um, and this has been massively accelerated over the past 12 months. Um, so if, if I may expand a little bit, is that okay for you, Stan? If, if yeah, I, I, was just gonna, I was just going to, no, I was just going to ask you uh, on digitalization. Um, how, how has this actually opened new opportunities um, for your yeah. support? Yeah. Uh, that, that, thank you, Stan. In, indeed, uh, thank you for this question. I, I think it's really important because um, Digital transformation, as I said, is, is been a commitment that we had already since 2019. And, and we have, of course, a very long way to go because it's a long-term commitment. Um, but what we have seen is that this pandemic has been a real and, and true accelerator because it's been, it, it meant that we had to make our workforce mobile. Uh, so we have been working intensely towards a fully digitalized uh, patent granting procedure with paperless workflows and online forms, electronic filing and, and payment. And I'm sure uh, uh, Michael and Marcus will know. Um, so above all, also better search tools, improved database uh, to truly master prior art patent literature and non-patent literature to make prior art accessible to the division of examiners um, and of course in an understandable language. We have started also looking at artificial intelligence which is also part of our answer. Of course they will not replace humans so no panic but it's actually to improve searching and speeding up um, more routine tasks to help categorize prior art for example or to ensure that an application goes to the most appropriate examining division with the technical fields uh, displayed on the patent application so by the end of 2020 
97% of our workflows with basic functionalities were digitalized and, and that's been a great success. And we achieved the months what had been in the pipeline for decades. Another really crucial uh, dimension of digitalization are our proceedings by video conferencing. Because video conferences not only help us, the EPO, to keep giving users the decision they needed, it has also created greater transparency and accountability. And of course, one aspect is promoting knowledge sharing. So, for example, um, we broadcast an enlarged Board of Appeal hearing in, in July. This was online this year. And uh, we had more than 1,500 people logged in. What a great learning opportunity is this. You, you could never imagine that to do this before video conferencing was possible. Yes, it's true that like any big changes, the switch to using video conferences um, on a large scale was greeted with some skepticism on some sides initially. But it, if, if we look at the latest figures uh, for 2021, by now we have held over 2,300 Zora proceedings by VICO. And, um, it's an over, this is only opposition and about 2,200 in examination. So definitely um, it was an important response. Thank you, that's very helpful. Well, thanks very much, uh, uh, Roberto. I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to the EPO in the course of the discussions. Um, but but from, from, from the EPO, I think we want to move on uh, to the UPC. And to that end, uh, Michael, or, or should I call you Michael? Yeah. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> my, my, Michael or I'm, I'm, that's, that's, that's absolutely as, fine. Okay, I'm learning as we go along. So 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 uh, at least give me some credit for that, Michael. Um, <laughs> would you want to talk to us about the un unitary pattern in the UPC uh, and what this means for the future? Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Stan. So, uh, well, uh, uh, the, the, the unitary patent and the unified patent court, a lot of people are really waiting for a very long time for uh, becoming into, uh, in, uh, becoming effective now. And uh, we already had been very close uh, uh, one and a half years ago. And uh, in December 2020, uh, the German parliament, the so-called Bundestag, already had adopted the act of approval enabling ratification of the Unified Patent Court Agreement and its protocol on provisional application. Uh, but just two days after this uh, 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 adopting, uh, two constitutional complaints were filed and uh, prevented the final ratification steps uh, uh, being taken. And in July this year, uh, the German Federal Constitutional Court announced now the rejection of these two applications for a preliminary injunction against the German Act of Approval to the Agreement on a Unified Patent Court. Uh, in its reasoning, the German Federal Constitutional Court states that the constitutional complaints are inadmissible because they had not sufficiently explained and substantiated a possible violation of the fundamental rights. And uh, this decision is, was very important because it now clears the way for Germany to ratify the Unified Patent Court Agreement. And uh, on the, in September this year, on September 27th, the German government deposited the instrument of ratification uh, for this protocol on provisional application. Uh, and this is a decisive step on the way to the establishment uh, of the Unified Patent Court. Uh, a next step would then be the signing of the ratification bill for deposit of the instrument of ratification uh, with the registrar uh, uh, in Luxembourg. And in this step, uh, the agreement has to be signed by two more member states of the UPC system to be bound by the protocol on provisional application so that the project finally can enter its final phase. One of these countries is Slovenia, which already now, uh, I think it was also in September, ratified uh, this uh, protocol and also published this ratification. And another uh, country which is very close to ratifying this protocol, uh, I think, is Austria. So we are very close now. And um, however, furthermore, this uh, protocol on provisional application uh, must be passed by about six months 
I would say more likely eight to 10 months to prepare everything for the real realization of the uh, uh, unified patent court. When it is clear that the unified patent court will be operational upon the entry into force uh, of the uh, unified patent court agreement, the final ratification agreement uh, by Germany can take place as a, let's say, as a gatekeeper for member states to ensure a proper process. The unified patent court agreement will enter into force then, uh, according to the statutes, four months after Germany deposits its instrument uh, of ratification. And uh, keeping these dates uh, uh, in mind, it seems very conceivable that Germany will deposit its instrument of ratification in the summer of next year, this means in summer 22. And uh, this means that again, four months later, uh, uh, maybe uh, the Unified Patent Court uh, then uh, will be operational. This means uh, we expect, let's say, end of 22, this means end of next year, the Unified Patent Court to be operational. So, uh, yeah, we have to say again, we are very close to the uh, unitary patent and uh, the Unified Patent Court. So. Uh, yeah, I think we are really very close. We never have been so close uh, to the system. Yeah. Hey, Michael, if I could, Stanley, uh, just a quick question. I, for myself, and I know we have a lot of students in our audience, um, discussions about the Unified Patent Court have kind of been going on for much of my 20 plus year career, it seems like. Um, but just the basics. Uh, corresponds to the EU or EPO member countries and also what what does it what does it provide um, you know just some of the basics um, what's it's coming here so we can counsel our clients well I, I, up, to, up to now you know we have a European uh, patent office uh, which prosecutes a European patent application and the member states all agreed to accept the decision of this European Patent Office uh, to grant a patent. But at the end of the day, currently, after the European Patent Office grants a patent, it falls apart into individual national patents, which then have to be uh, 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 litigated in each individual validation country for itself. So uh, currently, also, we have a European Patent Office. We still do not have a real European patent, uh, 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 as, as the name says. You you have uh, you still have uh, uh, then at the end of the day individual uh, national patents which have to be litigated nationally in each individual country, and uh, of course this uh, well uh, causes some troubles especially language wise and uh, now uh, a lot of member states uh, finally agreed to uh, or they, they, they already agreed to an uh, uh, application and examination procedure up to now but now they also agreed to would accept uh, a decision of one central uh, uh, court especially in litigation and in nullity action. And this is then the job of the so-called uni, uh, unified patent court. So, uh, and this unified patent court not only would handle future unitary, let's say real European patents, but also the already now existing and granted uh, uh, patents which have been granted by the European Patent Office uh, uh, already years ago. So uh, with the new patent system, we would have one single court handling litigation and nullity actions uh, uh, in, one, in one place. And this is really would be, I think, a great effort to, to be honest. Yeah, if, uh, if, Robert, there anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks, Michael. I, I think you explained really, really well. And uh, of course, the, the EPO would be also the administrator in a way because yeah. you can you can have the unitary uh, patent by 
going through a granted patent in DPO. I, I think what's also interesting is that the um, the, the proposal currently on uh, that has been accepted is the, the top four proposal for renewal fees, which makes it also really interesting. So currently, uh, the renewal fees for unitary patent is um, is like the one due for four member states. For now, is is Germany, France, UK, and Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, which is of course much more attractive than enforcing the patent over many many countries let alone the expenses, as Michel said very, very well, the expenses in, in the litigations and translation and using the different uh, patent attorneys for the different countries. So it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really nice program, I, I would say. And we yeah, hope and to have it in force actually already in summer. In, I mean, we are trying to accelerate. We, we are ready from the point of view of the patent office to enforce it. Um, but there are a few things, as Michel said and pointed out, that needs still to be cleared up um, in terms of um, the, the last country with Austria and Slovenia. We hope to get Austria soon on board. What, what, what are, so what are the obstacles um, that remain um, for this unitary patent to actually come into force? Can you just... You know, in the same vein yeah. as, as Marcus, I'm, I'm asking it from uh, a, a very interested uh, outsider and, and also for the students in our audience. Yeah, what well, I, 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 I wouldn't say that these are real obstacles. I let's say, uh, uh, well, there are still some open questions and which are which might be not clear for everyone uh, already now we well uh, you know that uh, for example the upc agreement agreement article 89 states for example that this agreement shall into force on the first day of the fourth month after the deposit of the 13th instrument of ratification including the three member states in which the highest number of european patents had effect in the year preceding the year in which the signature of the ag agreement takes place and this was, to be honest, the UPC agreement was signed in February uh, 2013. And uh, uh, at this time, we st uh, still UK had been uh, a member of the European Union. And uh, however, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, you, you know that uh, uh, due to the Brexit, uh, uh, the, the UK is no longer a, a member of the European Union. And, uh, withdraw the membership from this agreement and now the question is uh, uh, does the UPC agreement need an updating to clarify now the meaning of this article uh, uh, does it matter that the UK is no longer part of the agreement so this could be this could be one open uh, question I think uh, and, uh, and and another open question might be this so-called opting out, I think. Uh, as, as I already briefly mentioned, this uh, uh, unified patent court, when it comes into effect, it will be immediately responsible also for the litigation and nullity action for already granted, let's say, old European patents. And uh, of course, there is a kind of transition period where the uh, patent owners can opt out from this uh, uh, effect, but this will it, it, it has to it, it will take some time. Uh, uh, and me as an attorney, I would expect that uh, because it is not yet very clear how this unified patent court works, how quick it is. And so there is a little uncertainty with the applicants and with the uh, patent owners. So I would expect that at the beginning, a lot of patent owners will opt out. This means they would uh, send a request that they do not want to have their already granted patents handled by this unified patent court. However, this will take some time i think and during this time when this opt out is not yet registered uh, uh, i think uh, as as i said automatically the unified patent court might be uh, the uh, responsible court and uh, opponents for example could misuse the system and then could uh, try to file a nullity action against uh, one of these already existent uh, uh, European patent to get it invalidated 
in all uh, validation countries within one procedure. And so I think this is not yet very clear how this transition really could work. And uh, so, as I said, I think it is not really an obstacle, but there are still some, from the practical point of view, I think some open questions. Maybe Roberta can uh, add uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and ins give light. us an inside view maybe. <laughs> Well, thanks, Michel. I, I think that the, the open questions are um, indeed still in the phase of clarification. Of course, the EPO is um, meeting the um, uh, users associations and to make sure that the, uh, the transition will be transparent and to um, put some light on all the question support. So it's, it's all these, these questions coming up. It's clear that for now we are really in the, uh, in the last few steps before the launch. And we are in the process of clarifying this. So we are, we are having in the next two weeks meetings with uh, Business Europe in um, business associations. So it's it's in the process of being clarified. But you put you pointed out very well what is still to be cleared. I mean, yeah, let me thank give, you very much, Robert. Let, let me give you a, a perspective from um, from even in, in this part of the world, because the the UK um, the UK Supreme Court. Um, has for many years now, um, you know, it, it actually applies European law. Um, it's based, you know, it, its jurisprudence, you know, since the 70s has been oriented around European patent law. And even with the EPC 2000 coming in, you can see the, the latest decisions actually working that protocol in to the formulation for infringement and so on. Now, the reason why I say that is, from Singapore's perspective, we do have regard. And very often in our litigation, I mean, I do a lot of um, pharma litigation in Singapore. And when I think of cases like Warner Lambert and Novartis dealing with the patentability and patent infringement of the, the pregabalin, uh, the drug pregabalin, uh, which was in Singapore subject to a patent linkage action, which we brought. But in the UK, that was concluded uh, in litigation very much involved, uh, I think Joe's firm, Ellen and Overy, were, were also very involved in that litigation. It's a matter of public record. Now, what happens now, I was looking forward to the UPC being a, 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 almost a repository for litigation that will deal with these matters going forward. And, and as of 2016, um, you know, even leading all the way up to 2019, I thought that UK was still going to be on track to implement the UPC, change, you, then you change prime minister, they change prime minister, and then suddenly that's all called off. So what's going to happen to litigation like that um, for us? Because we take a lot of dressing from, and, and we actually coordinate with council in UK. And I guess we have to look at the at, at contacts in Europe. Is that is that the What's the survival strategy if you're in my position going forward, Roberta? So um, what, what will happen is that through the UPC, UPC, I mean, in the UK, it's going to be a different pair of shoes because they will not be able to, uh, to litigate the, the unitary patent. Um, the UK will, will have to deal with infringement on its own and the rest will be for the, the rest of the countries. Unfortunately, it is it is um, a, a bit of a complicated story, but that's the way it, it ended up. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Michael. Um, would you like to add anything? No, I I, I fully agree. I think uh, uh, one of the big advantage of the uh, unified patent court is that uh, you do not longer have. Uh, different decisions from different national courts, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, now the UK uh, uh, moved away from this uh, system. And so we still will have in the future, or that we might have uh, uh, diverging decisions by UK court and by the Unified Patent Court. So, so as Roberta said, uh, 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 we have to deal with it and uh, we will have to ha be happy that all other uh, 
member states agreed to it or, or that the member states which agreed to the unified patent court now are handled by one single court so we can avoid at least for these states uh, a diverging decision but yes uh, the uk may also in the future uh, uh, have a, a different result we have to cope with it cope with it well yeah you see that's the, that's the problem because you see i mean i i i'm the chairman of ipos and and over the years what we've tried to do is actually forge a very close relationship with the epo roberta you'll be you, you i i hope yeah I, I hope that 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 that's known to you um absolutely and, yeah so 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 in terms of examination practice and even re-examination practice we are aligned all right so we will need to to I think also fasten on to the jurisprudence of the UPC as a way forward because we can't look to British common law anymore going forward because the reality of um, the international patent protection is that you, you've got to look at the centers of influence of the jurisprudence. And it sounds like what I'm hearing is that we need to have a um, uh, a clear visibility into how the Euro, the unified you know um, the, the patents court will actually perceive the problem and i suspect also that the majority of life science and pharma litigation may very well move to europe because the the only extent you you're treating england like any other state uh that is not a, a, a signatory um and that that that's the consequence of, of a hard brexit i suppose yeah, if, if I may add on this, there, there is a, light, a positive light, if you want, and the positive light is that if it is a European patent that is enforced in the UK, the quality of search and examination is the same delivered uh, for all EP patents. So on that, you can stay assured. The part of litigation will be a different, um, separated from the unitary uh, court, the UPC, um, but at least the starting point of the grant will be the same level of quality as it's always been. Um, I think you, you pointed correctly to the fact that we start to see also um, when we interact with our users and with, with pharma companies, for example, that the center of gravity is moving towards Europe and the EPUPC simply because, you know, going in litigation and covering so many states in Europe, you just have one shot to go, right? to cover all the uh, the different countries in Europe. So it, it's it's the same reflection that you just made, Stan. Yeah, so if you're if you're a patent barrister in the UK, you should be very worried, right? Because 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 that's yeah. a big that's a big uh, chunk of business that's leaving you. You know, I mean I, I don't even want to look at some of my colleagues um, in London right now, but that's what it's headed. And uh, and what surprises me is this. You see the European Patent Convention is not strictly uh, an, an European instrument. I mean, in, in a sense that Brexit need not have triggered uh, a departure from the the EPC or the or the UPC, because it, it's actually not a a, a a grounding European institution as such. And that's always we've always looked at EPC in that way, even from the rest of the non the non European world. So it's interesting, you know. Yeah. If I just may add, I mean, and, and really to, to show also respect towards our, our UK Euro, European patent attorney who are really brilliant, they will still prosecute the case in examination. So I need opposition for, for the EP part. So on that side, work is assured, if I may say. Yeah. If I could add something. Uh, first, uh, I want to reiterate what Roberta said about uh, a lot of companies uh, filing many patent applications. I do have quite a few clients and I'm not in the pharma industry. I'm, I'm more software electronics and um, a lot of the service companies, they are most interested in English speaking countries. So if I ask, well, where are you interested in filing for? And they'll you know, often say Canada, the UK, Australia. And so this, this actually puts them in a tough uh, decision point to decide whether to file a UK patent or uh, or an EP, EP patent and really just, I guess, depends on the type of claim scope we can get and if it's going to be valuable and if they have some business competitive reasons for filing EP applications. But this uh, this split is one more 
reason why they might consider only filing a UK patent application, which you know is, I think is interesting. You see, in the past, you could you could you know in the past pre Brexit, you could actually commence an action in the UK, and also get a pan European injunction um, to cover the rest of the the, the Euro, uh, Europe, and that was a big plus for clients. Now it's 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 all gone with this. Um, and, and in terms of interlocutories, you're going to have to do one in the UK and also instruct any, any, any other, uh, uh, you know, another European attorney or barrister uh, or an advocate to, to launch a similar action within Europe. So that, that must be the game plan going forward. Okay, so it's great news for, for prosecute, you know, those doing international prosecution practice is, uh, is, is those who are doing litigation in courts will need to take a uh, a hard look. Um, so, so Marcus, if we if we can just come to you and segue into uh, international uh, patent prosecution and licensing, and, and maybe you can talk to us about about some of the issues there of concern. Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm the only U.S. practitioner on this panel. I'm actually in the Chicago area, and uh, one of the reasons I'm attending today all the sessions is because I get CLE credit, uh, continuing legal education credit for Illinois. So this is this is helpful for me. And thanks for thanks to UIC, John Marshall and Kunin and Wacker for uh, putting this on every year. But um, as a U.S. practitioner, and I notice a lot of participants and students here are also U.S. based. Uh, my little segment here is is almost sort of a public service announcement to not assume that you know too much about uh, aspects of international law. I think a lot of a lot of my clients at least and, and at my previous firm I used to do a lot of training of the less experienced um, law clerks and new patent attorneys. Um, sort of have a U.S. first mindset. Um, we draft the applications based on a U.S. style and um, and we maybe assume that the rest of the world does things similarly to how we learn you know about USPTO and the US cases but that certainly isn't the case and so my my big uh, push here is to just make sure you develop your network of of local associates around the world or foreign associates whatever you want to call them we have a number of good ones on this panel and the previous panel and um, you know events events like this that are held uh, virtually are, are good places to meet but also in person um, and you know i guess what i try to get out of seminars like this is just try to understand enough to be dangerous so that i know i need to talk to someone like michael um, you know if it comes to german or ep law or or, or stanley if it's singapore or, or jill if it's in china and um you know, don't represent to your clients that you know something that you don't. Um, say that you'll talk to someone who's an expert and it's just the same as in US law. But um, that being said, uh, I do have, uh, um, you know, a couple of, of areas that I've found at least can be traps for uh, um, areas that I've wanted to consult with local associates here. And um, first one, it, it doesn't really, it's not really about foreign filings. It, it can be, but it deals with the fact that many of our clients are now multinational or global companies, and you may have inventors from, uh, you know, several different countries on a single application. And uh, most of us know that the U.S. has a foreign filing license requirement, uh, but there are also many other countries that have similar requirements, either to obtain a foreign filing license from that country, or to um, make the first filing in that in that uh, that country, and um, some are, you know, only for military defense applications, like uh, I think some of the European countries, um, and others are for all inventions originating in those those countries. But some of those that you'll want to talk to your foreign associates about are um, India, I think I think Singapore, and you know I'm I'm qualifying everything here because I'm not an expert in every law, and so I. Know, defer to the, the other panelists, but I think Singapore, uh, Israel, Malaysia, and as I said, a lot of EP countries. Canada is interesting uh, because I, I think you only require a foreign filing license there if one of the inventors is uh, a government employee of someone of the Canadian government, um, and then you have to apply for a, a license as well. Um, and there are other countries where if there's a, a national 
of that country or the country where the invention was made in that country that the first filed application has to be in that country. And I, my understanding is that Russia is that way, Vietnam is that way. I think maybe China used to be that way, but I'm, I'm not sure um, if that's still the case. And, and then. For China, I think the usual practice will be for the companies to consider file a PCT application so that you can also obtain the foreign filing license at the same time. But you can also do a proper first draft of the application so Thank that you. you can do international filings properly. Okay. And then there, there are, of course, many other countries that don't have any restrictions at all. And I, I'm aware of Australia and New Zealand. And um, the, the bottom line is it takes a little time to sometimes get these foreign filing licenses if you have to request them from a government official. So ask your clients, you know, at least three months in advance of the foreign filing deadlines where they might consider filing and then talk to your foreign associates uh, as early as possible to get that process started. Because the consequences can be pretty major. It can be inability to be able to secure patent protection all the way to possibly fines or imprisonment for, for those involved, which could be your inventors. And they, they probably wouldn't like that. Um, you know, another area that I think it's really important to have your network of local associates around the world is just if you do happen to miss a date, um, there are usually ways to fix things and the timelines and remedy, remedies vary just widely across the world. Um, you know, the, the, it could be a couple months to a year or more um, in, in times of remedy problems and fix things that, that go wrong. And the costs can be anywhere from free to many thousands of dollars. And, uh, for example, I think uh, Canada, if you uh, if you don't file a response to an office action and the application essentially goes abandoned, it's you just pay a two hundred dollar reinstatement fee and and submit the missing missing response within a year and then you're good to go. Um, other countries that like similar to the U.S., you may have to show unintentional or, or unavoidable uh, reasons for the abandonment and present evidence and show that you're tried to dock it something, maybe having two ways of docketing and it's, things just went wrong. And um, so, but if, if there's, a, there's almost always a way to fix an honest mistake if it's, if it's soon enough. And that's, that's not always true, but it, it seems like it's often the case. And the key is to act quickly and, and talk with an expert. So your, your local associates. And then finally, the, the last area that I, um, have noticed as a U.S. practitioner that seems to be something that we often need to rely on our foreign associates for um, is you know, in the licensing and litigation areas. Um, in the U.S., our courts, they can handle both infringement and invalidity. That's not the case in a lot of jurisdictions. A lot of times it's courts that deal with infringement and the patent office deals with invalidity. And it sounds like that may be changing with the UPC to some extent, uh, um, at least for, for Europe, but a lot of places around the world, you know, there are different courts and forums for addressing both infringement and validity. Um, a lot of places do have alternate forums for dealing with infringement of your patents too. So customs and border patrols, border, border officials seizing infringing goods, either in the patent or trademark space. That's an area that, um, you, know, you might not know about if you if you don't talk to your your local associates and um, it can be very effective and, and less expensive as well um, you also want to talk with your local associates and these might not just be ip associates they might be uh, more business law type people but making sure that when you're drafting license um, uh, clauses that you are avoiding any unfair competition problems in that specific country some countries might be more pro-patent while others might be more pro-competition and you want to make sure that you are not violating any laws and uh, a lot of countries do have requirements to record those uh, license agreements if you want them to be effective against third parties um, and then you know there are also public public interest and health issues with a lot of uh, um, with patent enforcement and licensing in some jurisdictions like Brazil and India, South Africa, where uh, you might 
run into some roadblocks uh, just because of policy that might not allow you to assert your patents against competitors. So those are just, just three areas. Um, there's there's obviously many others where U.S. laws different and practice practice different from are different from other jurisdictions. But those are areas where I try to seek uh, assistance from my local associates. Yeah, that's that's helpful. I mean, I mean, even with um, Singapore, for example, um, you can't bring a patent revocation action. You can't originate a patent revocation action in the high court. Um, you have to do it in the intellectual property office. But if invalidity is brought into issue in patent infringement proceedings or other related proceedings, then the high court is also seized of the invalidity issue. So that 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 sort of speaks to your point, uh, Marcus, on on some of the quirks uh, between between different jurisdictions on how they deal with validity vis infringement. Um, another example, I, I mean, another example in, in terms of variation in practice is for claim amendments, um, especially for PCT filings. Once you have the international preliminary examination report and you want to effect claims. It's a good idea to actually get it ready for filing also in in the Singapore um, corresponding application the minute it goes to the national phase. Because the delay in bringing about any uh, amendment of the claims can make it difficult later on when you want to try and amend the claims after commencing litigation. It's a much more restricted test in Singapore. So so one of the problems faced with by, by pharmaceutical companies and life sciences uh, patent owners is that if they have to bring a patent linkage action and you've got to effect litigation within a fixed period of time, uh, usually usually under two months, uh, in order to, to take advantage of the, 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 the mechanism that will trigger the delay in marketing approval for the generic, you're very often forced into amending the patent after you've launched the action. So, the, the, you know, so it speaks to to the importance of prosecution practice to make sure that you you keep the house tidy and clean and amended uh, in in anticipation of this consequence, rather than to try and fix the problem after you've actually had to to enforce the patent, which is what a lot of uh, a lot of clients do, and I I see that in my part of the world. So that's a bit of a, a plug there. I mean, other panelists may have some other experiences that you want to share in terms of the differences, but. I certainly echo what Marcus is saying about the importance of keeping a network. And I'll be in touch with you after this, Marcus, because I need to introduce you to some people in my firm. Uh, and and, and one of the, yeah, yeah, you see, but one of the things, one of the things that clients increasingly do in our part of the world is because of because of foreign exchange and 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 pricing, we're able to say, look, we can be your prosecution agent. On, and, and we'll, we'll be happy to deal with the forms. But for certain types of technology, we're always on the lookout for drafting expertise. And that's where that's where we find uh, US uh, patent attorneys pl playing a very key role and Europeans as well, because of our, proxim our proximity with the EPO uh, prosecution practice for our patents. That kind of cross fertilization of, of expertise is very important for jurisdictions in Asia. So that, that's another area which I think we can work towards. Perhaps just to add on that, and then um, I find this this uh, exchange really, really uh, interesting because it really opens door to future collaborations and continue really good collaborations. One thing that we can offer as, as EPO, and we do, again, thanks to digital transformation, is um, digital um, workshops. So we have, for example, the user day um, that was held this year. We, we had 2,000, over 2,000 participants. And this is really about, Marcus, you were mentioning the deadlines and the resumption of, you know, um, abandonment of rights and resumption, uh, re-establishment of rights, how this works in Europe. This is one example. But we also have, um, this one has been taking place this week, for example, is search matters. How do we do the search? How does this work? And also examination matters. So this is, for example, found rather interesting for the way we look at added matter. And we know uh, Germany and Europe and the EPO are rather on, uh, quite on the same line on that. So this really allows 
people from all over the world. So Stan, people from Singapore and equally from the US, Marcus, are super welcome. We have quite a, a high population from the uh, European Patent Authority and some all over the globe, but I can only encourage to join in to see really and understand. And in the drafting phase, I really recommend well, if you want to come into the EPO after filing, if you choose another ISA, um, to really prepare the claims indeed to be fit for where you want to file them, be it in Singapore or hopefully the EPO. Yeah, I, I encountered that problem with suicide claims because suicide claims in Singapore are not, are not, are not given the same, you can't, you can't deal with it in the same way as you would under EPC 2000. So when we were facing with that, and then you 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 deal with the, you know, and, and some 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 of the, the the adjudicators may be skeptical on on second and subsequent medical uses, for example. So so I, I think institutions like EPO can play a very important role in in setting in at least being the thought leader for these questions that actually should be a matter of harmonization for countries. You know, another example is file wrapper estoppel. The extent to which the prosecution record of a patent application can actually come back to haunt the litigant in, in, in court varies from country to country. And in some countries ignore it totally. You can take a completely different position in relation to the art and then from, from, from the patent office compared to court. And there are others that actually say, well, you're actually bound to, to this position. And, and, and so when, when prosecution attorneys go into their work, they really need to know what's the impact of the record actually being shown in a court of law in a certain jurisdiction. So it gets to that kind of uh, specificity, I think. It's very interesting. Yeah, and, 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 and I think the role of the European Patent Office will become even more important again in combination with the Unified Patent Court because uh, the European Patent Office uh, does the whole examination procedure, which is then centrally uh, handled by the Unified Patent Court again. And so, so I think it is, yeah, the role of the European Patent Office will become even more important with the future uh, Unified Patent Court. That's great. Maybe I can, I can, I can switch gears a bit. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've, we've covered, a, a, you know, Three, three substantive uh, topics of discussion in patents. I just want to, before I, I, I turn to trade secrets, um, I'd like to segue a bit, if I may, into tokenization. Because in my part of the world, that's, that's a conversation that's gaining some force. Um, and you may have heard of non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible tokens have, have come into the landscape uh, in, in Asia, uh, in part because of a few uh, notable uh, successes. You've heard of CryptoPunks, you've heard of CryptoKitties and how they can actually be transacted using a non-fungible token, which is nothing more than uh, a paperless uh, proxy representing you know, a, a digital asset or a range of digital assets. Um, I'll get to the relevance to patents in a minute. So what we're seeing is that with non-fungible uh, tokens, people have transacted them. And, and in some cases, like Beepos, um, the 5,000 in, in one artwork, uh, a day artwork, uh, you fetch like 69, um, uh, you managed to fetch 69 million or something in a Christie's auction. You know, so everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, getting very excited. Um, now, the question I, I have is really in the, in the context of this session is, first of all, NFTs, uh, they, they are a paperless proxy. They basically get, get transacted along using the, the blockchain, uh, preferably a Ethereum kind of protocol. Um, they have been applied to licensing, uh, sale uh, and ownership of predominantly things to do more with digital art and artistic works in copyright. So in our part of the world, many jurisdictions, Singapore uh, in particular, we don't have a registration system for copyright. So it's easy to represent uh, a, a copyrighted work using a non-fungible token. Uh, the question I ask is whether it can be a potential to basis to tokenize patent rights and transacting patent rights. Um, NFTs serve 
they, they almost give you immutable proof of uh, authenticity. Uh, well, not so much authenticity, that can vary, but certainly provenance, provenance and originality. Um, you, you should be able to identify who actually originated the art. With unregistered IP, like copyright and confidential information, even trade secrets, NFTs may have a role in assisting uh, and actually com complementing the commercialization space. Um, and if you want to talk about the deployment of smart, smart contracts and also rights management information, um, NFTs actually can be enveloped with terms and conditions of usage, artists' resale rights, and even um, attribution rights, the right of, right of paternity, which is a moral right for art, uh, artists and so on, that, that, and, and authors, that can be encapsulated in um, the NFT. But I would suggest that in the context of registered IP, um, it may not be the case that NFTs can function as actually an effective proxy. Um, because in the real world, we have a recordo system, we have registers, we have uh, registration regimes that mandate the recordo of, re of, of transactions, whether it's a license, an assignment, a securitization, or any such like. Uh, if you want to create a trust instrument, that that kind of uh, real world recording requirement in patent prosecution practice in particular, I think will make the NFT uh, unsuitable as a digital proxy for transactions. Um, th th that's not that much written in relation to registered registration regimes. I've seen that the bulk, the majority of the writing has been concerning all the all the you know the, the cases where you have artwork that, that fetches a ridiculous amount of money, um, crypto punks, crypto kitties. But I would say that in the registered uh, uh, IP world, um, NFTs may not be a suitable proxy. Um, and, and we're starting to have that conversation, number one. Number two, uh, NFT exchanges also have to be scrutinized for the terms and conditions. Um, what are the, you know, if they're linked to cryptocurrency transactions as well, what's the the risk of realization of not being able to realize the cash, um, having the the, the 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 cryptocurrencies being stolen or pilfered away uh, by by cybersecurity attacks that has happened, and then the lawyer's role then turns into a tracer, where he's trying to trace the, the proceeds um, in terms of cryptocurrencies, um, and and cryptocurrencies actually are fungible, so you can't call them non fungible. Non fungible by definition would would Re, you know, require a state of um, uniqueness and a distinct identity. It's not something that can be replicated. Um, so I think I think the, the 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 conclusion I would have currently is that NFTs can work to transact. I think unregistered IP quite well. It can form the basis for for a token that accompanies a, a transaction document because it completely encapsulates and identifies the work in question. Um, but I think in relation to a registration regime, such as what we're all immersed with in, in patent practice, I see that really difficult, uh, a real difficult challenge. To add another layer, and, and you know, whilst you can say the blockchain itself is like an immutable, immutable uh, uh, d d distributed ledger. Well, the fact is, you, whatever the ledger says, you still have to do a real world uh, record which of itself does not confer or perfect rights of ownership, but it puts the world on notice uh, in relation to uh, transactions that you have entered into. So, so my, my, my offering to this conference is, I think NFTs are uh, not necessarily a myth per se. I think, I think a lot of, there's a lot of hype and I think, I think you've got to be very careful of the risks. I mean, every time you talk about one digital artwork or one digital print being sold using an NFT, to me, that speaks against the scarcity of the the property in question, and with that, with the scar with the if scarcity goes, so does value. Um, so that's an inherent risk. But I think I think in relation to the registered IP world, I'll be very slow to advise clients um, to use NFTs as a basis for transacting, because in the real world, there are also registration regimes that we need to be actually is more more important for the for the state of the ownership of that particular uh, patent or trademark or industrial design. So I'll just leave that with, with us. Um, 
And of course, some of us in the audience may wonder, what, what's he going on about? Uh, I don't understand a word of this. Great. Uh, we, we can ask me, you can ask us questions on that later on. Um, any comments? Be happy to, uh, you know, it's offline, yeah. Just, just on my side, I'm, I'm really learning a lot on non-fungible tokens. It's, it's, uh, it's really been uh, an eye-opener, Stan. I didn't know much of it, and it's really interesting. And I see the risks that you just mentioned. Yeah, you know, it's part of this movement of of this 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 other constituency that's growing in the world, which is to decentralize finance. So cryptocurrency is all part of that, that, that conversation where they want to take banking and financing away from the institutions. So for, for institutions in Europe, I think, I think a matter of time, you'll be dealing with these issues as well. Um, you know, and I'm sure you're already dealing with it, but it's just that I think in the, in the East, uh, we're seeing a bit of this taking traction. I mean, China has a different approach towards cryptocurrencies, um, but certainly, I mean, Tokenization is, is starting to, to emerge everywhere. But where we try and put the clients and bring them back to earth is to say, look, you've got to really look at what you're transacting. Uh, and it doesn't remove recordal or registration requirements. You know, I mean, I mean, I like what Marcus talks about, about you know, different systems being forgiving to a large, greater or lesser extent. Um, I, I mean, Marcus, I, I would always tell some clients uh, and then remind myself that I should never have said it. I quote your former president, John F. Kennedy, when he said that, you know, an error doesn't have to become a mistake unless you, you don't correct it. Okay, the, the problem is, with that kind of remark is it comes through as very flippant. And number one, and number two, it doesn't solve the problem, which is actually to cor correct the error. So I've tried not to use it as much, but I understand what you're saying. But in the, in, in the, in the non-fungible token world, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely uh, um, nefarious. The extent to which you need to make amendments or update the blockchain, there's no statutory regimes. So it's very difficult to, to impose any discipline on that. Yeah, so my understanding of, of NFTs and the, the crypto world in general is, um, you mentioned decentralization, those same um, you know people that are pushing for decentralization and, and you know, they don't want the US government or others to be messing with uh, the crypto world. The same people are also probably, a lot of them are anti-IP rights as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, you probably are, it's gonna be, and I've actually filed some patent applications on NFT exchanges. So not everyone is that way. They're sort of working around the edges of NFT and crypto. But I think in terms of using um, that technology for recording IP rights that you might, find difficulties even with just that, that mindset. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just see a very interesting remark in the chat, if you see that, um, mm -hmm. by Anthony um, uh, Tallman that says, look, in connection with, okay, th thank you. Uh, th thank you for the compliment. Bitcoin is now legal tender in El Salvador. See, yeah, exactly. Um, so that that's, that's the currency for non-fungible tokens, right? Um, you know, it'd be interesting if Ethereum is also accepted. Yeah. Really interesting. Okay. Um, you make a good po point, Marcus, about, about um, you know, these patent filings in, 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 in NFT exchanges because, see, that, that's the thing that's always creeping up because, you know, I mean, you have uh, trolling issues. You have trolling issues in each jurisdiction. And what we always have to remind our clients also is to really do searches and do them well because nobody troubles you if you're not a success, right? The minute you <laughs> get into some prominence, then suddenly you have to you have a whole new scourge to deal with. Um, and and there's some people that actually oriented their entire um, business plan, and and that's why I worry sometimes in countries like mine where we're looking at third party funding for litigation as well. Um, to try and in, in improve and increase litigation. But what, to me, that's another business model to fund trolls, you know? So it depends on which side of your business or that business do you want to be in? Because if you can get third party funding to cover disbursements, you can actually launch a few interesting actions. Um, and if you are the receiving end of that, then you, you must have resources to, to fight. So it's interesting, yeah. 
Jill, 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 sorry, yeah, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, you want to talk to us about trade secrets and confidentiality in China and some of the recent legislation? Right, I'll just be very quickly and shed some light on the developments in China. So, as you all know, trade secrets are also very, very important in IP assets, right? We've talked about patents mainly today. Um, but over the years, there have been discussions in terms of lacking protection of trade secrets in, in China. And the significant legisl legislative development happened in 2019. So China amended the entire unfair competition law. And just to put this into comparative perspective, in China, we do have a law governing trade secret protection on a, on a state level. But this is a um, part of parcel of the broader unfair competition law. And there has been recent discussion in terms of creating a standalone trade secret law. What's significant about this uh, amendment to the unfair competition law is that uh, significant provisions such as um, reversing burden of proof to the trade secret defendant has been codified. And in the past two years, We've also seen significant big trade secret damages handed down by the Chinese Supreme Court. And in one case, the court affirmed the damages near to 4.6 million US dollars. And in another case, the damages awarded uh, was as high as close to 24.6 million US dollars. So that by Chinese standard, uh, would be extraordinary damages. And these are positive steps, meaning that if a rights owner is brought their case, collected evidence or properly and fought with determination, they potentially would have their day in a Chinese court to defend their trade secret and to also put on um, the bad guy and to pay, pay, to pay the penalty. And that's all the positive side. But I'm also wanted to share with you what we are dealing with on the ground, probably uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. An example will be something I work on this today. So we have a European client looking at a joint venture arrangement with a Chinese company, and they are going to contribute in their IP. So there will be a tech transfer arrangement between the European company and the Chinese company. And Guess what's the first question they ask us about IP? They ask us whether it would be possible for us to obtain a preliminary injunction before the Chinese court if anything goes wrong with this Chinese counterparty. And unfortunately, the answer or the advice I gave today is that it will be still quite challenging because it's true that Chinese courts have granted preliminary injunctions in recent years um, for rights owners, including Eli Lilly and Novartis. But these cases all involve their former employees, where the rights owners will be able to show to the court in their PR application that the employees downloaded from the internet, say hundreds or thousands of documents, right? These are confidential technical documents. And that was a very clear and straightforward case to persuade a court to grant the PI app application. But in a more compli complicated, fact patterns say involving your business partner and how you can sh show that to a Chinese court, it still seems quite difficult um, to tell the truth. Uh, but what we will advise in these scenarios is enforcement is always the last result, right? You will need to like look at how you can protect your trade secrets from other measures, say contract measures or your operational measures it will be quite critically important for you to have all the operational visibility and control to the extent possible. So you can monitor what's going on at this operation whereby, whereby they are using your trade secrets in, in China. And it will also be interesting to think about what contract protection will you need. So do you need to consider, say, you have some audit right in your agreement to make sure that you can monitor and audit even the use of trade secrets by this entity in, in China. And how you can craft important, specific 
and a broad restrictive covenants concerning the license tree secrets. These are all important discussions I think will be worthwhile considering if you are licensing your IP to a Chinese company. And I'll just stop here. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. Um, you, can you just outline the basic uh, elements of the statutory uh, framework uh, to frame, to, to, to how do you prepare a cause of action for breach of confidence in China? Or, it's the same as what, it's the same as what you have in in Europe and or in the United States. So the trade secrets law, in terms of the elements for cause of action, I would think have been harmonized to a great extent. So first of all, you will need to show that um, whatever you claimed is actually a secret, right? You put in place proper confidentiality measures to safeguard the secrecy of the secret. And secondly, we need to show that someone, the defendants say, they have um, conducted an act either misusing or misappropriating your secret. And the final element will be damages. And the tricky part is really how to show misuse or misappropriation because China is a civil law jurisdiction and we have very, very strict burden of proof. Uh, on the part of the plaintiff. Uh, there's very, very limited discovery in civil litigation in China. That's, that's the true. fundamental challenge in a tree secret case. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Michael, uh, do you want to talk a bit about the German position um, and some of the legislative reforms that, that we may be seeing? Yeah. For, yeah. So thank you very much, Stan. So first of all, I, I just want to make a, a, a comment on on Jill's uh, talk. So I'm very happy to to hear that uh, also now in the field of trade secrets, uh, China uh, is, is evolving and, and 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 making a lot of steps further. I think during the last ten years we experienced a tremendous. Uh, 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 success in implementing uh, uh, IP rules and IP laws in, in China, which are really even now can litigate it in, in China, uh, uh, even for European firms. So I'm very happy to hear that you're also do s s a similar progress now in trade secrets. I think this is uh, uh, very important also for our clients to consult them, to invest into intellectual property in China because then it is enforceable also in China and that's the same with trade secrets now so so I'm, I'm very happy to hear this so um, yeah but, but we actually had the experience securing real preliminary injunction in patent cases for European and uh, American clients mm -hmm. but these all present very very simple um, clear infringement and fact pattern for, for the judges so uh, things will still be challenging, but it, it can be navigated. That's yep. what we can okay. say. Yeah. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, thank you very much, Stan. So I, I very briefly, I think we, we, we have to take care that we do not run out of time. So uh, I very briefly want to give a small overview over uh, 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 the, the new uh, the changes in, in, in German patent law. In August this year, uh, the so-called Second Patent Law Simplification and Modernization, Modernization Act entered into force. And uh, one central change is the amendment of the Section 139 of the German Patent Act. This uh, uh, Section 139 refers to uh, the claim of injunctive relief and uh, uh, to damages. And uh, up to now, let's say the, 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 the formal wording of this section was that any person who uses a patented invention uh, uh, contrary to sections 9 to 13 in the event of the risk of recurrent infringement be sued by the harmed party for injunctive relief nothing else so only just this right may also be asserted in the event of the risk of a first time infringement so even if they're not had been an infringement uh, you can get this injunctive relief uh, if you can prove that there is a risk of a first time infringement but uh, uh, the, the 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 section 139 paragraph 1 just said that uh, uh, 
a person can uh, be sued by the harmed party for injunctive relief. And uh, now this section has been added by the, by the following sentence. This claim of injunctive relief is excluded in so far as in light of the special circumstances of the specific case and the principles of good faith, it would cause the infringer or third parties unreasonable hardship, not justified by the exclusive right. In this case, the harm party shall be granted a reasonable monetary compensation. So this, this now means that the uh, harm party not immediately always can receive this uh, injunctive relief, but uh, under special circumstances of a specific case and the principle of good faith, uh, it also may result that uh, the harmed party cannot get this injunctive relief, but just gets money, a reasonable monetary compensation. So this amendment of uh, this section 139 therefore introduces an examination of the proportionality of the injunctive relief in infringement proceedings. Even so many participants in the discussion uh, before uh, this uh, uh, act came into force uh, uh, argue that this merely transfers a proportionality test which already had been anchored in the German civil code uh, and does not, does not change the legal situation. Well, the now the reliability and efficiency of German patent law is to be feared. So. Uh, just for liability reasons alone, a representative of the alleged infringers now will always have to raise this objection to proportionality so that the infringement process will, ex will be extended by another point of dispute and gain in complexity. The advocates of a fundamental proportionality test thus want to put a stop to the so-called patent trolls or the non-practicing uh, enti entities. Uh, uh, furthermore, it is important to note that the infringer can not only rely in respect of these uh, 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 special circumstances on his own circumstances, but the legislator has also explicitly included the interest of third parties. For example, the infringer can refer to these in the future. This is particularly important for constellations with suppliers, for example, in the automotive industry, who are thus enabled to invoke impeding effects on end producers. For example, the end producer could be a car manufacturer in order to justify this disproportionality. So uh, in our opinion, the text of the law that now has been adopted sufficiently expresses the rule exception relationship. So I think this, uh, this amended rule is really an exception and is not the regular uh, case. And the hurdles for such an exception to the right to injunctive reliefs are really set very high. For each individual case, it must be examined whether the right to injunctive relief would lead to an unreasonable hardship, not justified by the exclusive right. And the requirement of good faith and any interest of third parties must also be taken into account. Uh, well, and to compensate this restriction of the right to injunctive relief, the right to damages for the patent proprietor receives a compensatory claim in the form of an appropriate uh, compensation. So, uh, well, we now have to see if this amendment really changes uh, the, uh, uh, the, the court procedure and uh, uh, so, really want to, one has to see how this amendment then actually plays uh, out in practice. Uh, because as already mentioned, we already had uh, in our civil code uh, such uh, a test of proportionality uh, uh, and, and to, 
to balance the interest of the patent owner compared to uh, the effect for the um, accused infringer. Um, well, another important change uh, with this um, uh, uh, Modernization Act is uh, that uh, it now welcomes procedural provisions for the protection of trade secrets uh, and they have been included into the Patent Act. Mm. Until now, the general rules of publicity of court proceedings uh, has also have also been applicable in patent infringement proceedings. This means exclusion of the public for the discussion of trade secrets was in the past only possible with difficulty. Furthermore, there were no regulations protecting a trade secret owner from the use of this trade secret by the other party in such uh, uh, court uh, proceedings. As a result of the application of the provisions of the German Trade Secret Act, the court now can classify any information introduced into a lawsuit as confidential if it could be a trade secret. So this is uh, a further uh, really important, I think, amendment in, uh, uh, with this uh, Modernization Act. Um, procedural wise, uh, the Modernization Act uh, uh, now synchronizes the nullity proceedings before the Federal Patent Court and infringement proceedings before the civil courts. Uh, Marcus already mentioned that um, in Germany we have this, uh, let's say, split jurisdiction. This means that uh, nullity proceedings are handled in Germany by a central uh, federal patent court. And on the other hand, all the infringement proceedings are handled by uh, district courts, by civil courts. And the problem in practice so far has been that a qualified notice of the patent court in nullity proceedings was often only issued after the oral proceedings in the parallel infringement proceedings at the district court. And uh, therefore, the infringement court could not take into account the preliminary assessment of the patent court in its decision on a possible stay, for example, in infringement proceedings. Uh, and thus, due to the time sequence described above, the district courts had to decide whether the patent is likely to prove to be legally valid without the possibility of assessing the qualified indication of a patent court. And as of May next year, so this uh, really is just effective in next year of May, uh, in, in May, for starting from May next year, uh, this will change. According to the new uh, uh, Patent Act, the so-called qualified notice of this central federal patent court shall be available uh, in six or uh, within six months after the service of the nullity action. And with this, a very short time span, uh, hopefully the infringement court, the civil court, will have the chance to consider this uh, qualified notice uh, uh, for their decisions. Uh, yeah, I think this have been the three most important uh, uh, amendments uh, uh, which uh, came uh, or are now uh, came into force with this Modernization Act uh, this year. So, so uh, that that's helpful, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, so, patent assertion uh, and 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 trolls and non-practicing entities, they will not be. Your your reading is that they will not be able to get injunctions that easily. Is that is that a Correct yeah, reading. not as easily. That's exactly how exact what you were saying. So it is not in, excluded, but if yeah. uh, an injunction for let's such say for such a troll or a non-manufacturing company, uh, if it, it, it would then uh, harm, for example, the manufacturing company company so hard uh, that it is disproportional, then the non-manufacturing company very likely will not get an injunction, but will, let's say, just get money because, and, and 
typically they are just interested in money and not in any uh, uh, injunctive relief. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, uh, Ma Marcus, is it is it still the case that the Eastern District of Texas uh, is 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 a, a very is a favorite destination for patent owners? And would you have any response to the German solution? Well, so Eastern District of Texas is still popular, but the most popular one now is Western District of Texas. Uh, Judge Albright, he was a, a patent litigator. Um, I actually had a case against him in the Western District of Texas when he was an attorney and had been named as the possible judge. And so he had to come off the case and, but, and, and then he was later the judge at Western District of Texas. And, um, so he's been by far the most popular judge for patent plaintiffs. Some of them are NPEs, others are, are um, you know, competitive companies that have operating businesses. Um, so he's the most popular now, but yeah, what Eastern District of Texas still is popular. District of Delaware, just, you know, Northern District of Illinois, there's, there's all the normal ones are there and um, some of the California districts are popular with uh, the defendants. Um, but, uh, and then the question was, was the question relating to um, injunctive relief? Is that, yeah. okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, it brings up some similar issues as in the US Supreme Court's eBay um, work exchange case with the four, uh, where there's the four factors that sound somewhat similar where there's irreparable injury and, um, you know, adequate remedies and impact on and hardships on the plaintiff and defendant, and then public interest if it would be deserved by a, by an injunction, and that kind of is the same as the third parties that you were looking at. So um, it it sounds like there's some similarities there, um, and it'll be interesting to see how it actually works I, I, out. I think the civil the civil code formula uh, doctrine of proportionality. Uh, is what we would regard as the balance of interest um, evaluation. Um, to what extent does it is it so uh, prohibitively going to affect businesses that it cannot be compensated by a lot of damages? That that usually would be a, a basis for a court to decide. Certainly in, in my jurisdiction. Yeah, we have um, the international trade um, proceedings, the ITC proceedings for imported goods, if you have a domestic industry too. And that's that's sort of another good way to, to get an injunction if you have a domestic industry. It's faster, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's faster. It's difficult as a litigator to keep up with the dates. It's so fast, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's great It's great for pressure and surprise. Mm -hmm. um, okay, guys, uh, so so I, I just wanted to round off by uh, building on, 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 you know, just looking at trade secrets again. And it was quite interesting, Joe, uh, when you talked about confidential information, the, the tests really in Chinese law, you look at whether you have a, you know, it has to be confidential or trade secret to begin with, whether it's disclosed in circumstances that import an obligation, whether, you know, I mean, contractual or otherwise, uh, an obligation of confidentiality, and then thirdly, um, misuse, uh, and fourthly, damage. Now, in Singapore law, we, we we have a three part test which is which follows your first two the same the first is is whether it's confidential in character secondly whether it's it's disclosed in circumstances that import an obligation of confidence whether contractual or equitable but for cases uh, in in a recent case which i will just um put it up on the yeah i've given i've given that reference in the chat i mean just email me if you want a decision the decision um, that has actually turned the third requirement in Singapore law, which is detriment, on its head in the sense that if you have a case where an employee has left or anybody has taken massive amounts of information from a company, there's a presumption after satisfying the first two tests, there's a presumption of breach of confidence. And then the burden shifts to the defendant to show that his conscience should not have been affected. So that's a new uh, twist. Uh, given by this case that's in front of you in the chat screen, um, which is something I was involved. Actually, I got the guy, I got the defendants off in, in the, the, the trial court. They, they, they took some information. I was able to establish that there was absolutely no, no proof of detriment. But on appeal, the Court of Appeal changed the law and said that you don't need the proof because 
uh, there is almost a, a presumption of breach of confidence, which they could not, um, uh, they could not acquit their conscience to be excused of the act. So what this means, this has a lot of ramifications going forward, because in 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 the age where we're doing a lot of work from home. And a lot of employees who are who are not uh, uh, in the office, they may take a lot of information away from with them at home. In a future scenario, if they're caught with this information from the office at home, uh, then there is a presumption that may arise, which you then have to rebut. So it's a very pro-employer kind of approach uh, to to trade secret enforcement. I just throw that in. Um, but please feel free, any, any, any participants who want this case, uh, please let me know. I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you. Now, we've got an interesting, uh, uh, oh, if you look at the Q&A, there's a humding of a question. Uh, what is the main challenge for AI and tech policy in your jurisdictions? Uh, finding human-centric rules that make sense of for AI-related activities or something else? Um, I, you know what? Can we just nominate Roberta to, un, to answer this question since she's she's from the establishment? Thank you, Stan. Uh, love you for that. Um, no, gladly. So um, I, I, I'm, I know I've got 30 seconds. Basically, I need to make a distinction here because we have, if we have um, artificial intelligence related patent applications, <clears throat> we use the usual approach as for mathematics algorithm when it is about patentability. And so if you have a technical effect linked to that, there is a presumption of patentability. If not, then it's an abstract business method and this is not patentable. This is one part of the story. So this is about patent application directed to um, artificial intelligence um, or invention related or relying on artificial intelligence. The second aspect that you have here, and it's perhaps related to what I mentioned before, is, for example, we're looking in artificial intelligence helping us out in routine um, part of our, of our job, for example, classification. And this is something that we do securing that the, the learning of the uh, artificial intelligence um, system or engine is actually uh, accompanied by a strict quality check before validating. Because as you know, once you start to feed in um, artificial intelligence, but it's the wrong feeding, it goes on its own way. So I, I, I'd like to make this distinction. You have patent applications based on artificial intelligence and doing our own, running the office and operating, basing part of the routine tasks on artificial intelligence. I don't know if I um, addressed the question. Let me know if not or, or drop a, a, a mail and I'll be happy to reply. Thanks very much. I mean, I mean that's a fantastic answer. Um, I think I think certainly as practitioners, we're, we're really dealing currently with um, the difficulties of AI authorship and AI inventorship, um, and and how that impacts on all our respective IP laws. Um, I think in China the position is slightly clearer, but for us, uh, it's it, certainly in Singapore it's not clear at all. Um, and and the we'll answers. So um, for 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 the inventor, it has if it is about the inventorship. So yeah. that has to be a physical person. And we uh, have refused um, uh, a patent application based on that. So really for formal deficiencies, I see Michael also, mm -hmm. Michelle. Yeah, also yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. So I, I, from my experience, I think as Roberta said, uh, as long as it is technical, it is handled similar to every mathematics to, to, to every other invention disclosure as well uh, sometimes with artificial intelligence uh, you further you 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 more have the problem to prove that it is uh, based on an inventive step because just translating a method or any flow chart which you normally do in do uh, you which you, which you normally do by your brain and, and just translating it into uh, uh, into the computer, I think this is very often not based on an inventive step because it's just uh, how the technology develops. So uh, if the whole system is already known, what you 
do in your daily practice, for example, this learning, then it is uh, difficult to prove uh, an inventive step and it's not handled different from any other invention, I think. Yeah. Very helpful. Well, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a, a complete pleasure. And, and I just want to thank Jill, Roberta, Marcus and Michael. Uh, it's been my pleasure to share this session and I'm glad we had a rousing discussion. I hope the participants uh, share in, in, in my delight. Uh, thank you very much for your participation and for your insights. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again before too long. And let's stay in touch together, panelists. Uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to all of you individually. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Dad. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Sam, for your moderation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Goodbye you. to everyone. Thank you. It's, it, it's exactly five past midnight, Singapore time. Uh, <laughs> and I think Beijing too, right, Jill? Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah, it's, it's quite late. So enjoy the rest of the day. And above all, please stay safe and look after yourself and your families. Yeah. Thank, thank you very you, much. Sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sam. Goodbye. Bye, Michael. So hello and uh, welcome everyone to session three strategies on the PCT. I have a wonderful collection of panelists with me today. I, I don't, it's hard to know in which order to start, but I'll, I'll since we only have one female panelist and I, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I would like to stand, uh, start with Nancy Song. She's a partner in Linda Yu and Partners. Uh, from China, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you. Then there is a Mr. Katsuhito Akazawa, uh, Vice President and Managing Partner of Tani and Abe from Japan. Welcome, uh, Katsuhide. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Detlef von Asen uh, from uh, Kunen and Wacker, a partner in Kunen and Wacker. Uh, someone who's been, uh, I guess, at several of these events, so it's great to have you back here. Uh, welcome. And Thank you. Thank you. we have uh, Mr. John Richards, counsel uh, to Ladison Perry, who's going to cover a bit more the U.S. perspective on our panel. Welcome. And uh, last but not least, we also have Mr. Yongpeng Chao, from uh, CNIPA, uh, Deputy Director of PCD Division uh, 3, Preliminary Examination and Workflow Department. I guess folks working for offices always have the longest of titles, but uh, there we are. So welcome, uh, Yung Peng, and it's great to have you uh, with us here today. So everyone, uh, of course, please use the question chat function if you have any questions as we move along uh, on uh, the various topics we would like to cover today. In fact, we would like to cover essentially three uh, parts. I would like to give you a little bit of an update first on the latest developments in the PCT system. And then we'll uh, start with more of a thorough discussion with the various panelists. First of all, on the, the larger topic of priority claiming and the importance of priority claiming and some of the pitfalls potentially, and then uh, best practices for national face entry in the various jurisdictions that we have represented here today. So with that, uh, if you would permit me, and I know this is probably not best practice here as, a, as the moderator to start out, but I hope uh, the other panelists will bear with me. I'll just would like to give you a very quick rundown on the latest developments in the PCT, mostly because just yesterday the PCT assembly met and agreed on a couple of rule changes which will enter into force 1st of July of 2020. So that's uh, July next year. And uh, there was also the appointment of another international searching and preliminary examining authority. And let me maybe start off with that because that's, I suppose, the simplest. So the Eurasian Patent Office has just been appointed as uh, the next ISA IPA in the big family of uh, PCT searching authorities. And so we're very happy about that. We don't know yet for sure when they will become operational, uh, but that's uh, a question that needs to be decided uh, on, on a practical level. 
so this is the nice and good news uh, in terms of the Eurasian patent office. In terms of rule changes, there are essentially two rule changes which I would like to, to highlight. Uh, the first one is probably the most important one, and it concerns in particular applicants who work in the biotech area. Many of those who work in this area have probably already heard about it, but I would like to reiterate it here for everyone. So what we are doing as of 1st of July 2020 is we're moving the standard for filing of sequence listings if you file a PCT application to a new standard. So everything used to be based on what's called ST25 and we're now shifting to ST26. And it is a new standard. It has new and different technical uh, requirements. And I think the biggest and most important distinction really is in the old days, under the, the current standard, you could file a sequence listing potentially on paper. You could file it in PDF. Uh, the preferred choice even today was to file it electronically in text format. And that was or is the best way to handle it also for fee purposes. But with the new standard, you're as an applicant actually obliged to file electronically. And the only standard technical standard accepted is XML format so in this sense it will be quite a change and something that applicants filing in the area of nucleotide or amino acid uh, sequences need to absolutely get used to so how do you create a sequence listing in xml format well there is a tool uh, currently developed by wipo tested and hopefully all ready to go by first of july next year which will allow applicants to basically generate ST26 compliant XML uh, sequence listings. There's also a tool developed for offices so that they can actually check whether it's um, standard compliant. So this is sort of the technical aspect that's being, uh, being worked on. What we're also working on as we speak basically, except that it's kind of the weekend, so I guess uh, that's probably not true, but starting again on Monday is uh, to implement now these rule changes concerning SC26 by adopting changes to the administrative instruction, which actually in, in Annex C will contain the actual standard. Uh, and that's of course of critical importance and hopefully we'll get to promulgate this uh, change in this new standard uh, soon so that applicants offices can all see it and, and be ready for it. There's also a need to adapt guidelines both for the receiving office, but maybe even more important, authorities to be ready and able to handle the uh, sequence listings with the new standard. So this is basically the one big change and, and my recommendation to everyone out there, especially those who work in this technical field, to just uh, as early on try to familiarize yourselves with this new standard. Uh, WIPO is offering quite a number of dedicated webinars in this regard. So if you are in this area, check out some of them are recorded on our website. You can join them live, but there's a lot of information that's currently being produced and offered uh, to users out there so that they can properly familiarize themselves with the subject. And the second rule change is another modification to rule 82 quarter 82 quarter is a rule that has been around for a while. It was actually uh, first really introduced uh, in uh, the aftermath of the natural catastrophes in Japan, when uh, the PCT community felt we needed to have provisions how to deal with natural catastrophe um, and, and what to offer to applicants if they miss a time limit because of such a catastrophe. Um, now, sadly, of course, this provision has become quite prominent as of lately because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and applicants actually needed to rely on that particular provision also in this uh, context and have done so successfully. However, it was felt that this rule could still be improved. So there are two elements that uh, member states felt uh, could be further improved. The one was a specific authorization to offices that they could waive the requirement that proof or evidence needs to be furnished why an applicant 
has missed a particular uh, time limit. So the background to this is we all know about the pandemic. We know the implications of the pandemic. We didn't want applicants to be obliged to furnish evidence about the pandemic, something that the offices know already. In practice, we have actually kind of um, recommended to offices to not insist on proof or evidence in this regard, but now it has been uh, specifically included into the uh, rule and uh, could be relied on by offices in, in future events, which of course we hope will not happen. The second aspect, maybe even more interesting, is that some offices felt, well, 82 quarter at the moment works on a request by the applicant basis. So every time he or she misses a time limit, it needs to request to be excused. And some offices felt that was too much of a burden on offices, on applicants doing this on a case by case basis. And they would prefer to move to a system where an office for a certain amount of time could say, we waive the time limit. So for two months, let's say, all time limits will be automatically extended. And that applies then across the board. And this is a new part of 82 quarter that was just adopted and will be then as of 1st of July uh, next year available. But again, as I said, I do really hope that uh, there's no need for uh, the world to use these provisions because they're really intended for worst case type of scenarios. So hopefully uh, not much use of it. Uh, just a warning in, in respect of 82 quarter, if anyone would have had their hopes up, the rule does not apply to the Paris Convention uh, and it does not apply to the time limit to enter national phase two, of course, very important time limits under the PCT. So unfortunately, the rule does not apply to that. But having mentioned the Paris Convention, this actually now would take me to our next topic. And I wanted to talk a little uh, with all of you about the issue of priority claiming. As you, of course, all know in the PCT, just as in other applications, you can claim priority of earlier uh, applications filed elsewhere. Um, Article 8 refers to Article 4 of the Paris Convention. And the PCT also allows us to correct or add priority claims during the international phase. And uh, one of the questions I would have to uh, the panelists here with me today uh, would be, so during the international phase, you can correct, you can add, but what if you miss the time limit to do so, and you're now entering the national phase, can you still address that problem in the national phase? And uh, I don't know who wants to start, but maybe Nancy, if I give the floor to you first, if you want to say something on this, that would be fantastic. Well, sure. Well, sure. well in China, um, if you um, miss um, type in a certain information in your priority claim, for instance, the priority number or the priority date, and you also miss the chance to correct the same uh, during the international phase, upon the Chinese national entry, you still can amend um, the information. And you can amend the same at the latest by uh, two months after entering Chinese national phase. But you cannot make all mistakes among the uh, priority information. So uh, there are um, three items. And if you make two mistakes among the three items, you are still able to correct the same. For instance, if you uh, make the wrong um, priority date or make the wrong priority number. Um, so um, in our uh, practical experience, most of the uh, errors have already been noticed and corrected in the international phase. Only a few are left for Chinese national phase. And in most cases, uh, we are still in time to make use of the two month period in the Chinese patent office. Okay, but it's great to know that there is actually an opportunity. So you couldn't mm -hmm. add a priority claim which you didn't make? Uh, I don't possibly. think so. Yeah, but you could at least correct if it if, if maybe not everything is wrong, but only two elements out of the three. Mm -hmm. uh, Yun Peng, do you, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just as uh, Nancy said, uh, if a priority has uh, been claimed uh, in the international phase, and if one or two mistakes uh, of the three items, that is uh, the date of the priority date, uh, the number of the priority, uh, the, the, the earlier number, and the, the receiving office, if one or two items has been 
uh, there are mistakes in one or two items, uh, the applicant still have chance to correct them. But uh, if all the three items are wrong, I think um, you, you need to win. You, you don't you can't uh, fix it. And another another question is that uh, uh, if the application applicant didn't make a, a claim a priority in the international phase, that is uh, when filing the PCT application, they didn't they failed to make a priority claim. And then in when entering into China, uh, China national phase, the applicant cannot uh, restore such such uh, priority claim. And another uh, concern I may uh, express uh, here is uh, um, the CNIPA do not uh, accept the priority uh, from 12 months to 14 months. Be, uh, from the priority date. If the uh, in the international phase, the um, uh, the, uh, the application has been the the, the priority has been uh, restored. Um, in the in, uh, in Ch China national phase, we don't accept the, the the priority, which is beyond the twelve months. Just very interesting additional aspect. Yeah. So I guess we were starting out more with the career priority claims but there is of course also the issue that maybe someone filed a PCT application too late and would then hope to maybe restore the priority right which is a safeguard under the PCT in rule 26 bis.3 but as you mentioned it's not applied by all designated offices and in China is one of the offices accept a decision by another RO uh, that has restored or if the applicant were to address the restaurant directly to CNIPA, they would also not uh, be able to accept such a request. So that's, of course, also a very important aspect. Yes. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Yunpeng. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, John, I, I don't know which jurisdictions you're all covering, but uh, <laughs> uh, by all means, go whichever way you would like. Okay. I'll Let's just deal with the, the, the US. Um, basically, we have the United States has, has adopted the PLT, the Patent Law Treaty, on the basis that unintentional errors are correctable within um, two months of uh, the date that you missed. Um, so that solves a lot of problems. Also, um, the United States treats PCT applications as being US national applications, so that failures to comply with various requirements in the PCT application could result in the US application being deemed to be abandoned. But that's not particularly fatal in the United States because you have the right basically to seek um, reinstatement of the application and again on um, an unintentional basis so that you, you can basically solve most of these problems without too much too much difficulty in the United States. Some fees that need to be paid. Oh, lots of, oh of course there are fees to be paid. I mean, <laughs> that goes without saying. <laughs> yes, good. Great. Uh, so, Detlef, did you want to maybe cover then something more on Europe uh, or Germany? Uh... I'm I'm happy to do so. Um, well, with with, with Germany, uh, as um, Jinping mentioned for for China, um, if you miss a priority term, there's no reinstatement uh, into the priority term in Germany. But there is a reinstatement into the priority term before the European Patent Office. Um, however, the hurdle is very high. Uh, we do not have the unintentional standard like, like uh, requested in, in the PCT or, you, as you know, probably from the United States or, or Great Britain. And the EPO requires 
that the due date is missed in spite of all due care, which is really a, a very high hurdle. Uh, there must be two paralegals having made a failure in a four right principle or something like that, or, or something inverse. Your, your office has been burned down or, or whatever. Uh, so, so better do not rely on that. Um, with regard to correction uh, of false um, priority claim, again, I, I would, like Nancy mentioned, I, I would say that it claim is not possible. Further, the, both um, European Patent Convention as well as German national law requires that the um, priority claim is, or the information for the priority claim is provided within 60 months of priority and can be corrected within that term. And since uh, we have to enter regional phase or national phase after 22 uh, 32 months, uh, by the way, as of next um, May also for Germany, we extended as of next May, um, we the, the national phase entry from 30 to 31 months. Uh, um, so it will be very difficult. In, in, however, the European Patent Convention has a rule 139 allowing to file corrections of uh, erroneous papers filed with, with the uh, EPO. Uh, so that that may help out that um, the, the case law of the judicial board of appeals says um, to an, an order to be allowed to correct a um, priority statement for priority claim it must be obvious from the PCT application from the published PCT application that there was a mistake so if you can see from from that paper that, that there was a mistake, uh, uh, you can correct it, but only that. Yes, thanks, Ted. Uh, uh, just one, one other thing in, in the United States, even if the patent is granted and you've got and failed to make a priority claim, you can still reissue the patent to get that priority mm -hmm. claim. seems to be I, I think in comparison probably the, the most flexibility but that might in, in that might also be part of the reason why when we see US practitioners filing PCT applications they tend to maybe not take things as serious as some of the others and mistakes mm -hmm. are being made so I, I suppose the warning is also you might get away in the US but you might not get away uh, before some other jurisdictions where you enter the, the, the national phase. So, uh, but maybe uh, could we hear also from Japan, uh, Katsuhide, uh, what your perspective of this would be? Oh, uh, also in Japan, incorrect priority information, such as application number, but they can be fixed by final petition at the time of uh, national phase entry. Only in case JPO does not accept such a request for correction, JPO issues notice and send it to us. Examples are cases where correct priority document was not filed, or in cases where all three items regarding priority information, application number, age, and country, as for the first example, even if an applicant did not file the priority document during the international phase, he can file it to the JPO within two months from the 30 months entry deadline. Meanwhile, if the request is acceptable, there is no note uh, about uh, filing deadline of petition. There is no specific deadline for filing of petition. But we recommend early filing to facilitate 
formal examination smoothly. We usually make the correction when national face entry based on client instruction. And another type, uh, if PCT application has no prior claim and no action was made during the international phase, unfortunately, the PO does not accept new addition priority claim in Japan, in Japanese national phase. Uh, as said before, uh, applicants must add the priority claim within 60 months uh, from priority date for the sitting office for International Bureau of WTO according to PCT regulation. And may I continue to talk about the information of priority right. So, okay, Matthias. Yes, uh, that's that's very interesting. So also it seems in Japan that if, if there's a problem uh, in terms of the information on the priority claim, you can still correct that, but the addition would be uh, would be not possible. That seems to be actually very similar then to uh, to China and, and Europe as well. And yes, restoration of the priority right, uh, I think you wanted to get into that. That would also be interesting because Japan does now accept restoration of the priority right. They originally did not, but now they do. And I and I heard something that they're also maybe considering changing the standard that uh, they would like to apply. Is that is that correct? Yes. Uh, last year, uh, the this year, uh, the standard uh, changed. Uh, so called uh, Invited due care to from inspired due care to uh, so called danger. The situation will be relaxed. But uh, effective date uh, is in 2003, maybe, uh, not immediately, but uh, situation will be relaxed. And it's good news for you, PCT user, I think. Sounds really, really good. And is it similar to how unintentionally is applied then in other countries? Now, I know in the US, it's usually a simple declaration. Uh, sorry, I missed the time limit and, and, and a fee. Uh, is there is there any need? I know the UK has a stricter approach to unintentional, I believe. But is there any, any how, how is unintentional then actually applied by the JPO? Would you know? Excuse me. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe maybe you didn't hear my my question properly. So you just explained that the JPO is is moving from the due care standard to the unintentional standard. Uh, is it is it known what kind of uh, what kind of showing you have to make in order to get unintentional? Is it a simple statement saying? it was accidentally overlooked or is there any 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 additional burden uh, uh, i'm sorry the, the new standard are intentional about the unintentional uh, jpo has not uh, uh, announced not yet announced uh, okay the details yeah. okay yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So that's something uh, to keep an eye out for, uh, but it does seem as if it's going to be easier, hopefully, for applicants if they are in such a situation. Of course, it's a situation I don't recommend anyone because, as we learned from China, it's not going to work in in the Chinese national phase. So it's it's really not a good idea to miss the priority period, if at all possible. Um, I would maybe now like to turn to 
a second aspect also still concerning the right uh, to priority, but a little more on the substantive side of things. Um, and the kind of scenario I have in mind, and I would like to explore a little how, how the various jurisdictions would deal with this in the national phase is the following. So there is an applicant, uh, an application A filed uh, in the name, let's say of company X, and uh, the PCT is then filed in the name of company Y. And I mean, usually what would be expected is that there's some kind of a transfer of rights in form of an assignment between X and Y, and then Y can happily file the PCT and everything would be fine, of course. Now, what if that assignment is not in place at the time of filing of the PCT? Is this... Sorry, I need to wait, wait out some noise in the background here. Uh, is, is this potentially a, a, an issue in the national phase in your various jurisdictions? Uh, so can the assignment happen after the time of filing? Uh, and, and, you know, this could also, of course, come up uh, in, in other kind of constellations, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with that question. So, uh, who would like to, to go first? Uh, Detlef, you're smiling here. So, you're ready for, for jumping on this? I, I was. Of course, I think we just hear the most important person in his life. Um, <laughs> a baby. But, but, uh, but yes, uh, of course, I, I may. Um, uh, with the European Patent Office, you do have to file priority right, um, which has been executed prior to the PCT application. It must have happened first, otherwise you lose the priority. Um, in, in Germany, um, basically you, you would be allowed just in an oral agreement to assign um, the priority right. So, uh, so there is a workaround. If you if you file a document which was signed later, but saying oh we, we in, in a meeting in a meeting or in a telephone call there and then, which is earlier to the um, um, international filing, you could say we have agreed that. And <laughs> so, okay, yeah, that's a nice workaround. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how, how does that look in other jurisdictions? Uh, Japan, Katsuhide, would that be a problem if such an application enters the national phase? Uh, in Japan, it is essential applicant has a right to file a patent application for a filing date, PCT filing date. Uh, at least uh, the consensus about transfer of a right between both parties must be formed for a filing date, even if the date of getting agreement is after filing date. If not, uh, in Japan, it reason for rejection or invalidation is a big problem. Uh, only a true owner or true joint owner can demand uh, invalidation prior to a JPO. Some party cannot. Also, uh, to correct this appropriate True owner can demand transfer right before call instead of filing the invalidation prior. In the same way, a true joint owner can demand transfer and share of right. That concludes my talk. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, so that. Uh, seems also a little bit similar to the situation in, in, in with the EPO. 
Uh, how, how does it look uh, in China, uh, Nancy? Uh, thank you, Matthias. Um, in general, the Chinese Patent Office uh, would not pay a strict attention on the, the timing of the period. So that is to say the retroactive um, assignment agreement would also be acceptable. And in many mm -hmm. cases, um, during Chinese national phase entry, um, the applicant would supplement such assignment agreement um, as a support evidence to the patent office, and they are um, usually accepted. And there could be a problem uh, if um, the um, assignor is a single person, a Chinese individual, while the assignee is a uh, foreign company. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if this is a proper timing to mention this at the cur current timing or maybe later, because it concerns with the Chinese technology import and export law. Ah, okay. Should I go well, ahead right now? Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, that sounds mm -hmm. very interesting here. So, uh, and it's good to hear actually that, that uh, you know, the assignment, the execution of the assignment is not so much of a problem. But uh, we're curious to hear about, you know, your scenario, which could be more problematic then. Yeah, so uh, if in the PCT application, uh, you have assigned a individual, a Chinese citizen as the applicant. And later on, the Chinese applicant assigns the right to a, uh, for instance, a U.S. company. And in, in China, it would be considered as a technology export from a Chinese citizen to a foreign entity. And this would require a technology export certificate. And this is really hard to provide. Usually, uh, the invention would be considered as a employee's invention or service invention, which uh, inherently belongs to that company. But however, if in the PCT filing, um, timing, you filed the Chinese individual as the applicant designating yeah. all states, it would create um, subsequent problem in the Chinese national phase. Oh, so that's just to watch out. Right. And, and so what would you recommend applicants to do? I mean, start out from the start with the company as the applicant on the PCT? Uh, mm -hmm. is, is that the best way to handle this? So at the time of the filing PCT application, I know in the U.S. in particular, many times uh, the inventor um, has not got enough time to sign an assignment. So they would have the, the individual, for, for example, a Chinese citizen as a PCT applicant. But it's mm -hmm. better to designate the individual um, for states, um, only the United States. And the Chinese individual wouldn't be designated as an applicant for other countries than okay. the U.S. Okay. Then it would be okay. Then it would also avoid the problem. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's very interesting. Okay. This detail is often um, overlooked in practice and creates some, yeah. some troubles. And, and, and creates some difficulties. Okay. Uh, Yin Peng, do you, did you want to add anything in this regard? I mean, on, on also the, the right to maybe to claim poverty and... and if there's a transfer where when it takes place or anything else yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yes uh, there is another thing we need to keep in mind uh, and just as Nancy said uh, um, as long as the patent rights have been properly assigned it doesn't matter when the assignment occurs before season ipa it doesn't matter when the assignment occurs. And another question is just as Nancy said, if uh, the, the, earlier, the applicant of the earlier application is uh, company X, and if and the subsequent uh, uh, the applicant of the subsequent uh, application is company Y, mm -hmm. we only need uh, assignment from X to Y. But there are some other scenarios. Uh, if the earlier the, the applicant of the earlier application is a Chinese individual, for example, maybe uh, the earlier application was filed in the name of a Chinese inventor. Mm -hmm. Here, there are two scenarios we need to discuss. Mm -hmm. The first scenario is that the earlier application was filed in China. That is the the, the same IPA is the receiving uh, it, 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 uh, it, um, the, it's filed initially uh, 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 filed in China and was filed in the name of a Chinese inventor. Mm -hmm. 
And in this circumstance, we require two types of certificates. First is the assignment that is from the Chinese inventor. And then no matter how many uh, such um, uh, uh, applicants, maybe they are all individual uh, applicants from all these uh, applicants to the company. Mm -hmm. The first, the first type of document, and the second type of document is the license or the permit of techno technology export mm -hmm. from the administrative authority of the state council. Okay. We should keep in mind that if the earlier application was filed in China and the application was filed uh, in the name of a Chinese inventor, that is a Chinese uh, applicant. We need two types of uh, documents, certifying documents. One is the assignment, and the second is the permit for technology export. Okay. And, and then, another, but, but the dating of these documents is less crucial. So they could potentially be dated after the filing of the PCT, or, or does it have to happen before you file PCT? And it doesn't matter when. when okay. uh, that, that is, yeah. yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter. I think that's what also Nancy said. Yeah, that it wouldn't, the timing wouldn't be so crucial. Uh, so that's quite different from Europe. Uh, so I guess Europe is is appears to be restricted here. Uh, but but maybe uh, John, if you want to give us the U.S. perspective, and I have a suspicion that it might be again the most lenient. Uh, sorry, but, 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 oh, sorry, I, I sorry. Need to have in the United States is the law on this is not really caught up. With the change from first to invent to add the consequent requirement that the application had to be filed in the name of inventor um, to what has happened with the america invents act so the actual statute says that you're entitled to claim priority by any uh, where the earlier application was filed by any person who has or whose legal representatives or assigns have previously regularly filed an application for the patent in the other country, um, taking account of the fact that prior to uh, the change of law here 10 years ago, uh, most foreign applications were filed in the name of an, an assignee, whereas US applications were filed in the name typically of the inventor, I had to file the name of the inventor. And then the manner of patent examining procedure uh, in indicating what that means says, Consistent with long-standing office policy, this requirement is interpreted to mean that US and foreign applications must name the same inventor or have at least one joint inventor in common as the requirement to be able to claim priority. So we're still focusing on the inventorship rather yeah. than the dates of assignments or anything else. Um, if you've got two different inventors, then you've got a bit of a problem. Okay, okay. But it's less the, the act of the assignment, really, and the dating of that, but, but oh, more that, the naming of the inventor. Yeah, that's right. It's naming the inventor. Get yeah. the inventor right, you're okay. Okay, okay. And and I'm very sorry, uh, Yun Peng, you, you wanted to still finish off with something, and I, and I, and I, I moved too quickly to John. Uh, so do you want to still add something to what you said before, Yun Peng? Hello? Yeah. Yes. Um, Yes, I, I just yes, I'm so, uh, I just talk about the, the, the I want to add one thing uh, because only uh, the scenario one and another scenario is that um, if if the earlier application was filed in other countries, not in mm -hmm. China, yeah, even if the earlier application uh, earlier application was filed in the name of a Chinese applicant, uh, for example, the the Chinese inventor. In mm -hmm. this circumstance, uh, we only need the assignment of the the the, 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 the uh, assignment of the priority, and uh, it does not need the, the permit or the license for the technology export. We need to keep in mind that if the earlier application was filed in China, we yeah. need two two types of documents. One is the assignment, and the second is the license or permit from uh, for, uh, permit of the mm -hmm. technology export if the earlier application was filed uh, uh, the in other countries not in china 
Mm -hmm. Even if uh, the application, the earlier application was filed in the name of a Chinese applicant, individual applicant, uh, the, 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 in the name of Chinese inventor, it doesn't matter. It does not need the technology export permit. It only re uh, needs the assignment itself if the applicant is different from the subsequent application. The assignment mm -hmm. is only required. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot for this additional <laughs> clarification and to to kind of compare the two two scenarios here. Um, yeah. uh, could, could, I, could I just add uh, something sure. to what I said? Um, when I said we're focusing on the inventor, um, I didn't emphasize the wordings in the MPEP. Uh, basically, say it is long-standing office policy to focus on the inventor. Uh, that long-standing office policy obviously was based on the old law. This uh, office policy has not yet been questioned in the courts. Okay. Uh, I would caution that there is a possibility that sometime somebody mm -hmm. will. And so you've got to comply with the actual wording of the statute. Okay. Okay. Yes, that's a, that's an important disclaimer here. Yes. Good. I, I, I guess I do get the impression that um there are certain things which you know aren't maybe handled as critically in in some national phases but for others the standard is relatively tough and and probably the best practice for everyone would be to to make sure that if you file your pct in the name of someone different from your earlier application it's probably best to have an assignment uh done and executed before you file pct just to be on the safe side with everyone and and maybe just you know, because it came up uh, with the Board of Appeal in, 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 um, in a decision in 2020, the CRISPR case, uh, I, it was even to the point where you, if, you, if you had initially four applicants or four inventors on your application, on, uh, of your earlier application, and then you, you enter the European uh, regional phase with only three of them, and the fourth one didn't properly assign to the other three, uh, that still was considered a cause to in, to basically not accept that priority claim. Yeah. So uh, it shows it's not just about you know uh, change of, of applicants from from X to Y, but also if one drops off and does not properly assign, that could could still uh, be a cause of, of concern at least in Europe, and it, but it might not be in in other jurisdictions. Yeah, and unless you that the fourth invest. So, um, named erroneously when, when you can prove that he or she actually was not an inventor and only by mistake okay. was added on the naming yeah then it's uh, also just, awesome. just putting my uk hat on for a second um yeah. the edward Light sciences case in the uk a few years back was very yeah. similar to the crispr case in yeah. the mm. Yeah, yeah. Also taking a strict approach on this on, on this question. Okay, great. Uh, I think let's leave the subject of party claiming and let's move to national phase uh, entry. It's it's of course great to have so many uh, representatives of various jurisdictions here. So uh, I would just like to open up the microphone uh, to all of you on you know maybe something you would say about best practices when you come. Uh, from a PCT application entering the national phase in uh, China, Japan, uh, Europe, Germany, US, what what maybe to pay a particular attention to, and 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 what recommendations you 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 might have. So it's it's a pretty broad and open question, and I don't know who wants to go first. Um, uh, you, actually, I not started with Jung Peng before. So Jung Peng, do you want to start first? You're muted at the moment. Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, here, I just, just want to talk about uh, uh, the uh, best practice uh, and how to enter into China national phase. Uh, when talking about entry into China national phase, we should keep in mind that there are three aspects uh, for that, uh, the first time limit, the second, the, the necessary uh, documents, and uh, 
the third one, the feeds. Uh, we all know that uh, the time limit for entering a chi uh, into China national phase is 30 months from the filing date. Uh, if the application claims the priority, then the time limit calculated from the priority date. Mm -hmm. um, the 30 months uh, time limit could be extended uh, for another two months if the applicant pay extra fees for that. Uh, we need to keep in mind that 32 months is the deadline and it cannot be extended again. 32 months is the deadline. And if you enter into uh, make a request for entry into China national phase within 30 months, you don't need to pay extra fee for the for the pro, uh, for the extended uh, for the surcharge for it. But if you want to uh, extend another two months, you need to pay extra fees. Uh, when when talking about this, a very important scenario I want to talk about here is that I just mentioned. Um, this, uh, the CNIPA do not accept the priority claim between two, uh, 12 months to 14 months. But, but if you claim the, uh, the priority, which is between 12 to 14 months, and the time limit for entering into China national phase is still calculated from the initial priority date but not from the filing date of the PCT application. That is, all, although CNIPA do not accept the priority, which is beyond the 12 months, but the time limit for entry into China national phase is still calculated from the priority date. So, it's very important because some uh, there are some cases that for the application cannot enter into China national phase for that. They just uh, because China the CNIP do not accept uh, this priority. Then we, we calculated the the, uh, the time limit from the filing date is okay. No, it's uh, if the uh, the application the priority has been restored in the international phase, then the, all the time limit for entry into uh, China national phase is calculated from the priority date. I need to, <laughs> to just... Uh, yeah. That's a very good point. And, and we also had cases where applicants fell into this trap, if you so want. They, they thought their priority claim was outside of 12 and not within, but within 14 months. And they didn't request restoration of the priority right. And they thought they wouldn't have a chance to restore it anyway. And they didn't realize that that priority claim still stays on file because of the operations of the PCT rules and, and serves as a basis to calculate the priority uh, date and hence the time limit to international phase, and they were also late entering the national phase. So, yes, uh, um, a very, very good point uh, exactly. to mention that, uh, especially in a country that doesn't restore. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And another uh, scenario is that um, uh, also uh, relevant to the time limit for entry into China national phase. Um, if uh, uh, PCT applications claim as a priority in the international phase. And uh, at the same time, when the applicant requests for entry into China national phase, the applicant withdraw the priority. There is a priority in the, when, when I file a PCT application. And uh, um, during the whole international phase, uh, the priority is, uh, is good and that it doesn't happen anything. But when the applicant wants to entry into China national phase, the applicant don't want this priority anymore. That is the applicant withdraw the priority at the same time enter into China national phase. In this circumstance, the time limit for entry into China national phase is still calculated from the priority date. So we should keep in mind that these are two very important scenarios. I can, <laughs> I can. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, um, that, that's all for that's all for the, the time limit. And the second aspect is the documents. The necessary documents for entry into China national phase, normally the description and the claims shall be required at the same time of filing. And this part uh, is relatively simple, and I would uh, combine this part with uh, um, the amendments later. Um, and the third part uh, concerning the fees, uh, we should keep in mind that uh, if the applicant chooses the IPA uh, as a receiving office, and that is to submit the PCT application before seeing an IPA and the pay relevant fees, then when the PCT application enter into China national phase, the filing fee and the additional fees, for example, the pages, uh, more than 30, 30 pages, the additional uh, these additional fees are not required to pay anymore. And if the applicant designate designates IPA as an international search or searching authority, the substantive examination fee in China national fees is not required to pay anymore. So I just mentioned that. Uh, and the, 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 the second aspect I, I want to share with you here is about amendments. Um, uh, especially amendments uh, on the applicant's own initiative. When entering into China national phase, if the applicant finds that there are some defects in the application based on the relevant report, for example, the ISA, or just find the defects by themselves, then how to make amendments uh, on their own initiative? There are four uh, ways to make amendments. Um, three ways are, uh, or, uh, are originated from the PCT rules. That is the uh, article from Article 19. Uh, according to Article 19, only the claims could be amended based on the uh, ISA. And um, Article 34, uh, the, the description um, claims and uh, the drawings could be uh, amended, but the applicant is required to, re uh, to request for the international preliminary report. And uh, according to Article 28 and 41, uh, the applicant is not required to do anything in the, the international phase if they choose uh, this article, they can just make an amendment uh, on their own initiative. If the, but all these uh, three um, types of uh, amendment uh, needs the applicant to make a declaration at the same time when they request for entry into China national phase. If they fail to do so, uh, no. And uh, just uh, I, I mentioned, if the applicant failed to submit uh, the uh, submit uh, the amendment or failed to make the, such a declaration. And uh, if they want to make amendments uh, uh, initially or on their own initiative, how to do that? There is another opportunity for the applicant to do so. It is originated from the Chinese uh, patent law. It is not uh, originated from the PCT rules. It is originated from China uh, patent law. Uh, that is according to the Article 51, the implementing rules of the China patent law. Mm. Uh, when, re when request for the substantive examination, at the same time, you can submit uh, the amendments uh, for um, on their own initiative. You can make such uh, amendments or within three months from the data of the receipt of the notification uh, entering into substantive examination procedure. The, there is another uh, opportunity. These are four opportunities for the applicants to make amendments initially. So that's all for, for, for yeah. uh, thank you. Okay, yes, no, that's, uh, that was a very nice and detailed explanation. Uh, and Nancy, since we're on the subject of China national phase entry, did you want to maybe add anything uh, to, to what Yung Peng has said? Um, I think that's a, a very thorough explanation already. I just want to add one point, um, not specifically for Chinese national phase, but um, regarding PCD filing um, mm -hmm. concerning um, Chinese inventors and also uh, foreign inventors. In particular, um, a cross-border innovation concerning um, U.S. inventors and Chinese inventors. 
So as everybody knows, there is um, foreign fighting license requirement or confidentiality examination requirement in each jurisdiction almost. And they are sometimes conflicting each other. Um, so what if uh, you have an invention and it is made both by um, both in China and also in the US? So one, um, one tactic we are using is that uh, you can get the foreign filing license in the US much quicker than you can in China. In the US, maybe you can get mm. it approved in three days. And then you can get it um, approved in the US first. And you can file a PCT application in the English language before the Chinese receiving office. Yeah. Um, that is considered um, as directly filing the Chinese foreign filing license um, approval. Uh, and one practical issue here is that um, uh -huh. the applicant might be a U.S. company. Now, how can you qualify yourself to file a uh, Chinese PCT application before CNIPA? And uh, one point is that because you have a Chinese citizen as inventor, you can designate designate the Chinese inventor as an applicant for the PCT. Uh, but when you are designating the states for that Chinese inventor, you can designate a state um, like uh, Mongolia or Zaychels or other places which you would not finally enter. And this would qualify you to file a PCT application before the Chinese patent office and um, get you through both the U.S. foreign filing license requirement and the Chinese patent office uh, foreign filing requirement. Um, this is uh, really among the FAQ. <laughs> We've often been asked on how to um, solve the conflicting foreign filing um, nice. license requirement in different countries mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. global uh, collaborated innovations are quite common these days. And these are really practical issues we need to know and keep in mind. Excellent. Yes. No, that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Very um, yeah. Uh, Kasuhide, do you want to maybe share something on, on Japan? Uh, best practices, national phase entry in Japan. Okay. Uh, no, may, may I? Uh, I don't need to back to uh, last two topics. Uh, okay. I guess. Uh, I would like to explain the Japanese practice uh, about the last topic. Uh, in Japan, the implementing regulation of patent law straight JPO may require an applicant to submit a proof of right in Japan. However, uh, our firm have never received the order the notice. In this respect, uh, Q&A Q about priority claim published on JPO website shows applicant as a uh, if a priority document is filed, JPO regards an applicant as a proper assignment and does not require him to submit any document, even if the applicant Japanese application national event, based in the application is different from an applicant to priority application. Uh, I submit this uh, uh, to the last topic. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the uh, current topic, what current topic? Uh, why is a uh, piece, national piece entry? In Japan, Filing fee is flat fee, regardless of the number of claims. The number of claims affect the examination fee. So, uh, and JPO accepts the much dependent claim. So, applicant can uh, decrease the number of claims by using much dependent claims. So, one suggestion. Uh, next suggestion uh, is we consider the pedited examination after national phase entry. Uh, Japan has an ordinary system in addition to PBH. Before station 10, 
Cordoba Ampeli. Pasto un mes, under the ordinary system, uh, Pasto of his action is detected within three or five months. In case of PPH, average in our office in about two months, very quickly. Then, if the uh, applicant think the PCT application is important in the uh, we consider the uh, examination after national entry to Japan. Thank you. Hey, yes, thank you very much, uh, Kazvidi. So, uh, US or Europe first? I, I don't know, John, maybe you want to. Yeah, I'll leave this. I can probably occupy the rest of the time that we have available. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. You got to make sure you split it between the two of you here. Okay, because uh, the, the the U.S. is complicated <laughs> in that we have four different ways that you can come out of PCT into the United States. You can come out of the PCT application with an ordinary national phase entry, so-called three seventy one national phase entry. Um, and at the time when you come into the United States, uh, you can amend your claims uh, with a preliminary amendment done on the day that you uh, enter the United States, um, which is important because of the way in which the claims fees are structured in the United States in the claims fees here. If you have a multiply dependent claim, uh, we will calculate the claims fees based on the number of dependencies that you have, not just the number of claims that you have. Um, if you have any claim which is multiply dependent, you have to pay a reasonably large surcharge. And of course, you can't have any claims at all, which are dependent on an earlier claim which has multiple dependencies. If any of the claims on which that is dependent also has multiple dependencies. So you want to look at your claims at the point when you come into the United States to um, try to adjust um, the costs in the light of that. Also, of course, there is a requirement that you cannot have more than three independent claims without paying extra and 20 um, claims or claim dependencies um, is the limit before you have to pay extra on the ordinary claims, if I can put it that way. Um, if you do that, then that's fine. You have uh, with your national phase entry to make sure that uh, at some point you file the appropriate inventor's declarations, um, whereby the inventors confirm that they are in fact the true inventors of the subject matter being claimed. Now PCT of course has a mechanism whereby you can file uh, those declarations in the international phase. And I'd like to encourage people to do that where they can, uh, because one of the big problems that you can run into in the United States is that you find that the inventors have gone missing between the time the PCT application was filed and the time you come to file in the United States, which typically is 18 months apart. And so getting the inventors to sign the declarations in the international phase is, is a good move. If you cannot find the inventors to get them to um, sign in the uh, at the time of coming into the United States, then you can file a substitute statement made by somebody who knows the facts to assert that um, that person is the representative of the assignee of the inventors or the legal representative of the inventors. If the inventors have died, the inventors um, cannot be found, the inventors refuse to sign. If you do rely on that substitute statement, then you need to be a little bit careful about the address that you give for the inventor. And normally, when you give an address to the US Patent Office as to the address of the inventor, you will give the, the, the corporate address. I mean, a lot of people do it's sort of standard practice. But if you're using a substitute statement, you've got to give the last known address where the inventor lives so that the US Patent Office can contact that inventor to check that the statements that you're making in the substitute statement are in fact correct. So that's the ordinary 
371 national phase entry. Um, and most of what I just said will apply to the others as well. The second way in which you can come into the United States is by a so-called bypass continuation application. Because, as I said earlier, the PCT application is deemed to be a US application, which can be, if it goes abandoned, can be revived under the normal rules for revival of a, of a US application. But you can also file a continuation of that PCT application. If you do that, then um, you can come in without having to pay the fees on the day when you enter the national phase, which you would have to do on an ordinary 371 national phase entry. And you can delay some of the other um, stuff which you needed. Now, the real reason why people tend to choose to use a bypass continuation rather than a 371 national phase entry. To the question of restriction requirements. If you come in as a 371 application um, of the PCT, then the PCT rules on unity of invention apply. So if you've got a common general inventive concept uh, by a special technical feature, then you can get it all in one application. If you come in as a continuation application, then the US rules on restriction apply. And those look to the question of whether the examiner will have to do too much work to search the application. I'm putting it rather crudely and rather simply, but that's really what it comes down to. Uh, how many different classification uh, classes do you have to look through? Now, as a practical matter, the PCT rules tend to favor chemical inventions and the US rules tend to favor mechanical inventions because you can, the US examiners are used to looking at multiple independent claims um, in mechanical inventions and they're not necessarily going to raise a restriction requirement. Whereas if you were under the PCT rules, lacking a common general inventive concept linking all the claims, they would. Other reasons why you might want to come in as a continuation are if you really want to make big amendments to the claims in response to what you've seen in the international search report. Um, and you want to rewrite the claims in their entirety rather than having to try and work out what actual changes you're making and show them in underlining and strike out and all the rest of it. Also, if you feel that your English translation, which you had in the PCT, might not have been the best translation of what you had in your original language, then you might want to come in to the United States as a continuation application, as long as you haven't added new matter, to make it clear exactly what your invention was. So all of those reasons uh, are reasons why people do, from time to time, use the so-called bypass continuation. The third way in which you might want to come in is by a bypass divisional. If you've had an international search report which has said you've got more than one invention, you had one of those inventions searched in the international phase, um, and at the end of that you decide that we're not going to get anywhere with this, but we had that other um, we've seen nothing come up anywhere else that was in those other claims which were not searched, then because your election of particular claims to be searched in the international phase would count as um, an election for US practices because PCT application was designated as is, is effectively a US application, then you would come into the United States as a divisional application uh, with the claims that you now want to have searched relating to a different invention. Um, and similar reasons for a continuation application might also apply there. And the final way in which you might want to come in is a bypass continuation in part application. If you've got stuff you want to add to the PCT application when coming into the United States, uh, which you can do. Uh, you would make it a continuation in part, you would add in your additional information and 
uh, you need make sure to make sure that your inventorship is still correctly named and so on. Um, but if you do that, then you can add stuff. And because your PCT application will have been published at 18 months on the priority date, and you're coming into the United States at 30 months from the priority date, you're still within one year of the PCT being published. And the PCT information was obviously derived from uh, the US applicant. And so the US grace period applies so that the PCT application could not be cited, a PCT publication rather, could not be cited against the US continuation in part when you come into the United States. So as I say, it is more complicated than other countries, but it does give you a lot of flexibility if you stop to think about it. It's obviously the nice part that you have the flexibility and, and, and could utilize different strategies uh, depending on your situation. Yes, very interesting. Okay, um, Detlef, you still have a little bit of time. Uh, what's the perspective uh, EPO and maybe also the German office? I mean, I guess you mentioned already the extension of the time limit from 30 to 31 months for the German office, which of course is great news for those applicants who might only wish to enter directly before the German office and, and, and not uh, go to the EPO at all. Uh, that's of course very interesting, but what else? Yeah, what else? Um, first of all, um, I, I like to mention that um, I think everybody in patent office, it's extremely strict with uh, formalities like edit subject matter um, uh, and clarity. So I agree uh, to put a lot of work into your PCT application or at best and your priority application because the same rules uh, for, for edit subject matter and amendments also apply uh, for claiming valid claim of the priority. So put a lot of work uh, in, into your priority application and the PCT application. Uh, you cannot uh, fix that uh, in the later on. So, but upon entering the uh, national phase or the regional phase before the EPO or, or Germany, um, first of all, um, both countries have claim fee. Germany has, has a application fee, which is calculated from, from the claims and the number of claims. Uh, make sure that you uh, pay uh, calculated um, application fee because uh, you do not only use the claim or you need to calculate the application fee. Since it's one single application fee, you have not paid the full application fee. So your entire application is deemed to be withdrawn. Here you have uh, have an extra claim fee, so there you use the claims you have not paid for. Um, the EPO are tremendously expensive. If I, uh, lately I had an application with like 500 claims and it was like like uh, 100 something thousand uh, claim fees only. So, but the good news in, in the EPO is. Uh, the claims upon entering the regional phase or uh, even upon an invitation under Rule 170-61-62 EPC uh, triggering uh, uh, six months time limit vacation uh, before the search is, com uh, is done by the EPO. So there you can really amend your application in, in, to, in order to save uh, claim fees. Um, you cannot save these claim fees in Germany since it's always PCT claims as files like it is in China or in, in India. Uh, the German fees are not that high. Um, another thing is um, also uh, like like uh, John mentioned, for the United States, if the international search uh, report has only been drawn up for a part of, of the uh, lack of unity um, objection, uh, only that can be prosecuted in the, in the EPO. But again, you can uh, file a divisional application to get the other uh, invention covered. 
Actually, another nice thing, um, if your inventor um, is interested in some protection in Germany, it's not really requiring uh, the full 20 years uh, um, provided by patent protection and would say, well, I'm, I'm, I would be interested in a utility model. This is also possible. You can enter the national phase as a utility model, or you can even branch off a German utility model from the PCT application. And since the, the due date for branching off a, a German utility model is the end of um, its two months after the end of the months where the PCT application um, uh, done since us after the, the 31 months term or still 30 months term, uh, you have another two months uh, to branch off the German utility model. Yeah, that's, I think that, yeah, uh, with regard from all my introduction, um, at your PCT application or at best the uh, priority application. Um, we do have an, a handout on, on the um, John Marshall Law School um, uh, web page uh, for this event uh, where I provided some ideas and, and some guidance uh, what you have to observe in drafting your PCT application. I, I'd just like to refer to that. Sufficient time. Uh, Detlef, yeah. uh, on branching off, did I see something recently saying that the EU IPO will allow you to branch off a, design, a European design application from a PCT application? Maybe. Yeah. Um, um, if, I, 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 I saw it, I, 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 I never got to it. So, sorry, I, I missed. I, I see that Christian still is, is online. Christian, probably uh, you know about it and can, can put that in, in, in the chat. The, Christian Thomas, he is more an expert in, in design law than I am. Yeah, okay. Right. Okay, yeah, good. No, and I, and I like, of course, also uh, to hear these recommendations about being careful about drafting. A, a solid PCT and actually starting out drafting a, a solid priority application. I suppose that's uh, something I would like to also emphasize, especially vis-a-vis -vis a US audience, uh, to be to be careful to really have a, a as complete as possible priority application uh, in order not to jeopardize later on your right to claim priority in, in, in the national phase, at least before certain certain offices. Uh, talking about maybe also some other things I would recommend to US audience up front, uh, be careful about uh, the drawings. Um, we do sometimes see US applicants coming into the PCT with uh, informal drawings, uh, and that might be because of, of US practice uh, maybe not being so strict on that up, up front. Uh, but the problem with, with informal drawings is that you will very likely get an invitation to submit formal drawings, which comply with the PCT standard. But sometimes it's not so easy to actually come in with something that's not adding additional uh, subject matter that's not maybe you know showing more than your informal drawings. And this can cause uh, problems up front uh, with uh, the RUS accepting your drawings, but also downstream when you're then entering the national phase with drawings which are maybe not up to the PCT standard, you could face problems before the various jurisdictions that they might raise objections to, to drawings. And it might not always be so easy to come in with uh, proper drawings at a later stage again because of, of the disclosure issue that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. So um, I'm actually... Uh, also... Matthias, Matthias, we do yeah. have a question in the q &A. Oh, okay. Super, okay, be... yes, and I'm reading it. You're reading out? Okay. Yeah, go for it. Oh, oh. it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, maybe my connect... <laughs> whose connection is better? Go ahead, Detlef. Can an inventor license his/her invention to many different assignees in many different countries? 
such as one assignee for each country. If, as far as a license is concerned, I think that's always possible. Um, yeah. But it's also with with the you can you can designate different um, different applicants from different countries, as Nancy mentioned. The, the, the trick with the Chinese entity and then uh, designating him for Macau, or what? what no, not what did you say, Mongolia? Um, that that's also possible. So the question is yes. Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> Yeah, and and maybe just to add to this, I mean, we we do sometimes see PCT applications where different applicants are listed for different uh, designated states. I mean, you know, the classical old example was applicant vendor for the U.S. and the and the company for the rest of the world. We don't see that so much anymore. But there are some companies who divide up the word up front with you know sister companies in different parts of the world being designated only for those parts uh, of which they're supposed to be in charge. So this is this is all possibly uh, possible. So it's it's a question of setting it up uh, and, and um, making sure uh, from our perspective that at least you have an applicant for all those designations where you want to enter the national phase later on. Uh, that's obviously something to be careful about, not to, to miss out on a particular designated office in that respect. Okay, um, other than that, I don't really see another question. So uh, floor is open to all of you. Uh, any, any, anything you would like to still add from your side at this stage? Mr. Matthias, I want to yes. uh, add one point. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, be, uh, be, be, before um, send IPA, um, when the applicant choose uh, entering to China national phase, please um, um, double check whether the international application number is correctly indicated in the request for entry into China national phase. Because when you write an incorrect international application number, we would not we would correspond to your current application. The claims of descriptions with another international application. Mm -hmm. You know, both the preliminary examination and the flow management um, needs time. When we find this and notify you about this, the time limit for entry into China national visa may be missed. So, uh, so uh, another another um, uh, concern is that uh, when you make a payment you need also double check the application number because uh, <laughs> when it happens uh, um, you pay uh, the make payments to another international application it's really very complicated to to to, to solve this problem uh, uh, as far as i have known in most of such cases uh, um, almost most of these applications cannot enter into china national base Okay, oh, that's, that's actually very, yeah, 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 very good points. I mean, it, it sounds like little details, but they can potentially lead to a situation where you're late in entering the national phase and therefore even potentially lose your application. So uh, very important here to, to pay attention to these fine details. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, oh, yeah. I think, yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. May I supplement with some information? Is sure, it, absolutely. Yes, go ahead. I mean, we're a little over time, but uh, you know, if you keep it short, uh, I think it will be acceptable. <laughs> uh, I would like to provide the recent uh, information. The PCT applicant uh, can make a addition of a true inventor or removal of incorrect inventor by filing an amendment with the degradation after national phase entry to Japan. Okay. Uh, in this respect, because of the situation change, the JPO requirements have been changed and signatures by inventors no longer need. Today, written statement without signature is sufficient. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Very interesting as well. All right. I think this uh Unfortunately, it's already the end of our session here, and I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, 
all of you, uh, Kazuhide, uh, Yun Peng, Nancy, Detlef, and John here for your great contributions. It's been a lot of fun uh, doing this with you. Uh, I hope maybe one day we can do it in person. That would, of course, also be nice. And for the rest of the participants, I hope you'll enjoy the next uh, sessions. And I think now also the keynote address, but the floor uh, back over to Adam. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, well, we're very delighted to have you. Uh, Lisa, for those of you who don't know, uh, was the executive director of AIPLA. Uh, she was part of our advisory board even then, but she's just making waves now and is, is really a global celebrity. I've seen an uptick in your social media posts, Lisa. <laughs> uh, and that's a great way to communicate what WIPO is doing. In fact, uh, let, let's just start with something that you just posted today or today our time, uh, something very exciting. Uh, and you have a new appointment at WIPO. Uh, the uh, Director General, I'll uh, just read from the press release, uh, encourage everybody to have a look at it. Darren Tang said, Ms. Jorgensen's appointment as the first female Deputy Director General of Patents and Technology Sector has sent a powerful message about our focus on inclusivity and she has been a passionate advocate for women and closing the gender gap in IP. And, and you have been appointed to a new post in that regard. So tell us a little bit about that post and what some of your plans are. Sure, thanks, Daryl. So yes, uh, uh, after probably a number of conversations from the time uh, our Director General Darren Tang got here and even you know years before that, Obviously, one of the big issues that we have, and he's been talking since he got here with our member states, is, is how do we engage more women in, in the IP field? Uh, and it's not, it, it, it's, a, it's an IP and gender position, so it's called the champion of IP and gender, <clears throat> but it is looking external to WIPO to say, how do we get women engaged in the invention process, the, the creation process, the innovation process, and how do we make sure that they are well served within the IP system? So that's what we're gonna be working on. Uh, our, our member states, we just finished our general assembly a, a few hours ago, as a matter of fact, for the week, had a chance to talk with quite a few of, the, of our member states and, and we're all very excited to kind of put together now a stronger program for WIPO to, to work in this area. So I'll be um, hiring a, a senior advisor IP and gender. Uh, so I'm looking for somebody that's that's uh, an IP uh, person, but with a, a real passion for the gender issues. And does so this person have to be a woman? No, does not have to be a woman. Okay. Um, I, it's open for anybody who wants to apply for it. And the post is was opened this week. So it'll be, I think it closes probably in a few weeks. So whoever would be interested in in wanting to do this kind of work is welcome to apply. Excellent. And for those of you in the audience, you've heard it here first, uh, <laughs> right from the top. Okay. Uh, now, you also talked about WIPO's incredible living rooftops. And this one I, I'm uh -huh. going to share. We don't do slides with um, folks here just so that it's easier. Uh, to manage, but I'm going to chat it publicly. And you should have a look at this. And if you haven't connected with Lisa yet, this would be a good chance to do so. Uh, she posted about WIPO's uh, living roofs. And now how often do people at WIPO, staff at WIPO actually go up to those roofs? Oh, no, not very many because there's no guardrails on top of the roof to go off the side of the roof by accident. <laughs> I had found out about these living roofs, um, that we had one, and, and I almost jokingly made a request to be allowed to go see it. So they took me seriously and uh, actually sent a security guard to go with me with the photographer so I wouldn't get too close to the edge of the roof, um, but decided to turn this into something where we could explain to others what WIPO is doing in this area and just be able to show what what this this living roof looks like. So when we got up there, it's 
it was a little dry. It was towards the beginning of the summer, um, but it's covered with lots of flowers and plants, and and then the you know all the bugs that go with it. So the bees and the everything else that can keep it living. Um, and it was just a lot of fun, and it was a, a way of showing you know White Post commitment into ecology in this area. And, and one of the things that they're doing are these living roofs. It's not the only one that we have in WIPO on top of our buildings, but it's the biggest. And, and it was a lot of fun to be able to go up there and walk around. You know, thank God you did that because otherwise I don't know how many people outside of maybe the gardener would know that the roofs exist. I've been to WIPO and nobody said anything. I, Francis was showing us around. Um, Darren's predecessor never said anything. And right now you're there just for how long less than a year and you're yeah, already going was, all these different sites of white pool yeah i'd been here a few just a few months when i found out about it and asked to be able to go see it okay now the other big thing of course and the, the main thing i think uh today that you want to tell our audience is about white pool pct especially with respect to COVID. you are there at an unprecedented time so tell us a little bit about what COVID has done to impact PCT and we just just got off a PCT session. So this, this is a perfect segue. Sure. So WIPO has impacted everything. I mean, everything that we do, everybody that we work with, everybody that we talk to. Obviously, this is just you know one of those worldwide horrible pandemics that really affected everything. When we look at COVID and PCT, there's going to be a lot of different areas that we can talk about. So. If we look first at, at, for example, at just PCT filings, mm -hmm. um, the PCT filings themselves uh, actually went up in 2020 over 2019 by roughly about maybe not quite 4%. Um, I think we reached about 276,000 applications. Now, what we saw was in Q1, it stayed relatively steady in 2020. Q2 went up. Q no, sorry, Q2 went down, Q3 went up, Q4 went down. So it kind of bounced you know, all over the place. But in the end, it, it was an overall growth over the course of the whole year. Um, you know, what we found was that certain technologies were, were filing more PCT applications than others. We obviously saw more PCT applications in areas like biopharma, uh, medical devices, um, even in, in organic chemistry, and less in certain other areas like uh, software, electronics. So the question that we asked, and we're still asking because we don't have a full picture yet of all of 2020, um, but why was that? Was it really or uh, industries filing more in this area? We don't really think so, We because as you know, PCT applications are typically a second filing. Um, so those filings would have had to have been done probably prior to COVID, which means that what we're seeing was probably not as a result of the COVID technologies, but more in the commercialization area, if I could call it that, which would be um, filing more PCT applications from the original application that they filed. So it's the commercialization of the biotech, the pharma, uh, the medical devices, the chemical areas, more than the commercialization in some of the other areas. We also did a poll of very unscientific, but we did talk with 30 major users. So I think we covered um, the US, China, Japan. Um, if I look at my list, we also had Germany, Republic of Korea. And we went to them and said, you know, has COVID impacted your R&D? The answer was no. In terms of PCT, they also said it did not impact their PCT filings. So I think when we see the trend of more in one technology versus another, it was more of the commercialization of certain technologies over the others. But time will tell. We are still working on it and we haven't really been able to come to a final conclusion in that area. The other thing that was really impacted by COVID PCT was, was staff. Um, we had to instantly turn off staff coming to the office. They had to immediately start working from home. So were they prepared? I think hindsight says 
Probably not. Um, was WIPO able to prepare them to work from home? The answer again, hindsight says probably not. But we pivoted so quickly with staff that was very flexible that we, we just didn't lose a beat. We, we were able to keep up 100% of our productivity. So that would be in formality examination, translations, publications, uh, you know, user support, IT development, training, it's everything. Um, including the, the, the weekly publication of the 5,000 PCT applications. It, it just did not diminish. So kudos to the PCT staff. I wasn't here yet, but kudos to them for being able to flip a switch, go home, and, and just start working as if nothing had happened. Um, oh, just pause there for a minute. A couple sure. of follow-ups. Well, one is uh, what, two of your staff are actually here with us today, one of them is Matthias, who was chair of the previous session, but Minako, who I met at Max Planck many years ago, uh, who works for Matthias, apparently is also here. So she said, my boss is here, but so is my boss's boss. <laughs> yeah. Now, in, in terms of getting people now back in the office, it looks like you're back in the office. I, I've always been in the office, even though I, I theoretically was in quarantine when I first moved here at the beginning of the year, the Swiss government allowed me to come in. So I have been power. in the office every day since. Yeah. Uh, and how has it been? You're pretty much in the building by yourself then, aren't you? And until uh, about, well, until really this week, maybe last week because certain employee staff was coming in to prepare for the general assembly. So maybe the last two weeks, I oftentimes was the only person on my entire floor, or at least one half, the half that I work on, on the floor of the whole building that I'm in. Um, the, you know, the garage, the cars have been empty. There's nobody parking here. Um, you know, the cafeteria is virtually empty. Uh, so yes, it's been very lonely until about two weeks ago. I was going to say, Lisa, that the biggest thing you probably have to do now is allow to share the space. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but how has it been like getting people back into the office? Has, has WIPO decided how many days a week and how, how is that work from yeah. home versus office arrangements going to look like? Right. So we did first voluntary return to office for getting ready for the General Assembly this week. Uh, we had a lot of people who volunteered to come back and those who needed to be here to, to help uh, run that assembly uh, or the assemblies. Um, after this week, we will be starting what we call waves of return to office. So every, I'll make it up because I can't recall it, maybe every two weeks, we're going to be bringing in a group of people. But all summer long, we worked with them to say, who wants to come in and wave one, two, three, four. Um, and, and, you know, if you want to stay out to the end, we're just trying to make sure that we've got the right security details, the right food whatever it is that we need to support the numbers of people that will be returning by wave. And certainly we had planned on being able to bring everybody back by the end of the year. Uh, I think that is still the current plan because we, we are seeing the situation in Switzerland improve a little bit uh, day by day. It's still not good, but it is improving. Um, so some people are saying they'd rather not come back maybe in wave one and wait till wave four now. Uh, but we're working through all of those issues so that we can support the staff as they return to office. Okay. Sounds and, like and actually, you asked a different question too, which is how many days a week? WIPO is going to go to a very flexible type schedule um, and, and allow people to pick two out of the five days per week that they must be in the office, but they will still be able to work from home if they choose to the other three days a week. And that's a good arrangement. And, you know, WIPO being a leader in so many ways, I, I hope that will have a positive impact on law firms and others thinking about the similar arrangements. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the first point you raised about the impact of COVID on filings. Uh, you said that there was a lag in effect. And what you're seeing more is the commercialization of prior filings. Have you started to see, as a direct result of COVID, changes in different uh, sector filings and how that might be uh, 
uh, indicative of a trend going forward into the post-COVID world? Well, again, certainly the trend was that it was moving, that the PCT filings were, were growing in the, the areas like the, the bio, the pharma, uh, medical devices, et cetera, and, and not growing um, and maybe even contracting a little bit in some of the other areas. Uh, we're also seeing some growth in certain countries and, and contraction in some other countries. Uh, but overall, the PCT filing system is still very strong uh, across the board. Um, so right now, I don't think I could say that I'm seeing a trend post-COVID. Uh, I think we're going to have to wait and see how that, that plays out. And from WIPO's perspective, this, these shifts in sectorial filings, is that something they are concerned about or you just take it as data and, and uh, evolution well, of, of, of the industries? Yeah, certainly it's a, it's a concern, um, one that we have to watch very carefully, and, and we are, because we're not going to take for granted that even that even all of the filings, the filing numbers are going to stay high. We're going to assume that we have to do everything we can to ensure, you know, we are the most efficient we can be, we're the most cost effective, we stay competitive, um, and then we will be doing all of our outreach to all of the IP offices, to to the member states, um, to our stakeholders, and making sure that we we can, at least to the extent we can, understand what's happening in, in each country. Um, I mean, you wouldn't have anticipated necessarily that China would grow to the extent that they did. And they really grew in all areas. Um, but again, we're still seeing, and some countries really contracted, but overall, it's still an increase. And throughout 2021, we're still seeing that increase continue. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, the, the other thing that you mentioned, which was, I thought was also very interesting, was to use the word competitive. You have to keep your rates competitive. You would think from the outsider's point of view, looking at WIPO, WIPO is a monopoly. Nobody else can do PCT, for example. Who would you regard as your biggest competitors? Well, w competition is is not just PCT to keep PCT competitive. So what do I mean by that? Um, we're looking at WIPO as a whole to our in what services we are providing to our member states. So whether it is helping them build a national IP system, uh, helping them with their legislation on patents or uh, regulations, and all of that, in a way, combined with what we do at the PCT. So competition is making sure that our member states don't find a need to go somewhere else uh, and, and get all of the various pieces of what they need to be able to have a balanced IP system where their economy can grow. And, and instead, they can look to WIPO as a whole uh, to be as competitive as possible and offer them all of the services that they are going to need. You know, if they can only get one piece here or there from us, but they could get more than that from other organizations, then then why would they want to continue to come to WIPO? Well, maybe they still have a need to be here, but we want to be sure that we are offering all of it as a package in a very competitive manner. And that, that's great. Sometimes when you have bureaucracy, you forget that you have a customer base and I'm, I'm glad that that's front and center of your mission. Uh, just a note to the audience, we are taking questions throughout this conversation. So if you have questions for Lisa, uh, do put it up in the Q and A and I'll get to it as soon as I can. Uh, you also wanted to talk about uh, measures for the future. You touched a little bit about assistance to PCT users. I, I think that has some longer term benefits and implications as well. Uh, what else uh, do you, did you have in mind uh, in terms of your strategy for PCT when you talk about uh, longer term measures for future disruptions or future pandemics? God forbid that we have another one in our life, yeah. but just in case. Yeah, there, you know, there are a lot of things that, that we can and should be looking at. If we look at that things that have happened over, let's say, the last 12 months that would impact our current thinking, um, not, not just the future, but right now. Uh, one of the things that we did was um, take a look at 
sort of the, the what what did it mean to be an epidemic? What did it mean to be uh, the natural calamity, and how did it fit into the language of the PCT? So we back in um, well, just this week, the assembly adopted uh, a new uh, provision. It's 82 Qatar, which deals with extending PCT time limits. It was prompted by the COVID experience, um, and it will be applicable as of July 1, 2022. And there's going to be three parts to this, if I could sort of break it down. Um, the actual word epidemic will be added to the rule. Uh, as an example of a force majeure situation, which would trigger an excuse of the delay in, in meeting time limits. Uh, another addition will be the explicit legal basis in that rule, which will provide for the ability to waive the submission of evidence. Uh, and this was actually started under Director General uh, Francis Gurry back in April 2020. Uh, and then sort of the third part to this piece will be um, uh, with respect to the same rule, uh, which in which the PCT offices, the authorities, the International Bureau may extend PCT time limits. It won't be more than two months uh, initially, but potentially could be longer. Um, and this is when there will be an experience of a general, quote unquote, general disruption, but caused by a force majeure event, which will be listed in, in the rule itself. Um, you know, the, the question kind of is, how do we better prepare maybe for a crisis, the next crisis, if we're going to have one? Um, you know, when we, when everybody, all the staff had to go home instantly, the other thing that we had to do instantly was stop travel. So nobody could go out on missions to the member states uh, or to visit stakeholders and put on uh, various training programs, seminars, etc. And we had to transition completely as you know, Daryl, at John Marshall, we had to transition completely to webinars and video conferencing. Um, we really didn't have sufficient experience at, at all of the available tools to us. I'm not sure anybody would say that they, they felt like they were completely ready to, to transition wholeheartedly to just the webinars and video conferencing. Um, so now we have to hold everything, meetings, training, outreach, everything through the webinars. So hindsight says, you know, PCT could have, should have, would have had, you know, could have anticipated and prepared better for the effects of something like this. Um, and, and at least what we think what we're doing now is starting that conversation with our member states to say, how do we make sure that we are, are prepared for this? We have coordinated measures in place for the next time that something like this happens. So those conversations are ongoing right now. Um, again, hindsight says that we should have been prepared to have the staff fully equipped to walk out the door literally and in one hour be up and running in their own home. And, and of course, they weren't ready for that either. But again, they pivoted very, very quickly uh, from with their flexibility and, and just their their energy to get this moving to to be able to keep the PCT going at 100%. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things that that um, you know we're looking at doing. If um, you know, we had a lot of slight hiccups here and there, uh, but those are probably the the major things that we've been working on or that we were working on throughout this past year. And what's going to stay in terms of outreach, in terms of missions um, post-COVID? And what's going to revert back to the way it was? I don't think it will ever completely revert back to the way it was. I think virtual training is here to stay, uh, whether it's all virtual or hybrid, virtual and some in-person. Uh, hopefully, right now, we are not allowed to travel. It's essential travel only. Um, so we are, we are not having any missions going out to member states and hopefully in the next few months or so, we're all keeping our fingers crossed that that, that may start to change again. But assuming that virtual is here to stay, uh, last uh, March, I think it was, I created a task force to look at what we're calling high impact virtual training. So what does that mean? Um, we we want to have best practices of our virtual training. We want to have platforms and tools, add-on tools that best fit with WIPO. But the goal is to have 
the ability to provide the exact content tailored made to the audience um, and then be able to actually keep that audience engaged before the training, during the training, and, and even after the training. Hopefully then they'll want to also continue with other programs that, that we will be offering in virtual mode. Um, this task force finished the first phase of what they were asked to do, but they went across the entire WIPO house to say, you know, let's go talk to the media people, the visual audio people, let's talk to all of the other uh, seven sectors besides PC, P, the P, PCT or PTS, so trademarks, designs, uh, copyright, the regional and development sector, the, um, the in infrastructure sector, uh, and the um, IP and innovation ecosystems and global challenges, all of them. And people were really excited to give us their input uh, so that we could have a WIPO-wide high impact training concept. So the next stage is now to, to after we've looked at what the add-on tools and the platforms are, how do we then pick what will work for WIPO? That's this next phase to really keep the audience engaged. Um, and then we're gonna be creating a, a training manual for all of WIPO in-house so that we will all be working off of the same thing. So as we make an improvement in one area, it will go across the whole house. Uh, so that's, that's something that we feel is absolutely critical because we don't think that it's going to go back to the same normal that we used to have and that it's going to be a new normal with some virtual component there forever. That's an incredibly thoughtful plan. Now, I'm hearing some of this uh, executive director AIPLA uh, skill set that seems to be <laughs> seems to be very transferable in this case, but th there's also so much more to that. So that's great. Uh, now, one thing that WIPO has done recently, as well as to put out a global innovation index, and since we have a little, bit of extra time, I do want to talk about some of these other things as well. Um, is there a link between PCT and global, the global innovation index? And, you know, if you would, you could even tie in uh, thoughts on women participation because I think one, one of the things that you, you talked about in the press release was a relationship between PCT and women participation. So how do these different parts of WIPO's work uh, fit together? Yeah, thanks for that question, Daryl, because there is a direct connection between PCT and the Global Innovation Index. Uh, we did provide them a lot of information, but actually it's in reverse. We want to be able to gather as much in information as we can uh, and data uh, so that we can foresee the trends, see what's happening, and then be able to provide the services that we need to provide to our member states. So if I, if I try to tie that then to, to women, for example, women inventors, creators, uh, let's just say for the sake of the argument, it's the women inventors, we have to have accurate data in order to know how to go about finding out where the women are, what industries are, are they in, what's their education level, how do we reach them to, to explain the PCT process to them. And if we don't have good data, that's gonna be very difficult for us to do. So actually one of the things that one of the groups inside the PCT is working on, actually it's across the whole PCT, but one of them's taking the lead to put this together, is to be able to go back to the member states and say, you are providing us the reports that we need. How can we help you member state provide us with the data and the reports that we need to input that all of that into our database, which in turn goes right back to you. So you have better data to look at when you're trying to do um, research on your own. If we can do a better job of making sure that we have all the right data in a timely manner, then we will be able to report out things better like who are the women inventors? Where do they come from? What's their background? Education background, industry background, et cetera. And, and when we can get that done, then we'll, we will be so far ahead of where we're at right now that uh, we'll be able to do a lot more outreach to the women Thanks. and to any other group, but specifically yeah. we'll be working especially on the women inventors. Yeah, and I love that you put in this incentive for them to participate so they, they can get that data themselves and improve their own processes. Yes, uh, exactly. We, you have inspired a question from the audience. Uh, I'll read it out, but you can also see it in the Q&A. 
what is WIPO's motivation to develop patent scope as a free premier patent information database of global national coverage and sophisticated search tools for chemical compounds? Well, that's a, that's a, a strong question. So patent scope, patent scope is, is really there to help our member states and, and all stakeholders to be able to come in and search. Um, and again, we want patent scope to be fully up to speed. Um, how do we do that? Uh, you know, we're working on our piece in the PCT to be sure that we get all of the, the filing information um, and everything else that will go into patent scope. Um, I don't know if I can answer the question specifically with a technology, one of the technologies is that was, I, I'm not sure I can see the question, but was that the question about uh, in one particular technology area? Chemical compounds. Okay. Um, I, I would put chemical compounds actually in all the other categories as well in terms of making sure that we've got all the information that we can possibly get so that patent scope will be up to date. It is important to us to have patent scope there and, and fully up to speed with all of the data that's out there. Um, in terms of how our economics team, it's that patent scope is managed by our economist, our chief economist, um, a brilliant guy that's really working well and making sure that he stays on top of where the data needs to come from and we help go get it. Okay, thanks. I hope that answers your question, Alexandra. Uh, now, we've, we've talked a lot about PCT, but among the many hats you wear, PCT is just one of them. What else do you do at WIPO? <laughs> well, actually, I'm, the, I'm currently the, the Deputy Director General. I'm also the um, uh, Senior Director of the PCT Legal and International, and I'm also the, I mean, the Acting Direct Senior Director. I'm also the Acting Director of the Patent and Technology Law Department. But that's because we have a number of vacancies that were created when the new administration came in and uh, the, or, it was a reorganization where we lost several of our key senior people. So one of the things that I've been working on is making sure that we, we get those vacancies filled as quickly as possible so that we can keep up with our work plans and start doing additional strategic planning for the things that we know we need to work on or the things that we want to be working on. In addition to that, um, uh, from, from a vacancy standpoint, we're also working on making sure that we are right sized, if you will, so that we put the right people in the right jobs. Uh, the example on that would be where we see, uh, let's take um, translation and, and examination, for example, where we see trends coming in from, let's say the Asian countries or certain technologies, and we need to be sure that we have the right translators in the right place, the right examiners in the right place so that we can cope with the increased workload. So we're working on making sure that we've got the right people in the right jobs. Thanks. Now, what, one of the things that international bodies have to deal with constantly is geopolitical pressure. And whether you're the UN or one of the UN's agencies, the, the big players in the room always want to jostle for influence. And I don't think that WIPO is insulated from those pressure, pressures. The biggest hustle now around the world is the one that's between the US and China. Uh, is that something that's uh, in, impacted your work specifically? Uh, well, actually, I'm going to just say no, I don't think it does. Um, and it's because we, we in PCT can, can look at them separately and really deal with them in terms of the work that we need to do uh, for all of our stakeholders and all of our member states, whether they are the US, China, a developing country, any other developed country. Uh, so no, I don't think that that has an impact on that. I, I actually thought you were gonna go a different direction, maybe talk about COVID or something, but um, you know, uh, Darren's statements, I think, come into play here, which is, yes, we are a, a specialized agency of the UN, but we are not politicized. We are seen as an unbiased, neutral body. We are a political body, but we're not politicized. So we are, are working very hard at trying to come up with packages of services to probably primarily the developing countries 
that will help them grow their economies. Um, but we are really trying to stay out of the fray of being politicized. I, I think that's uh, absolutely important. And I don't know if the powers that be had that in mind when they picked Darren, but Darren comes from <laughs> Singapore, as you know, and that has been Singapore's mantra as a small independent state with a, a large uh, trading um, portfolio with both the US and China. Okay, now I'm going to give you a chance now, Lisa, to say whatever you want and you know, address them. There are, I'm sure people from all over the world, uh, people who are PCT users, but also students and practitioners and maybe people from government. What, what are some things, maybe pick one or two that you want them to take away uh, with them today at the end of this session? Sure. Well, first of all, I would say that um, my colleagues at the at WIPO and, and in the PCT are just phenomenal. They are, are energetic. They are committed to WIPO, to the PCT. They are committed to um, continuous improvement in the organization, in the PCT processes, in the operations. Um, you know, we, we need to be sure that we give them all the tools that they need to do their jobs. And, and that's you know part of what I work on. Um, but it's an amazing organization and uh, we will continue our continuous improvement on a regular basis, uh, always looking for ways to improve, to do more, to do better. Um, and we just, you know, if there's feedback that anybody wants to give, that will only help us uh, even if it's negative feedback, but certainly we'd love the positive feedback as well, but um, negative feedback, it, it, you know, send it to us and, and we will do our best to make sure that we throw that into the mix when we're looking at our continuous improvement. Um, I'll give you an example of, of just one person in, in WIPO recently in the PCT. She was trying to help somebody um, actually down in Houston uh, with with a question that this attorney had on the PCT who had not really used the PCT very much in the past. And, and when they were all said and done, she wrote to me, the, the attorney in Houston, and said, I can't believe how little I knew about the PCT and, and how valuable it's going to become for my clients because um, of this person in the PCT helping me understand what I didn't know. And, and that's really the, the, the mentality the people in the PCT is just to help and do everything that we can to make sure that we are as efficient as possible and we're offering the services that people need. So please give us your feedback. In, What's in the best way form. for them to do that? What's How do the they do it? Yep. Oh, well, there's, there's the website. Um, and you know how to reach me, Daryl. If anybody wants to send me a separate email or a private email, they can do that too. They probably now know how to reach out to the PCT people that are on this panel. Uh, not this panel, but in your program today, Matthias especially. You know, you can reach out to Matthias. Sorry, Matthias. Put you under the bus on that one. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, we can, any one of us will be happy to take the, the comments, the feedback, questions, and, and make sure we get back to you. Thanks. And, and uh, you know, I actually mentioned Matthias. I was asking him before, how long has his shop been doing this here in the United States with us? Long before my time, of course, about 30 years was his answer. So in terms of getting the word out, WIPO has been doing this consistently. Of course, we find new ways to do it. And having you here, having Matthias here, having uh, folks from WIPO, and not just in this session, but preceded us on the PCT, but all throughout the day, I think really makes a difference in terms of reaching out to the, the audience, both in the United States and around the world. So, you know, thank you very much. We've talked about perspective, truth and change. I think we have hit all three uh, items on, <laughs> on the, the, the title. Uh, thanks to you. And uh, we hope that you enjoyed this discussion. We'll have a break after this. Uh, I'll invite Adam to come back up to transition us, but it, you know, it leaves me again to say that this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I think uh, I found it very informative. I think our audience did too. I see all Thanks, I really enjoyed it. Too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Elizaroff, and I'm a student leader at UIC Law. I'll be hosting the final session. Uh, I'm going to welcome back all of you to our fourth and final session, uh, Intersections in International IP Law, Policy and Practice. It'll be moderated by Mr. Ken Ng. Mr. Ng is the Client Liaison Principal at Davies Carlson Cave. Um, please join me in welcoming the panel for session four. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. I, uh, again, I'm honored to be part of this panel. Uh, today I have um, a great group of uh, great group of speakers with me. Um, I'll start off with Ray Million, who is currently CEO of a uh, hundred year law firm, uh, Harness Dickey Pierce in Michigan. Uh, prior to this, he served as uh, chief IP counsel for Volvo's Volvo in Sweden. Um, Ducks, um, where's, where's, where's James? Is James on yet? I'll start with Duck Soon. Duck Soon is a litigator uh, in uh, the firm of Kim and Chang. He's based in Korea and he's up very late this morning. Um, thank you, Duck Soon, for participation. Um, we've got James Pooley, who used to work at WIPO um, at, and is not runs his independent practice um, uh, here in the United States. Alice Wang is a partner with Beijing Guantao Law Firm in China. Um, and um, finally, we have Maria, who is an associate register of copyrights and director uh, at the US Copyright Office. Uh, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to attend. I, uh, I'm super excited uh, to hear from all of you. Um, I would like to start off with Ray today um, and uh, the topic that Ray has chosen to, to speak to today is uh, recruiting and building a truly international in-house and outside council team to implement your international IP strategy. Uh, this is something that I think many of us have had experiences um, uh, but Ray, I, I'd love to start you off with, uh, you know, what you have to share with us. Sure, uh, sure. Can I, uh, you know, no pressure going first, right? So, um, but, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, this uh, session is called Intersections in International IP Law. And, you know, people love throwing around the word international. They do. Right? And they, they say, oh, we have an international IP strategy or we have an international IP portfolio or we have an international view, right? And then when I ask about their teams or I ask about their operations, right? They're in one country at HQ, right? And oftentimes that's, uh, you know, it, it could be, you know, and it's not just American companies that are guilty of that. You know, when I joined Volvo Cars in Sweden, you know, we had an international policy, we had an international strategy and we had an international portfolio, but everyone was in Sweden. Right. And so truly, so how could you have an international team uh, trying to harness IP from an international organization if your team is in one country, right? And so, mm -hmm. <laughs> so what I really want to do is call out the shame of the patent bar to say, look, if you're going to have an international strategy, you're going to have your folks around the world, right? Yeah. Because you can't tell me if you're a Korean company, all your R&D is in Korea and all your smart people are in Korea. Or if mm -hmm. you're a, a French company, all your smart people are in France. Or if you're a German company, all your smart people are in Germany. And definitely, if you're an American company, all your smart people can't be in America. And so, to me, I think before we're going to have a farce to say you have an international IP strategy, and I know if you went to law school in the U.S. or you went to law school in, you know, uh, in China or if you went to law school in Europe, and I know because of, the, you know, of, of WIPO and, you know, uh, the international treaties, IP law is one of those areas of the law where it's like 95 to 97% harmonized across the world, right? You can have a conversation with an IP lawyer anywhere in the world and, you, you know, you're basically talking the same language with, you know, some variations. Uh, but even if that's the case, to me, it's like you have to have boots on the ground uh, where you're harnessing IP and you have to have boots on the ground where you're most likely to enforce your IP, right? And again, and in, uh this is not agnostic to industry, right? So it kind of depends on what industry you're in. You know, if you're uh, uh, in biopharma, you tend to have a more international focus than if you're sort of like in e-commerce, 
right? Or if you're sort of like in automotive where you kind of just think about Germany, France, Italy, US, China, the rest of the world doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I probably forgot Korea. Um, and so to me, I guess the point I want to come across is don't tell me you have an international strategy. Don't tell me you have an international portfolio and don't tell me that you have an international vision or international anything unless you're actually recruiting local lawyers to service the local folks to capture, protect, and monetize the IP truly on a global scale. So Kenneth, I'll, I'll stop there. That's fantastic. I this is this reminds me so much of my experience at ITW. Um, uh, we you know at eighteen billion we were quite global, uh, and when we, we didn't have a large in-house team, when we were looking for um, uh, counsel, it was not uncommon to um, to require that counsel to meet with the local R and D team in a foreign country. Um, uh, myself on the trademark side, I, you know, I had six counsel around the world that were my eyes and ears. Uh, they were placed, selected and placed by, because of their expertise, not just in the law, but the ability to manage clients, you know, tell clients no. And I, I, I'd say no. Uh, and they know me well enough that they would say no, even though saying yes would make them a buck. Um, they would say no because, you know, they knew that it wouldn't go through if I if, if it came up to me. Um, but this is hard to do, Ray. What 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 were some of the challenges uh, or significant challenges that you faced in truly being international? So, Ken, that's a good question, and I think you know a lot of companies. In my experience, you know, I've um, uh, ran IP at Volvo Cars, at uh, American Express, you know, GE Oil and Gas, GE Healthcare, yeah, uh, and as a consultant at Goldman Sachs for a little bit. And, and I found that um, the technique is oh, you take your homegrown lawyers, right? And then you ship them across, right? And, <laughs> and, and you know, talk about a lack of diversity, right? So, <laughs> you know, geographic diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of law schools, civil law mm -hmm. versus common law, you know, so I, I don't think that works well in all instances. So what I found is, you know, relying on local firms, right? And again, and I think another lazy thing people tend to do is, well, I have an international firm, right? Oh, and, God. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, without even trying to figure out, well, okay, that, that international firm that you hired that has an office in Paris, all those attorneys are M&A lawyers, but, you know, I have an international firm doing my IP, right? Without, you know, so to me, that's like sort of intellectually lazy, so I think it's two things. One is truly using local IP firms, right, that are reputable as your boots on the ground, whether it's for enforcement, whether it's for uh, um, uh, prep and process. Or, um, and, I, and the second thing is using local recruiters when you want to hire, you know, when you decide that you have enough IP, right? So there's a lot of counterfeiting that goes on in the automotive industry in Turkey, for example, mm. right? And when you decide that you need a boot on the ground in Turkey to look out for your cause, Right then, okay. So then we need to find a local recruiter to get us a Turkish lawyer on the ground in Istanbul who can handle those cases. So I think it's a it's a combination of local recruitment and also using local firms and not being intellectually lazy and saying, well, I have an international firm that has offices in thirty countries. What does that mean? Yeah, one of the things that you know, I, I don't know if you had a big team at Volvo, but uh, I, I certainly didn't. Uh, one of the things that I had to deal with, or we had to deal with as a team uh, in, in Chicago was how do we scale? How do we scale uh, in terms of communications? How do we scale in terms of um, tools? Uh, what sort of you know, software tools do we, do, do we use to scale so that you could minimize the emails, the phone calls, the early morning, late night uh, uh, conference calls? And um, you don't really get the experience in thinking, or you don't even get to think about scaling until you work for a global company and you go, oh, really? I've got clients all over the world. Well, I can't possibly be, understand their culture in every country around the world. Um, uh, and so I'm probably going to say stuff American style and am I the best tool for the job? I'm not the best tool for the job. Um, so how do I find somebody to do this? And how do I avoid that somebody coming to me and asking me, you know, this happened today, how should I answer? 
what do you want to do? That's not scaling. That's just creating bureaucracy. Um, if you might comment on that a little, Ray. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I had a sort of a what I call a small to medium sized team, right? We we're 14 people globally. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not incredibly small, but it's not incredibly large either compared to some of the other OEMs. And, and um, you know, for me, it, it's um, when you have an international team, you have to, you, you cannot be a micromanager and you have to relinquish uh, control. All politics are local. So, you know, me in Sweden, you know, it's already a, like a bull in a China shop, right? You take a New York lawyer and put him in the middle of Scandinavia trying to drive change, right? And, you know, sometimes I'm not the best mouthpiece. <laughs> um, <laughs> oftentimes I'm not the best mouthpiece. Uh, so I think, um, it, again, I think it goes back to having local counsel and then local recruiters to get boots on the ground. And then you have to relinquish control, right? You set the, the vision, the mission statement, but then it has to be translated and localized, right? Just like your supply chain is localized, so is your lawyering. And, yes. and, and it requires a little bit of relinquishing control. No, I couldn't agree more. That 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 that's huge. I, I just uh, read a book about you know how to gain power by giving it away, uh, yeah. and it's it's so it's really like empowering children instead of solving the problem for them. You you say this is the problem, you know, um, you figure it out and come to me with a solution, um, and I'll back you. Or I might disagree with you, or you might surprise me and come back with a better solution than I could have. Um, but I think it's hard to do for a lot of lawyers who, you know, want to get it right. And the definition of right is what you see in your brain. And um, it's difficult to relinquish that sort of, uh, or gain that sort of trust. Um, uh, well, let me uh, move on a little bit uh, to, to, uh, to Jim here. Uh, and we can always come back to this topic. Thank you, Ray, I appreciate your, your time on this. Um, Jim, Jim Pooley uh, would like to talk a little bit about um, trade secret, in, in particular, uh, international enforcement of trade secret rights, uh, evidence, and extraterritoriality. Territor thank you, Jim. <laughs> well, thank, thank you, Ken. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, you know, Ray, Ray mentioned uh, how much harmonization there there is in this in the uh, ip system generally and he's right as to registered rights um i mean when we ran the uh, pct we knew we had a single form for everybody and in fact the what all the patent offices in the world were doing was so similar that we're able to have this wonderful network of um, offices that, uh, that that would actually do some examination on behalf of the entire system, there are international searching authorities. So, um, and although there was a struggle that's been going on for about 20 years um, to further harmonization of sorry of patent laws and procedures, um, it's it's happening. Um, even though it is a struggle, and, and I think we're getting closer and closer. That is not true for trade secrets, They're the unregistered IP right. And there's, there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, it's just, it's a fundamentally different thing. Rather, if you contrast it with patents, where we're trying to uh, protect technology, uh, you can do that with secrecy as, as well, but there's no registration involved. Nobody uh, provides any monopoly. Uh, the trade secret laws that exist are local in the sense they're national laws, and they exist in order to reinforce a confidential relationship where the information can be exchanged. And this is one of the fundamental sort of misunderstandings, I think, at the international level about secrecy as, as a form of IP, that it is about hoarding information, about keeping information away from the public, et cetera. And there are issues certainly around that invoke public policy, but generally speaking, uh, without trade secret laws, 
yes, indeed, businesses would hoard the information that they came up with because there would be no way that they could share it and still be comfortable that they would be able to enforce the rights, uh, their rights against someone that they've shared it with under limited uh, disclosure obligations. So, um, you know, we, we all can read TRIPS, Article 39. It looks very nice. Um, and there are other provisions in TRIPS about enforcement of trade secret rights, but they are more or less just a suggestion, if you will, uh, because at the end of the day, um, trade secret litigation and enforcement depends very much on local laws, more so in trade secrets than in other kinds of IP, precisely because the other kind of IP is registered. You can see it, you can read it, read the documents and know what it's about. Trade secrets, on the other hand, um, only usually get defined in the, in the process of litigation. And when you think about the problems that arise, trade secret disputes are about somebody losing control that they had over information that they wanted to keep, the, you know, their secret process, their source code, what have you. And what happens is that um, the, the information goes away, but not in a way that the owner um, is fully aware. So every trade secret victim, if you will, needs access to information in order to enforce their rights. And that's the biggest problem at the international level because getting access to information about what happened is a challenge in most civil law jurisdictions. So as a result, international enforcement, most of the time, the place that most people would like to be uh, is in the US because there are broad discovery rights. Once you have a reasonable basis for suspicion, then you're off to the races with discovery. So that, and that has become even more apparent for uh, cross-border cases since the 2016 enactment of the, De of the Defend Trade Secrets Act or DTSA. That statute contains a provision, section 1837, that was already there in the criminal law that basically confers jurisdiction on U.S. courts for any act of misappropriation occurring anywhere in the world, so long as either there has been some act by somebody in furtherance of the offense uh, that occurs in the U.S., and, you know, touching a server, for example, or one of the actors, one of the bad actors is a U.S. citizen. So it's not that hard to apply U.S. jurisdiction in U.S. courts for something that happened completely overseas. And this was true, for example, in, in uh, the Motorola versus Hytera case that uh, where there was a very large uh, verdict, nine-figure verdict that, that came out uh, at the beginning of last year, uh, reflecting actions that occurred entirely in Asia, um, but, the, but the case ended up getting tried before a jury in Chicago. So Jim, that's... Jim, if I, if I might ask a question. Um, sure. I learned this um, while I was a partner with a Chinese firm. And Ellis, maybe you can uh, uh, provide your, your counsel. Um, my understanding is that in China, uh, US judgments are not enforceable. Um, so it, it presents a, uh, a, a problem. In fact, I used to advise clients that, yeah, if you use US law and you bring yeah. US judgment, you. you cannot act on this in China, not without yeah. difficulty. That, I mean, that's true. But, um, you know, the point is that given modern commerce, most uh, country and most companies have assets either in or the U.S. And so there, um, 
you know, there is a, a, there is leverage that you have on enforcing in the U.S. against assets, um, even if it's payable, and so forth. And there are other issues around China. I'll just get to in a second. So okay. one dimension of the enforcement, one dimension of the enforcement has been through courts, and there's more and more of that. Uh, another dimension is through the ITC, which uh, will treat a, a misappropriation that happens in another country um, as relevant as soon as any product that is infected with the stolen information hits the shores of the US. And all of a sudden, the ITC will take charge of it and will make a decision of its own. And I, re I remember working uh, years ago on the on the Sino Legend case, where you know the uh, the the Ministry of uh, Commerce, um, you know, understandably expressed a lot of concern that the U.S. was purporting to decide something that was already being litigated in China. Uh, and they paid no attention to the rulings of the Chinese court. And so I think one of the things, and I'll just end with this thought, um, as the U.S. Exer you know, at the request of businesses that use its system, um, as the U.S. exercises more and more control over events that happened outside of its borders, I think we're headed towards a, a time when we have to confront exactly what the notion of comedy means in that, in that context, how much and what kind of respect we owe to foreign courts that are already dealing with the problem. And are we gonna end up with anti-suit injunctions, for example, mm -hmm. coming from China, which is already uh, using them in, in standard essential patent, uh, cases. Are we going to see those in trade secret? And I, I hope that there is uh, you know, room for us to sort of talk about these issues and try to head them off before they become a crisis. Alice, uh, uh, perhaps I could give you a, uh, a chance to, you know, maybe share some insights on this topic uh, that, that Jim just talked about. Don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you had some uh, thoughts. Yeah, sure. I think uh, what James said was very uh, correct. Uh, recently, I saw a client. Actually, this client just sold one product in the United States on a platform on eBay. And recently, the, the client has been sued by a company in the U.S. And uh, the client came to me, uh, well, in the past, it would be like, okay, I just sold one product. I have a small asset in the United States. I don't need to uh, to litigate this case. But this time, this client is very interested in you know, litigating the case or you know, in defining yourself or at least um, you know, participate in the litigation. I think this is something uh, really new. Uh, I think one of the reasons is, uh, like uh, James mentioned, this client has uh, many uh, stores in the United States and it still wants to, it still wants to operate in the United States, and it does not want to lose the case. Even if it it may lose the case, it, uh, the company wants to uh, to fight and find out what happened instead of running away from the uh, litigation. Uh, I think this is something really uh, ch has changed from se several years ago. Yeah. And uh, in terms of anti anti suit, uh, this is something uh, very. Um, a uh, recent um, only in the area of SAP, ICP standard essential patent. Um, I think whether it's going to uh, apply to other areas like trade secret or trademark, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it depends on how heat this area is yeah. going to be internationally, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. And and I hope it doesn't get there. That's one of the reasons why I think we ought to be talking about it. I yeah. should also add, I should add that China in particular has been the last several years on improving accessibility and effectiveness of its trade secret uh, enforcement laws. In part, I don't know how much it had to do with the phase one agreement, but China has, for example, fully embraced the idea that 
a plausible showing at the beginning will result in a, in a flipping uh, of the burden of proof so, yeah. that the, so that the plaintiff doesn't have to come to court with its case already made and the, uh, the court will look to the defendant to demonstrate independent development. And that's a, that's a very helpful um, improvement in the process. I had, a, uh, I had an interesting case. Uh, I, I've been involved in a few trade secret enforcement cases in China, um, but I just want to share this, this one story. Um, we, we didn't have the evidence for trade secret misappropriation. Um, and we needed to get it. This is uh, Southern China, went to the judge, said, we need an ex parte uh, um, uh, seizure seizure order to, to, to go on site, not even a seizure, um, but to have the judge go on site to defendant's premises to observe and, well, I guess, capture the evidence, yes? Um, and she said, no, hire an investigator. I said, we can't hire an investigator. We've already started the suit. This will be unethical under U.S. standards to you know, hire an investigator to surreptitiously obtain evidence mid-suit um and she said but this is china <laughs> and i said yes i understand this is china however you know plaintiff is an american company and we have this obligation regardless of where the suit is and this is why we need an ex parte uh, uh, uh seizure or you know uh, for you to participate to capture the evidence we finally got the the the, the order but it, it, it it was a pretty high bar. It was close to an, an injunction level of evidence uh, um, standard before we um, uh, got that order. Extremely difficult, as you say, Jim, um, in jurisdictions, civil law jurisdictions, with no discovery, interrogatories, uh, and the like. Doc Soon, you had a question, yes. Yes, uh, I'd or like comment. to... Uh, just one comment on the lack of full-fledged discovery in civil law countries, as Jim pointed out. Sure. Yep. Because of the limited discovery, it is very difficult to obtain infringement evidence from the opposing party. And limited discovery makes it more difficult to pursue trade secret litigation because trade secrets oftentimes are used in manufacturing process or are related to intermediate, which cannot be readily ascertained from the publicly available final product. And therefore in Korea, the trade secret disputes typically commence in the form of criminal actions or criminal accusations. Only after infringement evidence has been secured by this search and seizure in the criminal proceedings, the right holder then files a civil action and tries to obtain the infringement evidence from the criminal proceedings. We have the ex parte seizure procedure, which is called evidence preservation procedure in our civil litigation. However, it seems that the court is more generous in granting ex parte seizure for patent litigation, but not for trade secret or misappropriation litigation. That's, that's interesting. Alice, um, you, you, you wanna comment on how this works in, um, in, uh, in China? Yes. Uh, I think James was right. Uh, James mentioned that the um, the evidence standard has been lowered uh, because I think last year we have this new uh, evidence rule. Uh, based on this new rule, it is more e it's easier for a plaintiff to collect doc, uh, collect evidence. And sometimes, if it's, it's if it's difficult for a party to collect evidence on its own, it can seek help from the court and i think it's more it's, it's more different than what you experienced again in the past 
right now, if you can show that you really don't have the control of the, uh, uh, the, the evidence, you can ask the court to help you uh, get the evidence. And also in terms of trade secret, uh, you know, in base, uh, the Chinese system, we did not have the expert, you know, in, in the United States, we have expert discovery and expert report, things like that. In China, we did not have expert. But right now we have this, um, we call the, uh, 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 like an agency uh, or company. They are more like, um, uh, like institu institutions. They are in charge of, um, uh, doing something like uh, infringement um, analysis or trade secret analysis. So you can hire those uh, institutions and they will run a test for you. For example, they will buy a product from the uh, defendant or you buy a product from the defendant and you give that to, the, uh, to this institution and they will uh, analyze the, uh, the product against your uh, so-called trade secret and they, they will provide a report. And most of the times the courts rely, rely on those reports to, uh, to uh, adjudicate, adjudicate the case. And uh, it's becoming more and more famous, uh, popular because trade secret, especially for some high technology, it's really difficult for the court to, uh, to analyze whether there is a, a misappropriation. But based on this report, and uh, it is much easier to show, you know, if there is a misappropriation. Alice, I, uh, just to clarify, are these institutions the same institutions uh, that hire no notaries public to capture evidence, or are they separate from those institutions, those firms? No, they cannot uh, invest. They cannot collect evidence. They are only in charge of uh, doing some technical analysis. Understood. Yeah. Are they testifying uh, as on the analysis? Yes, yes. And now they can come to court, you know, to uh, give to explain their analysis. But you know, as a plaintiff, you hire your own, um, uh, you hire your own firm. And as the plain, a defendant, they can hire their own firm also. It's more like an expert, two experts, and they will both come to the court to um, to uh, explain or testify. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, Duck Soon, uh, just to pivot back to you um, in terms of how, I mean, Korea is also a no discovery, uh, no interrogatories jurisdictions. And you had said that in Korea, you, you used a criminal procedure to uh, gather evidence. Um, if you could speak a little bit more about that, your, this, is, this is a topic that you were going to speak on anyway. Um, forum selection in enforcement actions um, um, in if you if you like to start with discovery and we can move on to injunctions later um, um, uh, get your view on it because my, my understanding of criminal actions uh, as it relates to uh, um, you know Chinese actions is that you know unlike say the United States, you don't just complain to the police. You you literally have to do the work for the police or do a lot of work for the police. So the plaintiff is still paying uh, outside counsel, even as uh, a police action is being initiated. Um, how how does this work exactly in China? Uh, sorry, in Korea, with regard to engaging um, the criminal process to uh, capture evidence for your case. Well, actually, the Korean law enforcement agencies are very proactive and cooperative in looking into the criminal violation of the Trade Secret Act. So if a company or employer may come up with an evidence showing that its former employee illegally took certain confidential documents or information out of the company, that would be the enough basis for the law enforcement agency to proceed with the search and seizure. And therefore, there are a number of the criminal actions which comes first before the civil litigation. 
And do the plaintiffs counsel in that uh, in that situation play a role in the investigation? Or do the police just basically take that evidence and proceed to look for more? That's a good question. Uh, as Alice mentioned, it is rather difficult to expect the law enforcement agencies to have enough uh, on capability to understand all the technologies involved in the case. And therefore, it is very critical for the plaintiffs or complainants counsel to closely work with the law enforcement agency during the course of investigations. Is this uh, something that is, you would say, typical in most trade secret um, litigation where uh, where you start with a criminal action first? That is typical. When you have a non-compete clause with a former employee, and when former employee joined your competitor in breach of the non-compete clause, you may just start the civil litigation to prohibit him or her from continuing to serve your competitor. However, just in case of theft or misappropriation of a trade secret case, it typically starts with the criminal action rather than civil yeah. action. Uh, we have introduced certain provisions in the Patent Act and Unfair Competition Prevention Act, which deals with the trade secret issues in Korea. Uh, a, the broader ability of the plaintiff or right holder to get certain discovery from the defendant. However, although those provisions were introduced already several years ago, it seems that those provisions are not actively implemented by the judiciary. So it remains to be seen when or how those provisions will uh, really work as the legislature originally intended. Perhaps that could be the perspective of the judges who do not see such discovery measures in other types of civil litigations. And therefore, although those special discovery provisions are adopted in those two specific IP statutes, it seems the judiciary or judges are still hesitant to fully implement those provisions or those measures. Jim had a question. Go ahead, Jim. If I can, if I can just add uh, to that, having had recent experience uh, where I, I, rep I was one of the team that represented uh, LG Chem in this giant uh, fight between two Korean companies, LG Chem and SK Innovation, over automotive batteries, they came to the uh, US, to the ITC, and engaged, so they had all their discovery there. But um, and, and these, of course, were both companies that had um, that had factories in the U.S., but they were both very much Korean companies, and all of the uh, alleged misappropriation had occurred in in Korea. One of the things that moved the case along was the issue around destruction of documents, and the U.S. ITC applied U.S. rules to the behavior of S SK in Korea with respect to uh, failing to maintain its, its evidence. And part of the fight was at the time that uh, Korean law did not have the same restrictions on how you behave with respect to your evidence. But um, the, the case ended up getting uh, decided mainly on the basis of that destruction. So this was a, this was a case where we had two Korean companies uh, over a Korean misappropriation fighting in the U.S. 
and having US-based um, discovery preservation laws applied to their dispute. So very interesting. This, you know, Jim, yeah, sorry, Dustin, you go ahead. Yep, Jim made a very interesting point. Uh, indeed, not only the LG Chemical versus SK Innovation, but also there was another IT section within a few years where both the complainant and respondent were Korean companies and even the misappropriation took place within Korea. But the complainant of those two cases brought the case to the ITC reportedly considering in part the broad discovery in the US, particularly in the ITC. As I understand, both cases had the parallel civil litigations and criminal actions pending before the Korea, uh, perhaps because of the difficulty they experienced in both proceedings within Korea, they might have considered the ITC as a forum to resolve their disputes against domestic competitors. Uh, interestingly, both complainants succeeded in obtaining the ITC's exclusion order, limited exclusion order against the importation of the competitor's goods into the US. So with these recent success stories, perhaps the non-US companies, particularly those located in a country where only limited discovery is available, may consider the US ITC or even the US District Court. As Jim explained, DTSA seems to provide such basis uh, as a forum or attractive forum for resolving their disputes against their domestic competitors, even when the misappropriation or theft took place within their home countries. Of course, you will have to satisfy the domestic industry requirement for ITC jurisdictions. And in the two cases involving the Korean companies, the domestic industry requirement was satisfied based on the existence of a US licensee or the respondents construction of a factory within the US, both of which related to the alleged trade secrets. Well, this really reminds me of what Ray started out with talking about truly international. You know, if you were head of IP for or even general counsel for these companies, um, is your is your frame, you know, just liability based on the law that you're licensed to practice in? Or should your life you work for a global company? Uh, um, should your liability be defined as all the territories, whether you are licensed in those territories or not, uh, where your company could potentially be exposed to liability because of the different procedures, the different legal procedures, civil procedures that apply in those countries? Um, in this case, the United States for a Korean company. How do you avoid a situation like this in future? You, you, you bring your international team close and uh, perhaps advise them on, um, you know, where you ship and how, how, how things work within your industry in order to uh, draw up some sort of compliance guidelines. I don't know, Ray, do you have a comment on this? Or thoughts, opinion? I, I don't know. I feel like if I comment on that, I'm going to be accused of practicing without a license in some jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but um, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, uh, um, I've always proceeded under the rule that, you know, like it's common sense. And, you know, and then when you need to get some local uh, uh, advice, then I go to local counsel. But to me, I, I proceed under like what what's the best business terms? And then you know get get a license agreement from my you know New York Florida you know Virginia DC bar pick a, a license 
and then um, you know, then you know, and then have it checked by local council. But um, I've never had, I've never said, oh, I'm only barred in New York. Let me stop me from trying to do strategy internationally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jim, have you? Uh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, our discussion may uh, relate to the use of evidence across jurisdictions. Yes, absolutely. As Jim mentioned, the LG chemical case was settled globally after the ITC issued the final determination in favor of trade secret holder. But in another case, there were two respondents, one domestic competitor, the other was domestic competitors, US distributor. After the ITC final determination, the trade secret holder, the complainant settled with the respondents US distributor. So, U.S. disputes has been over, although the dispute against the domestic competitor still continues. So to take advantage of the U.S. discovery, both parties agreed to use the business confidential information discovered in the U.S. ITC proceedings for the parallel Korean litigation. However, since the Korean protective order does not have the attorney eyes only, a new novel issues had to be considered in advance and carefully addressed, particularly to prevent those confidential business information from losing its confidential status which is necessary to maintain their trade secret qualification. So unlike the Korean court's well-established practice, both parties agreed to limit the access to the confidential business information only to their counsel. The court exceptionally accepted that party's agreement and thus included only the party's counsel in the list of those who are allowed to access confidential information on the protective order. By the way, unlike the United States, in Korea, a protective order must be separately sought each and every time you submit documents or a brief that contains the information that need to be protected. And the court includes a list of those who are allowed to access those documents. And that reminds me of another case where a Japanese company litigated against a Korean competitor in the US, Japan, and Korea simultaneously. The Japanese company succeeded in persuading the US district court judge to modify a protective order to allow sharing of certain documents discovered in the US proceedings for the related Korean and Japan cases. However, when the Korean defendant petitioned for writ of mandamus, the Federal Circuit vacated the district court's decision to modify the protective order, expressing a concern that if the district court's decision were to follow, the US discovery proceedings may be abused or parties may try to circumvent the foreign proof gathering limitations or restrictions. So under the present US law, please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that the confidential documents discovered in the US proceedings may be used in foreign country proceedings, particularly in civil countries without both parties' agreement. 
Jim, would you like to comment on that? Or do you have an opinion on that, Jim? Did we lose Jim? I think we lost Jim. All right. Sorry, carry on, Duxon. I think we lost Jim there for a second. He, he did say okay. his signal. Okay. Uh, and then just uh, continuing the discovery uh, across jurisdictions. Uh, as you know, the section 1782 or the title 28 of the US code can also be used for Korean litigants to get evidence from third parties located in the US. Mm. The section 1782 motion allows a litigant in a foreign proceedings to apply to US court to obtain evidence from a third party located in the US. Uh, as an example, uh, several years ago, uh, I represented a defendant in a Korean patent litigation where we urged the plaintiff to submit its cross license agreement with a third party. That agreement could be relevant to antitrust violation and patent exhaustion defenses on our part, but the plaintiff refused. So in consultation with the US Council, we uh, filed a 1782 motion and successfully obtained a copy of the cross license agreement from the third party in the US. Interestingly, it took only eight days from the filing of the uh, section 1782 motion with the US District Court until we obtained a court order allowing us to issue a subpoena directing the third party to produce that requested document. So that is one route. And finally, um, I'd like to just mention one note. You want to, you want to talk about injunctions too, that's all. Okay. And moving on to injunction. As, uh, as you will agree, the injunction is the most powerful remedy in the context of enforcement. Um, I understand in the US, you need to satisfy the four eBay factors to obtain an injunctive remedy, which includes among others, the irreparable injury by the patentee. But in contrast, in many civil law countries, including Korea, Injunction is automatically issued if the pattern is found valid and infringed. As one of the leading jurisdictions in the global pattern dispute, Germany has been known as an automatic injunction jurisdiction. But by the most recent amendment to their Patent Act, now German court may limit the injunctive remedies if the injunction would lead to a disproportionate hardship for defendants or third parties. It remains to be seen how the German court will implement that new amendment. However, it seems a majority of observers cautiously expect that the special or extraordinary circumstances where injunctive remedy may be denied would be interpreted narrowly and thus would not likely substantially change the past practice. But I'm more interested in the ability to provisionally enforce the injunction despite the losing defendant's appeal. Uh, for example, in Korea, as I said, injunction is automatically issued and when injunction is issued, the court typically grants provisional enforcement. However, when the defendant asks for a stay upon filing an appeal, the court 
usually allows the stay. And therefore, unlike the preliminary injunction, which is enforceable despite the losing respondent's appeal, in main actions, the injunction becomes enforceable only after all available appeals are exhausted. However, I recently had a chance to look into the laws of several countries to see whether injunction is provisionally available despite the losing party's appeal. Uh, it seems that once issued, the injunction is provisionally enforceable in Germany, the Netherlands, and India. On the other hand, in Japan, China, the UK, as in Korea. Although injunction is routinely issued, there is low chance you can provisionally enforce the injunction. I will pause there. Okay, thank you, Daksun. Um, I would like to, maybe we should, in the interest of time, we've got about 30 minutes left, uh, we'll move on to Alice. Uh, Alice, if you, um, you know, I'll leave it to you. You were just gonna talk generally about uh, IP laws and how they're, how they're, they're, they're applied in China. Um, I think it would be interesting too to comment on you know the the the, the Chinese equivalents uh, on the trade secret front, on the injunction front, and um, perhaps if you if you would like to uh, maybe even speak a little bit about these uh, anti-suit injunctions that, uh, that, that that Jim brought up a few minutes ago. Okay. Uh, oh well. <laughs> the topic I prepared is how Chinese companies handle uh, patent, patent matters. So I will speak about that for a little bit and I will come back to the topic you mentioned. Well, you know, um, as I mentioned before, uh, patent law has changed or IP law has changed a lot in China, not only the law itself or the rules themselves, but also the, uh, the attitudes from those Chinese companies. I've been in the IP field for uh, almost 12 years. I remember when I was working in the US, I came back to China to give trainings on the US law. At the time, you know, we only talked about something basic, like 101, 102, or 103, and some basic things about uh, US litigation. And um, then later, a few, uh, around like 2014, we talked about those topics the Chinese company would say, can you talk something more specific or cases? We don't want to hear the basics. That means they have, you know, their skills have improved a lot. And I came back to China in 2015 and uh, I realized that, you know, the Chinese um, uh, companies are paying more and more attention to the IP, you know, IP uh, matters, especially the patent law. And uh, in terms of you know how Chinese companies uh, handles uh, handle you know patent matters, I think first of all, as what Ray has mentioned, we need an international team, right? And uh, when I came back to uh, to China in 2015, the uh, the company I worked for, we had around seven people in the team for IP matters. And then when I left the company in 2018, in three years. Our team has uh, has grown to uh, forty people, and uh, we had uh, four U.S. attorneys and two Japanese attorneys working in house. Uh, so that is not something unique in China. Most companies, especially some international companies, they have started building international team. At least they should have some U.S. lawyers on the team. And uh, in terms of the work itself, I think it has four um, aspects. First, you know, for patent prosecution, it has become more and more important. Before, some companies only paid attention to the quantity of the patents, but right now they pay more attention to the quality of the patents and they apply more and more uh, uh, international, well, we cannot say international patents, but they use PCT system a lot, and they uh, get a lot of uh, European patents or uh, US patents. And I know at least two companies. Uh, recently, I talked to uh, CEOs of two companies. 
they told me they reviewed every single patent application before they are filed. I think this is really something um, unheard of. CEO, their CEOs, they tend to be very busy, right? They review each a patent application filed. I think that's really something um, we should be proud of as patent, you know, um, attorneys. And for uh, and also second point is more and more companies are doing the freedom to operate right now in China. Well, you know, this is something I've, we call FTO, right? But many years ago, when you talk about FTO, they'd be like, why, why, why am I doing that? You know, it's really costing a lot of money and we don't see anything, we don't get anything. But now, whenever a company wants to sell products in, in, in the US or in Europe, the first thing they mention is, oh, I, I need to do FTO. Sometimes I ask them, do you know what FTO means? They don't know, think, oh, I don't know, but I want to do FTO because you know it's something you have to do if you want to sell a product in you internationally. And I really think this is something where uh, this is really a good development because it means they are more aware of patent and they want to uh, be, uh, uh, they want to respect third party uh, patent rights. Okay. Uh, is, this, is this something very recent? Uh, question one. Um, and number two, is this something that is happening only in the big state owned companies, private companies or, mm -hmm. or small companies as well? Yeah, uh, I think this is, well, FTO has been uh popular in the past few years but i think it, it becomes more popular since last year because uh, and it also goes to your second question um the companies who want to do fto they are not only you know huge big state-owned companies but also some small companies you know if, even for a team that has two attorneys in the ip you know in the ip department they want to do fto and because they want to sell their products in the, uh, in the US, they want to know what the industry looks like, how many patents are out there, what's the risks for those companies, and if there is a risk, what is the design around mechanism? Where, and did, I think, where did this come from? Where did the need, or you think it's just council suggesting FTO for many years, or mm -hmm. is there a Supreme Court uh, opinion that came down? Where did this uh, need for uh, FTO has come from? I think because more and more Chinese companies are involved in US litigation. And well, in the past, you know, sometimes when your stake is very insignificant in the United States, you may just, you know, get a default judgment. You don't fight for the litigation. But right now, because uh, more and more companies are fighting in the world, you're defending themselves in US litigation and it's costing a lot of money. And if they lose the case, the damages is huge. So that's why I think more and more companies are, uh, more and more companies have realized how you know, serious the US litigations can be. So that's why they are paying more and more attention. I think we're losing Ken, right? No, I'm because, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think because you know, they, they have realized them how serious the litigation can be. That's why they're paying more attention. And also I think maybe the trade war helped a little bit because they are not thinking, oh, if I want to do business in the United States, I have to respect the rules, right? And how to respect the rules? I cannot infringe other people's IP right and where to start uh, FTO. I think the trade war helped, you know, increase their awareness. That's great. That's really great. That's, that's a, one good thing about the trade war. <laughs> that's that's really great. Uh, that's yeah. really good to hear, actually. Um, yeah. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. Well, the, the third aspect is more and more, like I mentioned before, you know, in the past, uh, if their stakes are small in the United States, they may not, you know, uh, participate in the litigation. But right now, it has changed, and uh, they want to. Um, they want to uh, be active in US litigations and they know discovery. They know how to uh, collect the documents, reserve the documents, and they know how uh, serious it is if they don't do obey the rules. And uh, now, I think uh, last two months ago, one company 
uh, came to me. They said, I want you to, I want to fight, I want to sue another company in the United States. I was like, oh, this is uh, really some, it's, it's a small company. It's not like a huge company. It's a very small company. And I was surprised because for those companies, normally they just want to make sure they don't, you know, get into any litigation in the US. But right now they want to sue another company and it's, uh, it's a directive judgment that they want to, they want to sue another company saying they don't infringe. And I think, oh, this is really uh, something new and something good because yeah. then they know how to uh, use the rules or the law to do their business. And at the same time, they know how important the patent law is. I think that's really something I'm, I think that's the, uh, the, the contribution we all made uh, as uh, patent attorneys uh, to the society. And I think this is really something uh, we should be proud of. <laughs> that's, been my, that's been my experience as well, that um, yeah. Chinese companies in the last five years have uh, become more willing to initiate action um, yeah. when in the past they were uh, pretty passive. Passive, and, yes. Uh, today, if you're operating you know, in, in, in China, it sounds like it's happening in the United States too. If you infringe their IP rights, they will come after you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, the last thing is the licensing side. You know, well, in the past, my experience was, uh, you know, for licensing transactions, the Chinese companies may not want to take the deal because, you know, of course, it takes a lot of money. It costs a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. But right now, some companies, are, well, two things. First, some Chinese companies are willing to pay a lot of money. Like today, I saw in news, uh, Oppo and Shark, they came to a settlement, right? And I think uh, Oppo took the uh, license deal from Shark. And um, more and more Chinese companies are willing to pay license fees. And they know, you know, this is the rule. If you use other people's IP, you need to pay, pay for it. And I think this is a good um, change in attitude. And uh, companies are um, realize that patents uh, can be very expensive. <laughs> you have to pay a lot of money. And yes. also at the same time, there are more and more companies who want to, um, you know, get more patents. They also want to be the licensor. They want to go out to get money. And uh, I remember uh, one company told me, if you want to collect money based on your patents, you have to pay first. So that's the rule. You have to pay first and then later you can get the money. I think this is really a good um, attitude. I like it. <laughs> Yeah, and also go back to your um, the trade secret. And I think it's more and more, uh, um, let me put it this way, the litigation in trade secret has become more and more uh, popular in China. Well, at least a few years ago, it's more about trade uh, uh, criminal law. You know, you just uh, sue someone, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's a crime. But for the civil cases, it's not that much. I think because maybe because people don't realize the trade secret law can be a good weapon, or maybe the evidence is hard to collect. But is right there, now, is there um, any um, do any clients seek to do what Doc Soon was referring to uh, by using the U.S. Uh, system to obtain evidence? Um, is is that happening in your experience among Chinese companies? No, no, you cannot do that right now. Yeah. But you can use some other things to collect your uh, evidence, but you cannot use certain evidence directly. You can only use the evidence you collect as a lead to get more evidence. Sure. <laughs> and the evidence collection is still uh, difficult um, right now. Yeah. Speak, uh, um, speak a little, if you, if you might, um, about um, anti-suit injunctions. I, yeah, I, sure. I read yeah. about this recently and, and Jim brought it up. I think it's quite interesting. If you could perhaps maybe start with, you know, where do you think it came from? We have a few minutes. I do want to give Maria some time to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, will, I will use three, uh, two minutes. I think, you know, for the anti-anti-suit injunction, it has become more and more like complex because anti-anti-anti-injunction <laughs> is more like, I think this is something new and this is something I think is going to be temporary. Uh, because um, I don't want I don't want to say this is more like politics, but it's kind of you know like this is like countries are fighting for jurisdiction 
and um, and sometimes people think, oh, yeah, it's a country I have to protect myself. You know, you are my, um, you are my, uh, you are, you have my back. You have to protect me. And I think this is more like, um, I think it's temporary. <laughs> I hope it's temporary because uh, in the future, I think when countries come together, they should have some more uh, predictable rules. And um, maybe we should have some international rules on how to how to uh, adjudicate uh, standard pattern, essential patterns uh, related uh, litigations. Um, uh, but um, for the anti-anti thing, it's not a law itself, but it's just some cases. And I think it should be easier to uh, to adjust in the future when you know there is a, a need. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alice. Uh, that that that's very interesting. I do hope it's temporary, and uh, yeah. um, it, um, I I think this is sort of thing that I think a U.S. corp probably would give some serious consideration before they just blindly um, abide it by a anti-suit injunction decided in a different jurisdiction. Um, I want to move on um, so that we have a little bit of time for questions as well to Maria. Maria, if you if you might, you you were going to speak about copyrights near and far, and 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 really the direction of the U.S. Copyright Office. I'm super excited to to, to hear from you. Well, no, thanks so much for inviting me, and it, it, this is a great panel because my background actually is in international trade, and and I take Ray's point. Um, you know, I've been working with teams both in the private sector and in the government, where you have to rely on experts on the ground because they're the first experts, but I will say, having spent a lot of time in the field, there are days I feel like I know the Chinese copyright law better than the US copyright law because I've been involved in China work for so long. So my perspective, I mean, I'm gonna be speaking um, a little bit about a near and far very briefly, but then I'd like to leave some thoughts on what you know practitioners can do, including the uh, newer pra practitioners or small and medium businesses who might not have the ability to fund massive amounts of litigation like many of the larger patent uh, owners. So, so you know, if you take a look at what's happening near here in the US with respect to copyrights, for the enforcement folks, I wanna let folks know that we are going to be uh, implementing the CASE Act, the Copyright Small Enforcement Action, Enforcement Act that Congress passed last year. They gave the Copyright Office a year to stand up a small claims tribunal, first ever kind of small claims tribunal within the Copyright Office. Federal uh, copyright litigation runs into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's very cost prohibitive. If we can't have an effective means to enforce a right, what's the value, right? So we have spent years trying to get this. We're on track to launch it in the congressional deadline by the end of this year. We have a dashboard available on our site that shows where the status of the various rules we have that we're proponing. We hire the uh, officials. And so we're all very excited to see that happen because it will give smaller and as well large business, whether you're a plaintiff or defendant, the opportunity to bring some small claims up to a value of $30,000 in potential damages. So please stay tuned. In terms of public information outreach here in the US, obviously artificial intelligence is big everywhere you go. Um, we are teaming up with the Patent and Trademark Office to offer a public symposium on machine learning and AI at uh, the end of October, October 28th. Please go on our website to join. It's free. Everyone is welcome. We have an international cast of characters who will be speaking. If I can briefly jump over to what's going on in the far, far yeah. away. Um, in the multilateral area, obviously, uh, you know, the World Trade Organization is where all the member states come together, think the big thoughts on accession, WTO compliance, policy reviews for countries that are up, and obviously the TRIPS waiver is kind of the hot issue right now. Um, but IP, whether it's copyright or patents, you know, pervades the policy space in the trade area, whether it's the G7, the G20, um, OECD, and APEC. And so our office works uh, with the, the Patent and Trademark Office and our agencies to develop the U.S. government position. We're always looking for, pub for private stakeholders' uh, input. There's lots of ways to get us input because, you know, we want to make sure that that, it, you know, plays into our evaluation of how we can best support American culture and economy in our advocacy abroad. I, on the bilateral side, my office is want mon monitoring copyright reform efforts around the world. Um, whether it's implementing the USMCA, what Europe is doing with the, the copyright directive in the digital single market, definitely the ever-changing um, rules in terms of the, co the copyright law, the e-commerce law, the tort law, 
Supreme Court guiding opinions, you name it, that's happening in China. That, that, that for the copyright of community, that is something we are definitely watching, as well as recent developments coming out of Singapore, Canada, and there's a lot of developments happening in Africa right now. And so we we work to keep an eye on that, and we listen to you know uh, ind industry groups or NGOs or whoever comes to us, you know, tell us their views, and we evaluate. Just to wrap up, what I'd like to leave me with thinking of it, some, there's the, comp, the US government has resources that not everybody knows or uses. Obviously, if you got a civil litigation, criminal litigation in country, go at it. But if you need support in terms of helping to identify problems, whether it's in the process or a structural issue or legal issue, the US government is here to listen. We have embassies around the world. We have 14 IP attaches stationed in embassies around the world. We have a national IPR center that has over 20 a uh, liaison uh, company um, relationships with people like Europol, Interpol, that if you have a criminal case or a possibility of case, you can bring that case to the IPR center. But to what uh, Doc was saying earlier, please do it earlier because if you've got a civil litigation going, generally speaking, the, the criminal enforcement authorities don't like to follow a civil uh, civil action. And for smaller groups, um, the U.S. C Commerce Department has actually IP toolkits and I think over th almost three dozen countries around the world where you can go get short, tangible summaries of copyright, patent, trademark law in that country. So I just want to make sure that, you know, the folks who are listening, if you're not, if you don't have the ability to hire local counsel, there are some government resources that can help you as you start to make the business and legal decisions you need to enforce your rights abroad. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Well, thank you, Maria. That was really interesting. Um, I, I, I had I have more than a few questions. I but the first that comes to mind is um, so there are countries around the world with no copyright registration system, and uh, if we talk about enforcement, it's expensive. It's messy. Um, it, it's it's not. Um, so you got to remember, unlike yeah. industrial property. Um, copyright registration is not a requirement for the protection of a copyright. Uh, the sure. fact that the United States has one of the oldest systems in the world, and we do use it to help, um, you know, uh, US, authors of U.S. works get into court. Uh, registration is not expensive, and it's generally not messy. Um, WIPO is actually updating a study they did a couple years ago, and while a lot of folks thought that the trend was that people were kind of getting away from copyright registration systems, actually, I think the trend is back up. And so when they released their new report, I think it's over 80 countries now have copyright registration systems. It's becoming a useful data point, kind of to what Lisa Jorgensen was said earlier on the other panel, that you know data is everything. And having public data and information on works and titles and things like that can actually help businesses find and identify potential licensing sources and making sure that they're you know, let's just say using copyrighted works in an authorized manner. And so I think that's that that the copyright registration is sort of swinging back towards registration. Um, it's kind of interesting to, to know that. But right now, I mean, the, the price of a single author for a copyright registration in the United States is uh, $55. Um, you know, I, I, I dare anyone in the patent and trademark side to beat that. <laughs> no, I, we're, we're on the same page. I guess I, I misspoke. Um, uh, I meant that action without a registration is far more expensive and messier than if you had a registration. It makes it so simple. Well, I mean, it's a little, yeah, it's a little unique here in the U.S. in the sense that if you are, again, an author of a U.S. work, a defined term, you actually need to have a registration or a rejection from our office in order to litigate. Um, if you're an uh, author of a foreign's work, that's not the case because of bur the burn, you know, formalities uh, prohibition. So, um, you know, yes, we, I'm keenly aware, and there was a Supreme Court case on this, uh, I, a lot of the larger stakeholders who are copyright holders would prefer not to have to register in time to get to court. But again, it's $65 and the Supreme Court supported the view of the, of the Copyright Office that registration is required to get into to court for uh, author of a U.S. work. Is, is our copyright office or is your office uh, in, involved um, in, you know, getting more countries to create a registration system? It, it's funny. We don't actually go out and, you know, uh, advocate that one way or the other. I mean, I think it's up to every you know country to do that. For example, you know, large systems, common law systems like Australia do not have a copyright registration. They're not going to. Right. Uh, right. Obviously, 
China has a very big one and Brazil, they probably, the two of those countries probably register more than we do, even though our system's older and we can maybe quibble about wallet, but that's another issue. Um, but I think, uh, I, th I think to uh, suffice it to say, you know, if a country is interested in either updating or having a, a system, we have talked to them about it to show them what worked for us and what doesn't didn't work for us. Because we do have a, you know, uh, about 125 years of experience, and and we wouldn't want people to make the, some of the same mistakes we did before we joined Burn. So we we can give that that as a, an option, but we don't we don't necessarily go out and push it. It's not in any of our trade agreements if that's what you're looking for. Okay, I uh, I know I, I'm aware that USPTO has. Um, um, I when I was in house, I, I did a lot of work with the USG and um, worked with the IPR offices, uh, um, both here as well as in China and in other countries as well. I know I, I learned from that experience that the USPTO uh, they have boots on the ground in different countries trying to teach other countries how to set up a, a patent and trademark. And I yeah, copyright office has the sort of no. No, we 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 don't have the same thing. Uh, keep in mind, we're in the legislative branch, and and PTO is in the executive branch. They're also about uh, 140 times larger than we are. Uh, okay. 13,000 people. I think a four billion dollar year budget. We're 400 people. 80 80 million dollars a year budget. They have they do have satellite offices. Like I said, the IP they support the IP attaché program around the world. The thing is we do work with our colleagues at PTO and the State Department. So if there is a copyright law development coming out in this country, believe me, we are in on the clearance and the review of that. There are not surprising to say there's not hundreds of people doing international copyright law in the US government. There's probably about a dozen. And some of us have been doing it for a very long time. And the good news is, you know, we know what the US government administration, you know, the administration wants. We know what I know clearly what Congress wants. And we have a way in which we can, you know, uh, effectively help support, you know, the updating of foreign copyright laws and in alignments with congressional directive. That's fantastic. My uh, my my introduction to copyright uh, practice. This was years ago. I was hired by a client to audit his uh, his safe, his the, his records in his safe, and his safe was built. The safe itself was built in 1876. This was a old school Chicago uh, printer, uh, and they printed posters for the Chicago World's Fair. And I went into his safe and he had index cards. And these index cards were, you know, 28 years apart. Um, and that one, yeah. it had passed, it had changed hands over six generations. And somewhere between the fourth and the sixth generation, they lost track. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we had 28 term back before the, the 76 act. So it was really important to keep uh, renewal acts in those 28 year blocks. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and so I had to figure out from 1909 to 2000, what exactly was still um, valid and what had expired. And then, and then 1976 created just this giant hiccup. Like, yeah, know. it does. I mean, we have we have some guidance on our website to help calculate that. Um, I mean, I mean, I think the the it's life plus seventy right now. Life work of the author. There's some set terms for for wor works of like ninety five years for sound recordings. Um, I think it's the unpublished works have the largest term. That's one hundred and twenty years after life. Uh, so. I think term is is a little bit of a challenge. It's challenging, and I think it's really important, uh, especially if you are doing um, work across borders, because the term calculations in a different yeah. country are very, very different, and and you actually need to make sure that you have all the prior iterations of their copyright law to check exactly when the time has. That's what I did in private practice, and there are gaps that you neither need to watch out for or you want to trip up your colleagues on because there there are countries that have gaps just because of some poor drafting between their legal um their legal revisions so it's an it's an important part of bread and butter you know that and a fair use analysis kind of the bed and butter of most private sector folks right now if you're not a litigator what, what, were you a litigator before you went to no I, I was not i i specialize in in um the the international trade aspects so we did legal counseling for a, a lot of clients but most of my work practice was actually improving foreign copyright laws. And so 
um, that that's that's how I continue to add value add to the U.S. government. In addition to obviously doing a lot of aesthetic work. <laughs> Uh, well, on behalf of the students who haven't asked that question, how, how did you fall into that specific that, that, that niche? My back, yeah, um, I have a master's in communications management, and I thought I'd be a communications lawyer. And I ended up, uh, after law school, going to the FCC for a year, but then ended up joining a small boutique law firm where the gentleman basically created the connection between uh, U.S. trade law and intellectual property. So this was the, the GSP reform and the, and the Caribbean Basin Initiative for the mid 80s. And that in turn led to some of the developments of, of special 301 and led into the, the Uruguay round negotiations where, you know, which codified the connection between IP and trade. And so that's how I, that's how come I have a very a, a trade background. Our firm also supported plaintiffs in uh, bringing the U.S. case against China on both the IP and the market access case back 15 years ago. So so when Alice said trade war, I'd rather say trade engagement, let's just say that. And those and those um, those decisions have been profoundly effective in a positive way, especially for the film and publishing industries. Uh, there still have some market access challenges in China, uh, especially on joint ventures and ownership issues. But that um, that WTO, those two WTO disputes really did, I think, help bring uh, a real heightened awareness to connecting business to market entry into new markets beyond just copyright. It was actually the market access part that was really quite the profound result. Yeah, I'm reminded of what Jim mentioned about uh, the need for international comity uh, in in um, not just uh, laws, but enforcement. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a that's a tougher issue, and I will say the U.S. government does have some concerns and views on that. I mean, there was the recent Hague Convention exercise on recognition of enforcement of foreign judgments, where uh, the U.S. along with some other nations, you know, didn't was successful in not putting IP into that agreement into that Hague Convention uh, because there was a, some significant downside concerns that that comedy wouldn't actually support a lot of our interests. So um, I think, you know, you're still going to have, I agree with him that that comedy and how you enforce cross border is going to be a challenge. But uh, I think the concern of having it in the Hague Convention was not, uh, it's not a benefit that, you know, the government. Yeah. Thank you for what you did on that, by the way. See, see, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's 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 awesome. What a great panel! This uh, the time flew by. I I, I really uh, appreciate all your efforts in in um, you know, especially our our friends over in Asia. It's it, it's an ungodly time in the morning. Thank you for staying up and uh, being present. Um, I, uh, I I uh, you you made this very easy for me. So thank you so much. And I on behalf of Daryl too. I think that. Uh, UIC, uh, thanks you for your time. Um, does anybody have any questions from uh, from the audience? Well, no questions. Uh, we end with uh, five seconds to spare. Look, we're uh, I, I like making my time. Thank you, everybody. It was good Thank meeting you. all of you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.